Chapter One of Against Odds. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Against Odds by Lawrence L. Lynch. Chapter One Chicago Gets My Money. Eureka! It was I, Carl Masters, of the Secret Service, so called, who uttered this exclamation, although not a person of the exclamatory school. And small wonder, for I was standing beneath the dome of the administration building, and I had but that hour arrived at the World's Fair. I was not there as a sightseer, not on pleasure bent, and even those first moments of arrival I knew well were not to be wasted. I had come hither straight from the terminal station, seeking this stately keystone to the great fair, not to steep my senses and fill my eyes with beauty in myriad forms, but to seek out the great man whose masterful hand was to create for me the passport which was to be my open sesame to all within this fair white city's walls. But when I stood beneath that lofty double dome and looked about me, I forgot all but the beauty all around and gazed upon the noble rotunda through the western entrance where earth majestic but untamed a masterpiece of giant statuary guards one massive pillar and the same earth yet not the same conquered yet conquering adds her beauty to the strength of the column opposite to the east where neptune sports classic as of old around about the octagonal interior with its splendid arches its frescoes and gilding its medallions and plates of bronze wherein gleamed golden and fair the names of the world's greatest countries at its gilded panels supported by winged figures and bearing engraven upon each shining surface the record of some great event its medallions and graceful groups allegorical or symbolic all mounting high and higher until illuminated by the opal-like circle of light at the summit dodge's great picture crowns the whole with its circling procession of arts and sciences gods and muses nymphs and graces and apollos radiant in the midst small wonder that forgetting all but the scene before me my lips shot out the single word eureka and smaller wonder that having vented my admiration in sound I became aware of the fact at once and remembered not only who I was but what I was and why I was there it was scarcely 10 a.m. but there were people all about me and my exclamation caused more than one eye inquiring amused cynical or simply stupid to turn toward me where I stood near the center of the great rotunda big thing ain't it I turned my head a little rattled at the notice I had thus brought upon myself and saw standing close beside me a man whose garb no less than his nasal utterance proclaimed him a Yankee and a son of the soil I had seen him upon my entrance standing beneath the dome with his head thrown back at a painful angle in an effort to read one of the brazen plates above him one hand tightly grasping a half inflated umbrella long past its palmy days and the other fiercely gripped about the handle of a shawl strap drawn tight around a handleless basket by no means small and bristling at the top with knobby protuberances which told but too plainly of the luncheon under the pictorial newspaper tied down with abundant lashings of blue shaker yarn big thing indeed evidently my burst of enthusiasm had brought upon me this overture no doubt meant to pave the way to further conversation and I answered after a single quick glance at my neighbor as blandly as our sin himself Yes, sir resumed the man with a brisk nod. It's a big thing when twas first talked up I was a good deal sot on having it in New York State I'd been there you see twenty years ago on my wedding trip. I was living in Pennsylvania then But law New York couldn't have done this here. No, sir. She couldn't Chicago gets my money not that I got much on it with a nervous start and a shrugging movement as if he were trying to draw in his pockets and Obliterate all traces of them. 
I don't never believe in carrying money to such places. Then, as if anxious to get away from a dangerous subject, he asked, Been here long, stranger? About half an hour. Mmm. I've done better than that. Been here two whole hours. Come in on one of them village grove cable cars and come plumb through Middleway Pleasance. Mmm. But there some, them foreign fellows, only it seems to me there ain't no need of so many of them niggers of all shades, dressed up like Calathumpians on 4th of July, and standing round in everybody's way. I was not there to impart information, and I let the honest soul babble on. He had brawny shoulders and an ingenuous face, but I felt sure he had brought with him more money than was wise or needful, and that he would come to grief if he continued to deny the possession of money, with his tell-tale face flatly contradicting his words. But I was now recalled to myself and my own affairs, and dropping a few politely meaningless words, I left my first acquaintance and made my way toward the pavilion at the corner, where I had been told I should find the man in authority whom I sought. Putting my question to a guard in the ante-room, I was told that the man in authority was absent, would be absent two hours, perhaps, and not much loath to pass a little time in that splendid rotunda, stood gazing about the beautiful court of honour, with its fountains, statues, glittering and fair facades, rippling lagoons, and snowy and superb peristyle, statue-crowned and gleaming, with blue Lake Michigan, sun-kissed and breeze-tossed, stretching away to the horizon in pulsating perspective. Fairer than any dream it looked that fair May day, with justice golden and glorious rising from out the waves, splendid as a sun goddess, and dominating all the rest. As I turned away, having looked and looked again, I saw my first white city acquaintance seated upon a settle in the shadow of one of the mammoth arches, his basket between his knees and his umbrella between his two clasped hands. He was talking just as amiably and frankly as before and this time he had for audience a dapper man with a thin face that might have been old or young and which i disliked at sight he was exceedingly well dressed he looked very respectable but he also looked smug and sophisticated too sophisticated i thought to be really so well entertained as he seemed to be with my rustic friend's confidences for a few moments i watched the two to the exclusion of the golden justice the peristyle everything and then the settle being long and the two being its sole occupants i moved around going in and out unobserved among the crowd and seated myself upon the end of the bench unseen by my friend who sat with his broad shoulders and back squarely toward me and affording an ample screen between myself and his companion i have wondered since just what actuated me to do what i did but i only recall now a vague remembrance of a small black book seen in memory as in a vision and a fluttering page which seemed to blazon forth the question am i my brother's keeper the book it was buried in dead hands long ago and the words they had not been printed in the book more indelibly than upon my memory why should the sight of this homely honest rustic bring back these things i did not know but i seated myself in the shelter of his broad back and affected to be absorbed in a notebook and the bronzed plates upon the walls about me keeping meanwhile with one ear sufficiently close note upon their conversation and letting my mind wander what a strange scene out upon the lagoon swift electric launches swept by and gondolas slower but graceful and picturesque glided to and fro their lithe boatmen swaying to the deep swaying to the sweep of the single oar why did the sharp-eyed little woman opposite on the bench in the shadow of the goddess of air eye me so keenly and so long dividing her attention in fact between myself and a young mother with two tired children scarce more than infants both yonder went two turks bearing between them swaying betwixt two long poles a genuine turkish palanquin and crying hi hi to those who obstructed their direct line of march where was the man of authority i looked at my watch and my thoughts came back to myself and my own affairs an hour and a half to wait i wonder if brainerd is on the ground 
and what he will say of our joint undertaking when we meet for you can by no means establish a precedent by which to judge of brainerd's thoughts and deeds to come how will our work prosper shall we find it easy and shall we succeed for dave brainerd and i both professional detectives man-hunters if you will were sent to this white city on a twofold mission it was not our first work together and at first we did not enter into it with enthusiasm masters brainerd our chief said to us one morning they are going to want a lot of good men at that world's fair i think i'd better put you both on the list and this was all that was said then but when we were out of his presence dave exploded wants to send us to watch little boys look after ladies kerchiefs and hunt up lost babies does he he began in a fume it's not myself that'll do it you hear masters i'll go like the biggest gentleman of all or like the sleuth i am but no child rescuing and kick copping for me let this honour give us with a theatrical gesture a foeman worthy of our steel nothing came of this whimsical tirade and a week had passed before the chief spoke again upon the subject then we were both called into his private office and he said boys we have just found out to a certainty that greenback bob and his pals are going to operate at the world's fair i've already promised them more good men than i like to spare but we can't let bob and his crowd slip i did not really mean to send you either of you with the others but this is something worth while i should say broke in dave who was no respecter of persons unless perhaps it might have been of dave brainerd do you mean to tell us cap that the dandy frenchman is in it he's very much in it he crossed from calais on the last boat in hot haste and i'm much mistaken if the whole gang is not already on its way to the white city although he only reached this side the night before last and there's another party who may give us some trouble we don't know him but he is said to be an all-round bad one just come over from calais with this delbra i wish i could give you even a description of him greenback bob was a counterfeiter or so it was believed for he was so bold so shrewd and so generally successful that no one as yet had been able to entangle him in the meshes of the law though samples of what was believed to be his handiwork had been passed from hand to hand and travelled far before they had been challenged and their journeys summarily ended in the cabinet of our chief bob was known to be a gambler too and more than once had he been watched and shadowed because of some ill deed connected with his name we had seen his face and his picture adorned the rogues gallery delbra however was likely to give us some trouble we had seen him it is true but it was only a fleeting glimpse with the possibility that he was at the moment cleverly disguised of delbra we knew first that he was and had been for years the occasional partner or confederate of the counterfeiter and presumably a counterfeiter also next that he was set down in the records of the london police as dangerous and last that he had crossed the ocean leaving paris which had grown too hot to hold him and was avowedly en route for the world's fair it was thought upon mischief intent this last item came to our chief direct from the french police together with the information that two or three diamond robberies which had occurred in the french capital during the previous winter were laid at his door although it had been thus far impossible to bring the thefts home to him concerning greenback bob the fellow was known to us by no other name we felt quite sanguine we had seen him we had his photograph and his full description according to the bertillon system and once seen he would hardly be lost to sight again or so we flattered ourselves delbra we must identify through bob or as best we could and the third member of the gang well a great deal must be left to chance as usual this much we knew of delbra he was handsome educated familiar with the ways of good society and not an easy bird to catch this from the french police commissaire a pinchback gentleman eh had been dave brainerd scornful comment upon hearing this the worst set to deal with i'd rather tackle a straight out and outer any day 
Recalling this speech of Dave's brought my thought back to the old question, where was he? And then the dialogue at my elbow aroused my flagging attention and brought it back to my rustic acquaintance and the smug personage at his side. Well, now, I hadn't thought of that, but now to mention it was a good idea, and they wouldn't change it to the eating house? Not there. The smug man's tones were low and cautious. Pardon me, but don't speak too loud, my friend. The mere mention of money is likely to attract some sharper to you. No, they refused me there. You see, I anticipated some difficulty inside the gates, so I had tried just before entering. But the man at the desk refused, and very curtly, too. I wanted to enter at once, in order to meet half a dozen young men from my town, who are sort of under my care. Orphans? Not quite. They belong to my Bible class, you see, Mr. Smug explained modestly, and I had promised to be at the terminal station in case they arrived by the early train. Where from, you say? With awakening interest. I'm a Sunday school teacher myself when I'm to hum. Indeed. It's a very interesting and useful work, laboring for souls. Ah, they come from Marshall in Iowa. Don't say. Why, I... But they did not arrive. Their train had been delayed. But, as I was about to tell you, if I had not chanced to have in my possession a roll of bills put in my care by the father of one of the younger lads, I might have been kept outside for some time longer. How's that? I had been a little puzzled at this dialogue, and was losing my interest somewhat when it reached this point, and I pricked up my ears anew, while I continued to copy inscriptions and jot down memoranda. It seemed almost like confessing to a breach of trust, but there seemed no other way, and so, stepping to one side, I took out the package of money belonging to my young friend. I had counted it in his father's presence, and I knew that it contained, on the very outside of the roll, a two-dollar bill. I took this and procured my ticket. Of course, I shall explain to him and replace it at once. In course, but you was a saying. I began to tell you how I learned where to go to get money changed. I had entered, you must know, at the Cottage Grove Gate, opening upon Midway, and walking toward the east, I soon met a guard. He had drawn a cigar from his pocket while speaking, and he now turned toward me. I had lighted a weed upon seating myself near them, and as he uttered a polite, Pardon me, sir, I smoked calmly on, while I copied upon a fresh page of my notebook the legend, Jenna discovered the principle of vaccination in 1796, putting an elaborate final flourish after the date. Sir, your pardon, may I trouble you for a light? A light touch of his hand accompanied the words, and I turned slowly, favoured him with a look of as well-managed stupidity and inquiry as I could muster, drew from my pocket a little ear-tube, and adjusting it to my right ear, said, Hey? Again the little fellow made known his want, and then, apparently convinced that I had not been a listener, he resumed somewhat hurriedly, I thought. As I was saying, I met a guard and asked him where to go to get a bill exchanged. He mentioned one or two places a long way off, and then, happening to think of the arrangement made for the accommodation of foreigners, he courteously directed me to one of the agents quite near at hand. He allowed a big puff of smoke to escape his lips very slowly, and added, as if it were the final word, Those agencies for home and foreign exchange are a great convenience for travellers. What are they? demanded the rustic. Never heard on em. Really? Why, the administration has arranged a system of agencies which are supplied with a certain sum in small banknotes, greenbacks, which they are authorised to exchange for foreign currency and for the convenience of Midway Pleasance. One of these agents is established in Midway, near the Turkish village. One may know him by a small blue badge, with a silver stamp in the form of a half-dollar souvenir upon his coat. Oh! He proved very affable. The guard assured me I would find him so, and as the other agencies were so far away, I took advantage of his good nature, and instead of exchanging ten dollars, I got him to put a hundred-dollar bill into fifty crisp new two-dollar bills, fresh, like all this exchange money from the government treasury, a part, in fact, of that great output of two-dollar greenbacks issued by the government at the same time as the souvenir coins, as you no doubt remember. No, the rustic did not remember, but neither did he doubt. 
he was full of exclamations of wonder and admiration at the workings of so wonderful and generous a government and then came the climax would mr smug direct him to this affable agent upon midway etc as i was saying at first i don't lug much money around with me to such places as this here but what little i got ain't quite divided up enough to be handy i don't mind getting a fifty into new government greenbacks myself my wife and me are counting on staying in here a considerable of a spell and small change is handiest it's positively necessary declared smug getting up quickly i'll show you the place and the man and then i must be looking for my young men again i had not looked for this conclusion but as the rustic arose i closed my notebook and made ready to follow them i was all agog to see this amiable dealer in brand new government notes as the countryman turned toward his guide the small sharp-faced woman who had eyed us so long and often from her bench almost opposite arose and with a movement suggestive of steel springs and made her way toward us waving her umbrella to attract attention i moved rapidly aside in anticipation of the sweeping gesture of arm and umbrella which dislodged a tall man's hat and sent it rolling to the feet of a frisky maiden from whence it was rescued by smug who restored it with a placating word and so averted an unpleasantness meanwhile the woman had reached her husband's side and a few quick words had passed between the two then a gesture and another word or two evidently meant for an introduction brought the smug stranger to her notice and the three turned their faces towards the pleasance but not until i had heard her say to her better half as she clung to his arm while smug opened the way ahead i tell you he's a confidence man and i know it i've been a watchin him following the three at a little distance and discreetly i smiled at the woman's rustic cleverness and never did man smile more mistakenly end of chapter one Chapter Two of Against Odds by Lawrence L. Lynch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Two. I told my tale of woe. I followed the trio as they went rapidly past the terminal station and halted, laughing inwardly, while Mister Smug, as I had mentally named the man whose game I was watching so intently stood fidgeting before the great golden door of the transportation building waiting for the sharp-eyed woman to exhaust her ecstasies and for her more solid husband to close his wide-opened mouth and remember his errand to midway pleasance as for myself i could have gazed at this marvel of doorways and have forgotten all else and i was not sorry that the small farmeress had a will of her own and that this will elected to stay oh that superb eastern facade never before has its like been seen never in such a setting and in such gigantic proportions will we see it again but we left it at last and made a slow and halting progress past horticultural hall on one side and the sunlit lagoon on the other and here overcome by the grandeur of it all the woman of the party sat down with her face toward the water Tain't no kind of use pa she declared loudly. I'm going to sit down by the lake for a minute I guess there'll be some two dollar bills left in midway yet when we get there I've heard tell of them lovely lagoonses and I'm aching to see one and I'm just going to set right here till one goes by land just see them stone animals and all them old-fashioned stone figures of folks pears to me there's people enough alive and frisky without sticking all them stone men around so dreadful liberal though they look well enough fur as i know she cast her eyes all about her and then beckoned to smug standing uneasily in the rear say can't you show me one single lagoon smug came nearer and wandered his hand comprehensively toward the shining waters below them and southward where a red-sailed chinese junk lay at anchor opposite the transportation building that is a lagoon madam he said affably but low 
Humph! It's no better looking than our old mad scow. Come on, father. And they resumed their line of march, but not until, in turning to take a last look at the belittled lagoon, her snapping small eyes encountered mine frowningly, and I said to myself, She saw me in the rotunda. Can she suspect that I am following them? Contrary to my expectation, she did not call a halt upon entering Midway, but went straight on, still clutching her spouse by the arm, while the smug one walked sedately at her father's side. She passed the diver's exhibit, the beauty congress, the glass displays, and paced steadily on, her eyes riveted upon a palanquin borne by two waddling Turks. And when this ancient conveyance had paused before the Turkish bazaar, then, and only then, did she pause or take further heed. As the bearers gently lowered the chair and stood beside it at ease, she snatched her hand from her husband's arm, and hurrying towards the front, peered within the curtained box. "'Land of gracious!' she ejaculated, "'and I suppose they was carrying one of them harems, no less, in the outlandish thing.' Then, stooping to read with near-sighted eyes the legend, one hour, seventy-five cents, one half hour, fifty cents, ten minutes, fifteen cents. She turned again to her better half. Come, Pa, let's get that change right quick. I'm going to ride in that thing if I drop out through the bottom. There was a crowd in the Turkish bazaar, but our smug friend led the way to an angle of the building where the hawkers were unusually busy, and I drew near enough to see that he was now looking covertly all about him and for a little seemed at a loss come along come the shrill long drawn out cry caused him to turn suddenly and to elbow his way with his prey at his heels toward a small railed in space wherein seated on a turkish ottoman a little higher than the genuine was a swarthy man with beetling brows big rolling black eyes and a fierce moustache bristling underneath a hooked nose he wore a red fez much askew and his american trousers and waistcoat were enlivened by a tennis sash of orange and red and a smoking coat faced with vivid green he was smoking a decorated turkish pipe turkish he called it and a long table and sundry decorated boxes and packages were his sole stock in trade come all along he reiterated come e see me smoke easy so no noise so souvenir turkish souvenir matches at every pause a souvenir match was struck deftly and without noise and a big puff of smoke was sent circling above his head bah exclaimed mrs rustic turning away if you brought me here just to see a turkey man smoke a big pipe adam camp you may just take me home again a shout of laughter followed this sally and as she turned away i fancied that i saw a quick look exchanged between the man of the pipe and our smug guide whether this were true or not i observed that smug no longer seemed eager to hasten them onward and i saw another thing the woman in turning from the man of the souvenir matches had once more fixed her eye through a sudden opening in the crowd upon myself and immediately after she had whispered something in the ear of her spouse which something he soon after repeated or so i fancied to his kind friend smug i had followed them trusting to the crowd of my skill as an artful dodger up to this moment quite closely but i now fell back and withdrew myself a little distance from the aisle where all three were now loitering the woman examining with wondering eyes marvellous turkish slippers with turned-up toes and olive wood beads and bracelets proffered by fierce mohammedans in baggy trousers and tasselled fez or by swarthy oily-skinned girls with bushy hair and garments of oriental colouring or in tailor-made gowns and with the ubiquitous fez as a badge of their office or servitude rugs and draperies attar of roses in gilded vials souvenir spoons filigree in gilt and silver toys of unknown form and name cloying turkish sweets foreign stamps coins relics 
all came under her unsophisticated eyes while her spouse gazed upon moorish daggers swords of strange workmanship saddles and stirrups of singular form and much strange gear and gay trappings the use of which he could never have guessed but for the learned explanations of his now carelessly amiable guide they had gazed so long that i had begun to grow impatient and to wonder how this tame chase would end when the trio drew up at a point where the long arcade turns sharply to right and left and where at one of the intersections a vendor of singularly carved canes and sticks was mounted upon a stool draped with oriental rugs and so high and slender that one looked to see the occupant topple and fall from moment to moment he was a brown-faced fellow of small stature and as lithe as an indian and he was juggling recklessly with a pair of grotesque carven sticks crying the while here you are here you are souvenir souvenir genuine turkish genuine come on come on turkish genuine only three dollar a smart young man breathing of opulence in air and attire came briskly forward and held up his hand to receive both sticks with a harlequin bow from the dark-eyed oriental who wore a spruce black broadcloth suit in honour of america and a red fez in loyalty doubtless to the land of the sultan and then my interest became suddenly and widely awake the youth chose between the two canes and handed up in payment a worn five-dollar bill and after a feint at searching for the correct amount the man of the fez bent down and placed in his hand a crisp new two-dollar banknote at the same moment almost friend smug touched the arm of farmer camp and i saw the two turn their heads toward the southern wing i had made my way so near them that i could hear the words of the farmer who evidently had no subdued tones and after a long look toward the south entrance i heard him say that him why he looks like one of these fellers and then i saw his guide's lips moving and caught the final words an educated oriental in another moment he had moved hurriedly forward and put out his hand to stop the man who with head very erect and crowned with a black and gold embroidered fez was coming toward him but with eyes levelled upon the active young man upon the lofty stool he wore a severe suit of black relieved upon the breast of the close-buttoned prince albert coat by a blue satin badge bearing upon its upper half a silver gilt souvenir half dollar and upon the lower portion a tiny facsimile of a government banknote he paused as the smug young man addressed him and looked into his face at first with indifference almost amounting to annoyance then with growing recognition and finally with a bland and condescending smile he wore a long and flowing beard and the black cloth fez unlike the red one was not rakishly set on but i recognized him at once it was the man with the souvenir matches quickly and deftly metamorphosed to escape the unobservant or untrained eye but the same notwithstanding and now my interest grew apace i knew that at last we were in the presence of that powerful official who dispensed virgin two-dollar notes to the unwitting foreigner or native and adam camp was about to be mulcted i had formed no plan of action i had been interested first in the welfare of adam camp and then the mention of these new government two-dollar bills had aroused in me the desire stronger for the moment than any other to see this agent whose duty it was to make easy the path of the stranger and alien in our midst and now our smug friend demonstrated his ability to do quick work when occasion required throwing caution to the winds i drew close behind the woman and heard the introduction of camp and the case stated briefly smug had ventured to bring this chance acquaintance etc who desired a like favour to that conferred upon himself not long since mr camp desired to exchange a banknote say ten or twenty dollars perhaps for smaller bills 
for convenience at the fair etc the man of the badge looked closely at farmer camp who was bowing like a mandarin and then back at his spouse you can vouch for this person he asked with a touch of severity and in excellent english pardon me we are mere passing acquaintances but i should think he of the badge drew himself up with stately gesture we are not permitted to judge for ourselves he said our government requires some sort of voucher as for instance a bank certificate cheque-book even a receipt or letter before farmer camp could pull himself together and reply his wife interfered taking a swift step forward if you want documents mister she said tartly i guess i can supply em i brought our wedding stiffkit and our letters from the church to Neponset, and our fire insurance papers she laid a suggestive satin gloved hand upon her bosom and tossed her head i didn't count on nobody's taking us to be anybody else when i brung em and i didn't want em lost case of fire or anything the agent put up a remonstrant hand and camp hastened to produce a letter from his brother in nebraska which was gracefully accepted and so overpowered was camp at so much condescension that he opened a plump wallet carried in a breast pocket high up and evidently of home manufacture and drew from it after some deliberation and a whispered word with his wife a one hundred dollar bill i guess we might just as well break that he was extending the bill and the hand of the now eager agent was outstretched to grasp it when i stepped quickly to his side pardon me sir i said with my best air could you tell me where the bank is located i am told that there is one on the grounds the four pairs of eyes were full upon me and i knew that by three of them i was recognized i am anxious to get some money changed i went on glibly but with a meaning glance at the agent to buy some souvenir matches down here and i'm told there's counterfeit money circulating here i was playing a bluff game and i knew it for as yet i had not secured my credentials but when i saw the swart face of the sham agent change to a sickly yellow and smug begin to draw back and look anxiously from left to right i was inwardly triumphant but alack it is only in fiction that the clever detective always has the best of it and at this moment there came an unexpected diversion camp still stood with the bill in his hand open-mouthed and evidently puzzled and now his wife who had drawn closer and was peering into my face turned upon him quickly adam camp put up that money she cried i know this feller i seen him talking to you back there by the administration building and he's been watching and following us ever since i know him in another minute he would have grabbed your money and run for it there was a sudden movement a shifting of positions a mingling of exclamations and accusations with the woman's tongue still wagging shrilly and heard through all people crowded about us and a brace of columbian guards came hurrying up what is it anyone been robbed instantly the hands of smug and his confederate began to slap and dig into their pockets while the woman answered eagerly all on us like enough he's a pickpocket or a confidence man i seen him following us i've kept an eye on him and then came a cry from smug my wallet he turned upon me calling wildly to the guide search him into my nearest pocket went a gloved hand and when it came out there sure enough was a brown leather wallet here it is cried one lord a massy i told you so run him in i was the centre of a small bedlam and i shut my lips tightly and inwardly cursed my interest in all rustics and particularly the camps i was fairly trapped i saw my position and held my peace while the two rascals told their tale making sure by their volubility that the camps did not tell theirs only as the two guards one on either side turned to lead me away i said to smug we shall meet again my fine decoy and to the sham agent as i passed him better stick to your matches my friend inwardly chafing i marched through the crowd between my two captors bringing them to a momentary halt 
as we came abreast of the place where the souvenir matches were hawked and seeing there as i had anticipated a new face between the red fez then i spoke to my captors men you have made a mistake for which i can't blame you take me before your chief at once and i will not only prove this but make it worth your while to be civil for answer the two merely exchanged glances and hurried me on and convinced of the uselessness of further remonstrance until i had reached someone in authority i strode on silently at the entrance to the great animal show there was a dense crowd and for a moment we were brought to a halt standing upon the edge of the mass of bobbing bonnets and heaving shoulders i could see in the midst of the throng two turkish fez heads wildly dodging and struggling towards us and a moment later a full bass voice called impatiently go ahead get out of this can't you i started at the sound of the big impatient voice and stood with my eyes riveted upon the spot from whence it seemed to come a moment later the two red heads had emerged from the crowd and with them a sedan chair which evidently they found no easy load as they shuffled past me i started again so violently that my two captors caught at me with restraining hands at the same instant there was a quick exclamation from the swinging chair and a peremptory order to halt masters i say stop you infernal heathens stop i say open this old chicken coop and let me out as the astonished turks slowly and with seeming reluctance set down their chair and liberated their prisoner my guards made a forward movement stop you fellows called the newcomer in the same peremptory tone where are you going with that man as he flung himself from the chair he tossed a coin to the bearers and promptly placed himself squarely in the way of my two guards masters he began what in the name of wonder he's our prisoner broke in one of my captors and at the word dave brainerd threw back his head and laughed as only dave could seeing which my indignant escort made another forward movement stop you young donkeys dave threw back his coat and at sight of the symbol upon his inner lapel the two young men became suddenly and respectfully stationary now panted dave still shaken with merriment what is he done i stood silent enjoying somewhat my guard's evident doubt and willing to let dave enjoy to the full this joke at my expense and after a moment's hesitation one of the guards replied he picked a pocket they say oh they do well my young friends i can't blame you much he is a suspicious-looking chap but really he's quite harmless you can turn him over to me with a clear conscience i'll run him in and he laughed again and tapped his coat lapel really boys you've made a regular blunder this pal of mine is entitled to wear this same badge of aristocracy only he seems to have wandered out for once without his credentials how did it happen carl but now my impatience broke out afresh and i turned to the guards look here i said hurriedly those two fellows who called you up and pretended to be robbed are fine workers and i believe counterfeiters i was watching them while they were roping that old countryman if you want to repair a blunder go back see if you can trace the men or the old man and his wife and report to your chief they were very willing to go and when we were free from them my friend indulged in another long and hearty laugh at my expense jove cow but it's the richest thing out that you a crack detective coming here with extraordinary rights and privileges should be nabbed by a couple of these young college lads at the very beginning it's too funny how did it happen who caused your arrest an old woman said i shortly feeling that the fun was quite too one-sided but seeing the absurdity of it all and knowing that dave would have it all out of me sooner or later i drew him out of the crowd and under the shadow of the viaduct just behind us and standing as much as possible aloof from the throng i told my tale of woe before i had reached the end dave was his serious self once more a detective alert and keen you are sure he began eagerly that the old farmer was not one of them i smiled thinking of mrs camp and the lagoons perfectly sure it was the old woman's quick eyes that did for me 
I replied she had seen me once too often and her suspicions were on the alert I dare say she saw a confidence man in every person who came suspiciously near them But a woman pal could not have played one whit better into their hands Dave made a sudden start look here. He said I'm going to try for a look at those fellows I've got a sort of feeling that they may belong to our gang some of them that match vendor now the other your smug friend is too short as you describe him to be either of our men but the agent and that fellow with the canes describe them a little more in detail but be quick too and the old folk of course they're taken in and done for before now but i'd like to meet that old woman just on your account i'm going straight to that turkish village and you he began to laugh again oh i'm going back to the administration building i said with a grimace as soon as i've described your men for you I don't feel inclined to wander about this mysterious and dangerous white city any more until I am fitted out with the trademark It's not safe for me Five minutes later Dave was on his way to the scene of my absurd escapade And I was hastening back to the place which I never should have left until I had made my bow before the man in authority and had been duly provided with the voucher which would open for me all doors and command the aid or obedience of guards guides etc Until in fact I had been duly enrolled and had taken rank as one of the specials who went and came at will and reported at pleasure or at need On my way I soundly berated myself for my folly in venturing so recklessly and without authority to interfere in behalf of a sheep when besieged by wolves and in danger of losing no more than his fleece I Had lost all interest in farmer camp and felt not a spark of philanthropy in my whole being But the white city was a place of surprises and farmer camp and I were destined to meet again as I approached the viaduct which separated the Midway Pleasance from the World's Fair proper with my mind thus out of tune and was about to pass under a sharp guttural cry close beside me caused me to turn quickly about Takaka Lady lady ah The first cry or warning came from the throat of a grinning Turk one of a number of palaquin bearers and the last from the lips of a tall golden-haired girl Who had been walking somewhat slowly and quite alone just before them in the path she had chosen to take and to keep without swerving There were half a dozen of them pattering along in line between their vacant swinging palanquins And they had evidently learned that being a part of the show they might claim and keep the right of way The rascally Turk had uttered his cry of warning without in the least slackening his shuffling trot and as the lady uttered the single frightened syllable I saw that one of the poles in the bearers hands had struck her with such force as to send her reeling toward me throwing out one hand for her support i thrust back the now surly bearer with the other with such force as to throw him back upon his poles and bring the whole cavalcade to a momentary halt at the same time a guard came up and ordered a turn to the right you fellows are not running in a tramway mr morocco and you'll find yourself switched to a side track if you try the monopoly business on free American citizens see the last word emphasized with a sharp shove to the right was easily comprehended by the glowering sons of Allah and they moved on silent but darting black glances from under their heavy brows meanwhile the fair one had recovered her poise and dignity and thanked me in the sweetest of voices for my slight assistance and I had found time to note that she was more than a merely pretty blonde at that moment I was sure that I had never seen a more charming face Though she gave me only a glimpse of it and when she turned away and the crowd about us attracted for the moment Separated again into its various elements. I stood gazing after her for a moment as stupidly as the various schoolboys smitten at sight of his first love and then turning to go my way and letting my eyes fall to the ground I saw just at my feet a small leather bag or what is called by the ladies a reticule It lay upon the very spot where the young lady had been so rudely jostled 
and I picked it up and turned to look after her She had disappeared in the crowd and after following the way she had taken for two or three blocks and Finding the crowd more dense and the trail hopelessly lost I turned at last and went back bestowing the little reticule in my largest pocket and gradually bringing my thoughts back to my own affairs and those of greenback bob and the rascal delbra end of chapter 2chapter 3 of against dodds by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter 3 a conundrum i had not gone far on my way after deciding that the lovely blonde had quite escaped me in fact i was once more about to pass under the viaduct opposite the woman's building and which separated midway from the grounds proper when a tall figure in blue appeared at my elbow and fell easily into my somewhat hasty stride while saying you will pardon me i hope for intruding and let me say how much i appreciated and enjoyed the sudden way in which you halted that turk just now it was scientifically done i turned to look at the speaker his words were courteously uttered and i knew him at once by his blue uniform for one of those college-bred guards who have helped so much to make the great fair a success to question asking visitors He was a tall handsome fellow with an eye as brown as his hair and as honest and direct as the sun's rays at that very moment And I recognized him almost at once at the guard who had hastened to lend his aid and had sent the Turks to the right about There being nothing else to do a churl could not have resisted that pleasant half smile it was nothing I said carelessly the fellow was wantonly heedless It was a very pretty and scientific turn of the wrist he insisted and Yes, those fellows at first were obsequious enough Now some of them having found out how ill-mannered the Americans dare be without being beaten are aping our manners I I trust the lady was not hurt The big brown eyes turned from me as he put the question for that it was and I saw a dull red flush rise from his throat and dye his face to the very tip of his jaunty visor I Detected too a note of anxiety in the mellow voice that he could not quite suppress I Don't know but fancy not not much at any rate We had come out from the shadow of the viaduct and he halted as I spoke I checked my steps also and checked my speech too the anxiety in the voice was reflected now in the face I was smiling slightly and through my mind fitted a fragment of doggerel. Oh, there's nothing so flirtatious as the bold soldier boy Suddenly the brown eyes came back to my face open and clear as day I owe it to myself he said with sudden dignity to explain At the moment when she turned away I recognized the young lady as an acquaintance and was naturally interested to know if she had received any hurt the blow seemed a severe one I saw you pick up her bag and start in pursuit and when you came back I ventured to address you I could not follow far this is my beat I see I was quite won by the young fellow's frank and manly air and his handsome face and I'm sorry I can't enlighten you I did not find the lady oh there was a world of disappointment in this one syllable and before he could utter another a new voice broke into the dialogue Pardon me, please, but a little pant, but I saw you pick up my friend's bag and and as she was so fatigued after the shock that I ran back The speaker stopped here and for several seconds seemed occupied in recovering her breath She was a small and plump brunette well dressed and wearing a dashing sailor hat of black wide brimmed and adorned with two aggressive looking scarlet wings this and the red veil dotted with black which partially concealed the face was all that I had time to note before she spoke again Coming closer to me and altogether ignoring the good-looking guard She was so startled and nervous after the shock that she sat down near the Java village and I came back the moment I could leave her She shot a glance over her shoulder and turned her look squarely upon the guard who had drawn back a pace a chair boy she hurried on Waiting near the Libby glassworks saw you pick up the bag 
and told us the way you had gone will you please give me the bag i had been studying the little brunette while she talked and i now said i am very sorry your friend did not come in person she did not seem much hurt she was not and she would have come with me only again she cast her eyes in the direction of the guard who still stood looking both anxious and ill at ease and for a moment she seemed to hesitate in that moment the guard's fine face flushed again and then set itself in cold resolute lines he lifted his hand to salute me and without a second glance at the little brunette strode back toward the viaduct the face of the girl showed instant relief and she put out her hand the bag please excuse me i answered but really i can't let the lady's property out of my hands without something to prove your right to it since the lady is so near if you will permit i will go back with you how dare she threw back her head her black eyes darted annihilation how dare you sir because i condescend to address you to oblige an acquaintance do you fancy i will accept your escort and pocket your insult not for ten thousand leather bags she turned upon her heel and went swiftly back towards midway and after watching her for a moment i resumed my often interrupted march smiling as i went to think how the clever little brunette had been thwarted that she was an adventuress i did not for a moment doubt she had seen the dropped bag of course and had noted my pursuit of its owner and its failure and had counted upon making me an easy dupe with that assured little demand of hers but i was not quite a stranger to her kind perhaps if the good-looking guard had not been so suddenly put to rout i might have turned the young lady over to him such offenders were his legitimate care but as i thought of her easy self-possessed good society air and the black eyes so keen and sophisticated and then of his frank ingenuous face i almost laughed aloud she would have laughed at his authority and slipped through his fingers easily how quickly he had turned away at the first hint that she found his presence at our brief interview undesirable flushing like a boy too of course i readily saw why she should prefer to make her little attempt without witnesses especially those clothed with a measure of authority and yet he had seemed to go away reluctantly and then i remembered his explanation or excuse in having followed and addressed me he had known the young lady owner of the bag why of course he wanted to hear of her further from the lips of this supposed girlfriend poor fellow i thought beginning to imagine a little romance there in the white city and then i turned myself about with a sudden jerk truly my wits were wool gathering confound that little adventuress he had turned away so suddenly and he knew the owner of the bag i would find him at once he was not far away and i would wash my hands of that little black bag but it was not to be i had expected to find my handsome guard easily and i did not find him at all after a half hour spent in prowling up and down i encountered a file of guards marching briskly i caught at my watch and then scoffed at myself of course my guard had gone to dinner i would do likewise and then when my other and more personal duties had been discharged i would look up the guard it would be quite easy the arrangements for our comfort during our stay in the white city had been completed in advance of our coming and dave and i had been quartered together in a cosy little apartment which we could reach easily and as quietly as if it were an isolated dwelling instead of being in the very centre of all the beauty and bustle of the fair having paid my respects to the man in authority and after he had made me familiar with the inner workings of the splendid system by which the white city was to be watched over and protected and acquainted with some of my co-workers i was ready for a hearty luncheon and then i found myself my own master for the remainder of the day or until four o'clock when dave and i were to meet by appointment at the ferris wheel and tempt its dangers together of course my first attempt after luncheon was to find my handsome guard but while good-looking young fellows and polite young fellows in blue uniforms were to be seen on every hand the one face for which i looked was nowhere visible 
I still had the lost bag in my outer pocket which I watched jealously for its bulk could be but too plainly seen and when Dave and I found ourselves moving slowly upward at the tip of one of those giant spokes of the big wheel he fixed his eye upon this pocket and asked with a grin got an extra luncheon in case we are stranded in mid-air until past the christian dinner hour of course i told him the story of the find but briefly for my eyes were busy watching the people in the grounds below grow less and less in size until they seemed like flies moving about eccentrically the legs of the men seeming to jerk about convulsively and looking automatic from that height there was much to amuse us in midway or on it for at first the street with its strange population was spectacle enough and we did not think of the black bag again until we found ourselves occupying isolated places upon the lofty seats in hagenbeck's great animal show and being serenaded by an excellent band while we watched the entry of the happy family we had entered at a time midway between the closing of one performance and the beginning of another and we found it a comfortable place in which to exchange experiences and compare notes my first question had been of the camps and their swindling friends but dave's report was scant he had seen the man of the canes but the seller of souvenir matches was no longer he of the big moustache and goodly height but a small elderly turk who piped weakly and plied his calling listlessly the camps smug the gentlemanly agent all had disappeared from off midway i was not surprised at this neither was i disappointed and having said as much i took up the parable of my latest adventure upon midway telling of my encounter with the guard and the little brunette and letting my fun-loving friend enjoy another good laugh at my expense i must say carl old fellow that so far as i have traced your career this first day at the fair you have not shone out brilliantly but never mind partner a bad beginning you know the rest oh are we to have a look at the bag i had drawn it forth and placed it upon my knee it was a small receptacle of finest alligator skin with an outside pocket and having attached to it the tiny chain and hook by which it had been secured to the young lady's girdle it closed with a silver clasp and in the open outside pocket was a fine white handkerchief with some initials embroidered in one corner j j read dave slowly that don't tell us much does it old man i looked about me but there was no one near us and on the opposite side of the big pavilion the band was playing after the ball i pressed the silver clasp and the bag lay open in my hand gad exclaimed dave the woman who owns that is as dainty as a princess he was quite right the little bag contained only a small silver-handled penknife a dainty tablet and pencil a glove buttoner a second little handkerchief fine and smoothly folded and two letters when i had taken out these articles one by one and laid them on my knee dave took the bag from my hand and turned it upside down nothing more he said shaking his head sagely not a bit of candy not a powder puff or perfume sachet well well carl the owner of this little article whoever she is besides being dainty and without vanity is a very clever little woman and i'll wager she's pretty too this outbreak was so like dave that i only smiled while i unfolded the handkerchief and shook it out over my unoccupied knee in one corner an exquisitely dainty embroidery were the two initials j j and when dave had shut the bag and looked again at the closed clasp he discovered finely cut on the metal the same initials j j mused dave that suggests any number of charming possibilities juliet juno jessica jane or jemima i supplemented taking up one of the letters it was postmarked boston and bore the date three days before but it gave us no further information through the name across the middle of the square envelope half a dozen heavy lines had been penciled and these in turn checked through with little vertical dashes below were the sketchily drawn supports which indicated a bridge 
and upon this bridge a procession of people vaguely outlined as to body but elaborated as to face to such a degree of artistic cleverness that dave uttered an exclamation of delight an artist upon my soul look at those faces gad but that is well done there are types for you and hardly more than thumbnail portraits at that but it spoiled the address and we can't get j j s name out of that it was quite true under the crossed lines forming the platform of a bridge evidently a sketch of one of the structures spanning the lagoons the name was quite concealed but below through the waving water lilies and the curves of the arch we could read and guess the remainder of the address thus blank chicago illinois massachusetts building world's fair i put this letter down and took up the other envelope upon this was written a woman's name nothing more neither town county nor state conundrum commented dave over my shoulder and then there was a sudden blare from the band and a roar that almost startled my sophisticated nerves i turned my eyes toward the arena where a splendid white horse now stood caparisoned in a sort of armor upon back and neck and pawing impatiently while he waited opposite a sort of portable platform higher than the horse's back and gaily cushioned and decorated a great tawny male lion was in the act of leaping from the ground to this high perch i had seen many exhibitions of animal intelligence and training but when this king of lions uttering a second mighty roar leaped to the back of the waiting horse and rode about the ring like a trained rider leaped through a hoop held in the mouth of a big spotted boar hound and otherwise acquitted himself like an accomplished rider i forgot the conundrum of the little black bag and my mission at the world's fair and looked and applauded and was simply one of five hundred sightseers it was useless to contend the charm was upon us the first day at the fair had us at last in thrall and we watched the trained lions tigers bears and pumas admired the ponies applauded the dogs and wondered at the plucky woman trainer without a thought beyond the passing moment the fever lasted until night had fallen until we had trundled from end to end of midway in a pair of wheeled chairs visited the dahomey village the ostrich farm the chinese theatre and the little community of quaint shy industrious javanese leaving it still in the spirit of adventure and sauntering after dinner in old vienna here and there through a veritable fairyland glittering glistening shining radiant from the splendid dome of the administration building with its girdles of fire its great statues shining under the golden glow and the lagoons with their lights and shadows their gondolas gliding to and fro between flowering banks or illuminated facades with fountains playing music filling the air and everywhere laughter merry voices and gay throngs of enchanted pleasure seekers what wonder that we lingered long and that it was only when we were shut between four walls the lights out the white city asleep that i thought again of j j and her lost letters and now as i thought the fair blond face seemed to rise before me and i saw again the slim figure flit past me on midway brainerd lay sleeping near me and i thought of his comment a conundrum why not search for the answer in these white billet and finding it take the little black bag to the bureau of the lost and found i took up the bag opened it hesitated and put it down why should i read those letters from a stranger and to a stranger i leaned out of the window and drank in the loveliness all about me illuminated by a faint young moon a conundrum i took up the letter postmarked boston and slowly drew out ah it was more than a mere letter that my hand touched that night i had put my finger upon the thread in the web of fate end of chapter three chapter four of against odds by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter four i can't make myself like him i am not superstitious and i certainly had no intimation then 
of the part these letters would soon play in my world's fair adventures nor of the use i should make of them but i opened that letter with an uncomfortable feeling of curiosity and interest and without even pausing to look again at the tiny grotesque faces of that little bridge procession so artistically sketched upon the envelope the letter like its cover was dated from boston and was just four days old just received i said to myself as i took up the wrapper to look at the chicago postmark yes came last night she must have read it this very morning sitting upon some one of those shaded seats on wooded island and after reading it she must have amused herself by copying the people passing over the nearest bridge ergo she must have been alone my detective instincts were rousing themselves already i was half unconsciously handling that unread letter as if it were a feature in a case she was alone too when we met on midway that is i saw no companion could it be possible that the young lady was really alone in this densely populated place how absurd i looked at the letter again it was written in a beautiful flowing hand and i said after a moment's scrutiny written in haste and under excitement there were eight closely written pages and having begun their perusal i read to the end without a pause the letter was signed hilda o'neill and there was no street number nor post office box only the name of the city from whence it came boston hilda o'neill was the name written on the second letter this and nothing more but this no longer surprised me miss o'neill was a new york girl and a guest at the time of writing of the sister of her affianced in boston this young man was already in chicago making arrangements for his family who were to come as soon as informed by him that apartments in the already crowded city were in waiting they were all ready for the flitting and were now wondering why jerry did not wire them he had written that his plans were near completion and that he should telegraph them in two or three days at the latest at the time of writing the three days were just about to expire hence the excitement visible in the penmanship of miss o'neill betwixt impatience and anxiety she confessed herself growing really fidgety especially as jerry was always so prompt and then don't think me silly dear but really chicago is such a wicked dangerous place especially now I smiled as I read this paragraph and thought of master Jerry doubtless giving himself a last day or two of freedom from escort duty and of fun perhaps on midway Decidedly detectives are not seers and The second letter since the first did not tell me how or where to find the owner of the little bag this letter must and her name would that be revealed I opened the missive and read it through with some surprise and a great deal of admiration I had been right in my conjectures of the writer I found her name signed in full at the bottom of her last thick sheet of creamy note paper She had penned the letter in her own room that very morning and had held it unsealed and only half addressed until she had applied at her state post office for the expected letter from her friend and this having been received she had thrust the newly written missive into the little bag hoping doubtless soon to meet her correspondent who might now be on the way and to tell her story for the letter contained a story which doubtless she would much prefer to do and now so much can a few written pages do i almost felt that i knew june generous for that was her name and her friend Hilda O'Neill miss O'Neill's letter had told me first something about herself that she was a petted and somewhat spoiled only daughter Something of an heiress too if one might judge from her prattle about charming and costly costumes and a rather reckless expenditure of pin money and That she was betrothed to Gerald Trent of the great Boston firm of Trent and sons with the full consent and approval of all concerned what life could be more serene young fair rich a lover and many friends 
and now en route for the world's fair to enjoy it in her lover's society happy girl the only little speck upon her fair horizon when she penned that letter was the fact that her dearest friend and schoolmate was not quite so happy and june generous the two letters taken together had told me this she was an orphan and wealthy left in her teens to the guardianship of an aunt her father's widowed sister a woman of fashion par excellence during her niece's minority this lady had tyrannized all she would and now miss jenrys having recently come of age she yet tyrannized all she could the aunt was eager to mate her niece to a man of her own selection and a heavy purse the niece until recently had looked with some favor upon a young man handsome enough even miss o'neill admitted that and a gentleman beyond question but with no visible fortune a short time before but i will let miss jenrys tell this much of her own story quoting from the fourth page of her letter i did not mean it so really hilda dear although it has seemed so to you you see i expected to meet you in boston ere this and that is so much better than writing and now i must write after all and instead of its being from me in boston to you in new york it is from me here in the white city such a city hilda to you in boston at nelly trent's well you must know this that it was just after aunt charl had washed her hands of me matrimonially speaking for the well for the last time and i was feeling very high and mighty and aunt charl quite subdued for her that we gave a reception the last before lent of course he was there and i had made up my mind that day that i would be honest with my own heart in spite of aunt child i'm sure he cares for me i said to myself and well i knew i liked him a little i knew he only waited for the opportunity to speak and while i would have died rather than help him make it i said if he does find the chance if he does speak or when he does well i shall never forget that night aunt was good enough to say that i was looking my very best i'm sure i felt so but of course aunt spoiled it all her pretty speech i mean june she wheedled that handsome maurice voisin will be here and i happen to know that he admires you very much charlie wiltby says he is no end of a swell in paris and that he is really a rich man who prefers to be modest and avoids fortune hunting girls you are old enough to settle down and with your fortune and his you might be a leader in parisian society there's no place in the world where money and good looks together will do so much for one as they will in paris think of it hilda if i had not felt so at peace with all the world just then there would have been an occurrence then and there but i held my tongue and was even inclined to be a little sorry that aunt's silly talk was making me feel a genuine antipathy for monsieur maurice voisin of paris renown and really at that time i hardly knew the man he is certainly rather good-looking in a dark spanish fashion and he is taller and somehow more muscular looking than the typical frenchman he is certainly polished shines almost too much for my liking but that may be really aunt child's fault rather than monsieur v's that night at least before supper i had no word or thought against him but i must get on about him and i'll make it very short you know how our conservatory is arranged and that little nook just at the entrance to the library where the palms are grouped well i had danced with them both and he had just asked me to go with him into the conservatory to sit out the waltz when monsieur voisin came to claim it i had for the moment forgotten it and he had only time to say just one word after well i'll be candid if it does humiliate me after that waltz i eluded monsieur voisin leaving him with aunt child and went into the conservatory it was so early and the dancers still so fresh that no one was there as yet i had been stopped once or twice on my way 
and when I entered the conservatory by way of the drawing room, I fancied for a moment that someone was standing in the shadow of the palms just inside the library door. But I went on and reached the nook without being observed. I sat down quite out of sight, thinking that if he entered from the ballroom the most direct way, I should see him first. Imagine my surprise then when almost instantly I heard a movement on the other side of the mound of fairy palms and Then at the very first word came my own name There I will not repeat the shameful words But it was his voice that owned to an intention to honor me with a proposal Because his finances were getting low and he must choose matrimony as the least of two evils etc While I sat there unable to move and half stunned by this awful insult suddenly there was a quick rustling a high stifled laugh some whispered words and then another voice which i did not at first recognize said very near to me ah good evening mr uh lossing charming spot really then there was another movement some low muttered words and the sound of footsteps going across the marble toward the library then suddenly right before me appeared monsieur voisin i could not conceal my agitation and gave the same old hackneyed reason heat fatigue sudden faintness monsieur voisin hastened in search of water and i dropped my face upon my hands to be aroused the next moment by his voice agitated hurried making me a proposal then something seemed to nerve me to fury i sprang up and standing erect before him said mr lossing as i am unfortunately not in the matrimonial market i fear i cannot be of assistance to you much as i regret that the low state of your finances is driving you to so painful a step allow me to pass before he could reply i had swept past him and meeting monsieur voisin just beyond the palms i took his arm and went back to the ballroom hilda pride and anger held me up then for i fully believed him the most perfidious of men but since much as i hate myself for it there are times when i doubt the evidence of my own senses and cannot believe that he ever said those words the next morning while my anger still blazed he sent me a letter which i returned unopened that is all hilda he left town the same day i have been told and now you understand doubtless why I am here Monsieur voisin of course was not to blame But I could not disconnect him from the rest of the hateful experience And so at the beginning of Lent I packed my trunks and set out for the country and Aunt Anne's at Greenwood Dear Aunt Anne who is so unlike Aunt Charles Then followed some details of their arrival at the World's Fair and an amusing account of the good lady's first impressions which were so large and so astounding that she was obliged to remain at home and take the entire day to think things over in think of it hilda shut up like a hermit just two blocks from the gate is not that like nobody on earth but sweet slow obstinate countrified aunt anne of whom thank heaven i am not one bit ashamed in spite of her shaker bonnet but i can't lose a day of this wonder unfortunately Dear Aunt Anne never dreams of tabooing my sightseeing When I proposed to come alone this morning the dear soul said well I should hope thee could only two straight blocks between here and the gate at 57th Street and If they can manage to get lost with all those guards and guides to say nothing of the maps and pictures These are stupid niece, and they must go back to thy Aunt Charlotte Hevenmeyer If Aunt Charlotte could only hear that well dear I have promised myself a happy time here with aunt Anne when she is not occupied with her meditations and yourself soon and without aunt C but alas everybody will visit the fair and yesterday upon Midway whom should I see but monsieur voisin he was attired as I have never seen him before quite negligee you know and wearing a Turkish fez it was very becoming he did not see me and for this I was thankful I Did not come to the world's fair to see monsieur voisin and even to please aunt Charles. I can't make myself like him 
I put down this letter and smiled over its sweet ingenuousness and singularly enough I joined the fair writer in heartily disliking monsieur voisin He was altogether too conveniently near at the scene of that unlucky proposal I muttered to myself and then I turned to the other letter I wanted to see what I could make between the two out of young Lossing I Have asked you twice miss O'Neill wrote about your affair with young mr. Lossing your aunt is entirely at a loss only she declares she is sure that you have refused him and that in some way he has offended you and I thought him almost perfect a knight sans reproche etc and he is so handsome and frank and manly what happened dear it is so strange that he should vanish so utterly from society where he was made so much of and no one seems to know where he went or when or why or how Jerry says he was a perfect companion and as honorable as the sun there I'll say no more My reading was broken in upon at this point by a prolonged chuckle and I looked up to see Brainerd wide awake and staring at me Well he queried promptly. Have you found out her name? Yes, it is June generous as I spoke I returned miss O'Neill's letter to its decorated envelope and replace the two in the bag I'll tell you about them I said as I put it aside Somehow I felt a sudden reluctance at the thought of seeing these two letters in the hands and under the eyes of an inveterate joker like Dave I'm no wiser in the matter of address however and then I told him the purport of the letters in the fewest words possible You know said Dave when I had finished my recital I don't like that voisin not even a little bit. I think he's a bad lot. I Smiled at this there was not a jot of romance in Dave Brainerd's makeup and not a great depth of imagination But he was the keenest man on the trail and the clearest reasoner among a large number of picked and tried detectives It amused me to think that both had been similarly impressed by this man as he had been set before us but I made no comment and to draw away from a subject which I felt it beyond our province to discuss, I asked, Dave, what did you mean this afternoon when we opened that bag by saying that the owner was a clever woman? Upon what did you found that remark? Why, upon the fact that she did not put her purse in that convenient but conspicuous little bag, in consequence of which she is, or was, only slightly annoyed, instead of being seriously troubled at its loss. By the way, or rather to go out of the way do you know that they have in the French government building a very fine and complete exhibition of the Bertillon identification system I want to get it I want to get to it bright and early in the morning I moved to his side and sat down upon the bed we were both admirers of this fine system and for some moments we discussed it eagerly as we had done more than once before and when I put my head upon my pillow at last it was with JJ and her interests consigned to a secondary place in my mind The first being given over to this wonderful French system the pride of the Paris police and terror of the French criminal But we little know what a day or a night may bring forth Someone rapped at our door at an unpleasantly early hour and the summons brought Dave out of bed with a bound and in another moment had put all thought of the previous night out of our heads Will you come to the captain's office at once gentlemen said a voice outside and I caught a glimpse of a guard's blue uniform through the half open door There's been a big diamond robbery right under our noses, and they're calling out the whole force End of chapter 4chapter 5 of against odds by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter 5 it's all a miracle it was even as the summoning guard had said and the secret service bureau was in a very active condition when brainerd and myself arrived already telephone messages were flying or had flown 
to the various districts and at every gate thanks to the almost perfect system instituted by superintendent bonfield shrewd and keen-eyed men were on the alert for any and all suspicious personages and woe to those whose descriptions were written down in the books of the secret service men they must be able to give good account of themselves or their liberty would be brief it was not difficult to guess why my friend and myself had been so promptly summoned in spite of the fact that already more than three hundred men trained detectives from our own large cities and from abroad were upon duty here it was because they were on duty every man at his post whatever that might be and because brainerd and myself having newly arrived and being for the moment unoccupied were both near and available because too we were specials that is not subject to routine orders the robbery had really been a large one and a bold one a collection of gems cut and uncut belonging to a foreign exhibit and placed almost in the centre of one of those great well-guarded buildings must be one would think proof against attack carefully secured in their trays and boxes shut and locked behind heavy plates of glass in bronzed iron frames guarded by day by trusted employees always under the eye of manager or exhibitor and by night by a guard of drilled watchmen what collection could be safer nevertheless at night there sparkled in those crystal prisms a little silver leaf with slightly curved edges holding what looked like a tiny heap of water drops congealed and sparkling shot through by a winter sunbeam several larger diamonds uncut but brilliant and of great value some exquisite specimens of pink topaz and one great limpid gleaming emerald the pride of the fine collection this at night in the morning they were not we sat down a small group for we did not hold counsel in the outer office nor with one superfluous member and began to find or make for ourselves a starting point the work had been done very deftly one of the glass plates had been cut out close to the bronze frame and the gems removed but that was not the strange part of the affair in their places counterfeit gems had been put careful imitations of the originals and the glass plate had been deftly put in its place again ah said the fussy and half distracted little man who represented the great foreign house so neatly defrauded ah if i had not come down this morning not one other would have no i am the one only expert see i am present when the place is unclosed i stand near when something make a big chuck he meant shock or jar and rich town falls out the class when i have seen it i go quick and look dozen shams ah i know it a while tis false hour every stones that was the story they had found the glass cut the false gems in place of the true when we had stemmed the tide of this foreign eloquence which was not for some time i asked how many know of this no potty at all only not more than half a dozen broke in the chief of the bureau of course it wouldn't do these are not the things that we like to let the public into it wouldn't harmonize ah aspirated the little man it would drive away all the time and machines together together you are right you are murmured dave and then in a louder tone can you trust your people to keep silent ah never fear they know it is for te good where are they the attendants queried the captain two are in charge of the pavilion which remains closed lausch here was very clever he sent for me at once meantime keeping everything under cover and when i saw how the land lay i ordered close mouths all around and put up a card closed for repairs then i sent for you and we came back here of course you will want to see the place the place and the people i said somewhat impatiently and we can't get it over too quick we spent three of the long morning hours in viewing first the case where the real gems had been and next the shams that had taken their place then the surroundings and last and one by one 
the people engaged about the Lausch pavilion they were all viennese speaking the english language fairly well far better than mr lausch himself and after we had questioned them closely and carefully we closeted ourselves together and discussed the few points so far gathered if points upon investigation they proved to be carl chuckled my friend when we were at last alone one of our missions here at the great columbian exposition was to hunt diamond thieves eh of course his meaning was plain to me but i chose to differ with him there was no better way of rousing his wits of all the expert thieves in the two continents the only ones who will not come here will be those whose faces are in every rogues gallery in the land i replied it would be too much good luck to find bob and delbra mixed up in this deal and yet declared he i am willing to wager that it's the work of delbra et al who but he would have prepared himself with a full assortment of paste jewels honestly old man don't you agree with me yesterday i replied i was ready to swear that greenback bob and his friend delbra were circulating perhaps issuing those two dollar government notes and what's to hinder you thinking so still eh only that it would be too much of a fairy story to find our work cut out for us in such a way Dave threw one sturdy leg across the chair nearest him and settled himself in his favorite attitude for an argumentative discourse Young man he began if you can find anything connected with this white city That has sprung out of the lake and the prairie that has not a touch of the Arabian Nights about it I want to know where it is Can you show me anything more fairy like than this fairy city built as it has been in the teeth of time? Oh, I tell you it's all a miracle a 19th century miracle to come down to facts now You and I came here expecting to find greenback Bob didn't we? Yes, of course And we have good reason to believe that Delbra is also here not much miracle about that you'll admit No, I assented knowing that he must reach his climax in his own way No, I should say so but here is a miracle a regular white city miracle i wonder if delbra and company know that leaving a couple of thousand of blue-coated columbian guards out of the question and they're bright fellows let me tell you there are here three hundred and odd picked detectives a squad at every gate and every gate and every district connected by telephone with the main office here let a suspicious character appear click goes the nearest telephone sending the man's description to headquarters and then click 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 to every district every gate every man goes this same description oh the crooks whose faces are known will find a warm welcome here it's only the fine workers who have been so successful that they are not well known who can make hay in this place all the same i here submitted for such fellows as delbra and his ilk who know the world on both continents this is a promising field in spite of the telephone system and the detectives in plain clothes at every gate as how to the man who can speak several tongues and is an adept in disguise this fair with its citizens from every clime will be a better place for concealment than london paris and new york rolled into one dave gave utterance to a long low whistle and jerked himself to an upright position you're right again he cried come let's get down to business what's your idea about this robbery about the same as yours i fancy and what's that i took out my notebook wherein i had jotted down the most important items of testimony elicited from the lausch attendants saying get out your notes dave let's see how they agree dave produced his own briefer notes and I began running my finger slowly down the pages It was done during the day of course impatiently and slowly that is a little at a time how slowly Well for instance Lausch himself told of a young woman who was much taken with the pink topaz display you remember Yes beginning to smile behind his book He said that she wore a coat with a deep cape and that she rested one arm upon the case well, I did wonder what the woman's dress had to do with it 
gad but you questioned those people until i began to feel sorry for them what figure now is the dress likely to cut i laughed in this case let us suppose that the young woman is one of the gang oh and let us fancy that while she peered at the pink topaz you remember lausch told us that she excused her nearness by saying that she was very near-sighted that's so well while looking at the gems with her face bent over the case one arm upon the edge and with the voluminous cape outspread what is to prevent her using the other hand and arm to draw a diamond point slowly and heavily along the glass close to the metal by jove what indeed and why may not this act be repeated three or four times say by the same woman slightly changed as to dress as she could have been lausch you recall accosted her yes when dave grew laconic i knew him to be almost convinced you will recall how each of the attendants remembered one or more instances of persons lingering long near the gems or crowding so close as to attract the attention of some of them hm. and lausch distinctly remembered how a good-natured guard came to his aid just as he was about to close his exhibits and stood with his back to the case and his arms carelessly outspread upon the edge chaffing with a group of late sightseers and keeping them from annoying him lausch while he made things secure now i don't say that it was done but i can see how that guard might have played into the hands of the gang who might have been at hand three or four strong observe the cases were high at the inner sides and shallow at the front and while the top sheet of glass for purposes of display was a large one those forming the outer side were small and set into stout bronze squares not to exceed seven inches in depth and ten in length now we will note that the back of the case besides being higher than the front is not of glass but of wood to admit of the use of a mirror for lining and to double the show and glitter of the gems upon my word now let us suppose our guard as standing before the case and directly in front of the diamonds he is facing outward and before him hovering close are some others two or three or more on the other sides of the octagonal pavilion the other assistants are busy closing up lausch in person presides at the small safe in the centre of the place now while he is busy with his eyes averted for a moment a hand thrust under the outstretched arm of the guard may gently press something adhesive against the already cut glass and pull it out and soon when lausch bends down to open the safe or to place some article therein the hand draws out the little tray of gems it was small and could have been concealed under one of those wraps thrown conveniently across the arm now a little ruse to substitute the false gems and replace the glass under the guard's concealing arm and the thing is done if it all happened at the closing hour when the big building was shadowy and one could see clearly only a short distance when every exhibitor was occupied with his own and visitors for the most part were intent upon reaching the nearest exit it was bound to succeed of course this is all theory but it's the explanation of that theft or i'm a sinner cried dave jumping up and beginning to pace the floor nervously carl old man i'll never chaff your bump of imagination after today i'm ready to begin work on just that theory steady steady dave all right sir at least we can make a beginning we can find that guard how take his description from lausch find out who was detailed here i put up my hand and he stopped staring dave there is not a columbian guard on the force who would or could have played that part if it was played it was simply one of the band wearing a guard's uniform my friend sat down opposite me and for some time not a word passed between us then he took up his notebook and drawing a small table toward us said let's go over the ground slowly and see if there is anything here to corroborate your theory or to point to any other conclusion and now i knew that dave was fixed so far as his opinions were concerned and that while he might declare himself convinced by my wisdom 
he had been all the time simply establishing his own convictions and that he was now ready for earnest work it was some time before we came out from the superintendent's little inner sanctum but we were now quite ready to begin our campaign and when we were given carte blanche as to methods and were promised as many men as we might need for the work we could ask for nothing more or better our first demand was peremptory there must be no publicity no word of the robbery must reach the vigilant reporters who were everywhere in search of news next we caused an accurate description of greenback bob to be sent to all the gates and different districts with orders for an instant report of the fact should he be seen and that once seen he must be constantly shadowed before we left the place we had arranged with lausch to put a man of our own choosing into the pavilion whose business it would be to keep constant watch over his people for while he was ready to vouch for their honesty we were not rather we were not willing to let any possibility of a clue escape us a second man was placed where he could cultivate these people and as much as possible outside of business hours not that we expected much from this for we had seen no slightest sign of dishonesty among these people who seemed to shun all society and to have no acquaintances outside their own pavilion after considering long we decided not to bring the name of delbras into the case or to attempt to set any watch upon him in the regular way to locate delbras should be our own especial work and to freshen our memories we reviewed the information furnished our chief by the french commissaire so far as was known there was no picture of him extant and the french report described him about as follows nationality french age probably about thirty to thirty three years height six feet or nearly weight one hundred and seventy five pounds approximate figure good square shoulders military air features regular thin-lipped chin sharply pointed wears at times heavy beard at others moustache and goatee eyes dark called black hair same heavy and sometimes worn quite long hands well kept with long slender fingers speaks english perfectly accomplished etc a small triangular scar upon temple close to roots of hair known to have been in paris and london in early winter and to have crossed to new york about january the first returned to paris some time in march and crossed last to new york in early may by steamer normandy well had been dave's comment as we re-peruse this summary of monsieur delbras he may disguise himself in many ways but he can't change his height very much nor the colour of his eyes nor his regular features dave's features were not strictly regular and it was a weakness of his always to resent this descriptive phrase nor his slim fingers nor the scar on his temple close to the roots of the hair we had spent a long morning in the rooms of the secret service bureau and as we were about to take leave with but a step between us and the outer door it was hastily opened and a guard entered followed by two people whom i recognized as farmer and mrs camp with a backward step and a quick glance at dave i turned and deliberately seated myself the only occupants of the outer office at the moment of their entry were the officer in command who had just accompanied us from the inner office and the subordinate who was in charge of this outer office where complaints were received and first hearings granted i had drawn back quickly but the eye of mrs camp was still keen though she looked a trifle subdued the good land she ejaculated catching at her husband's arm here's one of em now camp they've caught him anyhow the words furnished dave with a clue to the situation and he dropped into a chair beside me and after one droll look in my direction gave himself up to a fit of silent mirth meantime the guard had advanced with dignity and announced to the officer at the desk this man has a complaint to bring sir wait it was mrs camp standing determinedly near the door of entrance who spoke afore you make a complaint adam camp about a rascal that ain't here s'pose you just make sure that this here one that is here in our midst don't get away end of chapter five
Chapter Six of Against Odds by Lawrence L. Lynch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Six A Criminal Hunt. Now, I had told the officer in command my belief and suspicions concerning the counterfeit business, which I believed was going on about us, and had been told that two of the counterfeit bills had already been brought to his notice and captured within the week and dave had insisted upon his hearing the story of my absurd arrest by the guards and now it only needed a look from me and the sight of dave's convulsed face to make the situation plain to him he stepped forward but before he could speak a new thought had darted into dame camp's active mind la she finished i suppose come to think he's been brought here now to be tried ain't he with the shadow of a smile upon his face the officer turned toward the farmer what is your complaint he asked courteously and he shot me a glance which i knew meant let him tell his own story and now being authorized to speak farmer camp began to tell in his own homely way the story of the greenback swindle as he termed it when he had reached the point in the narrative where i made my unlucky attempt to rout the swindlers he turned toward me I've had an idea since though my wife didn't agree with me much here came an audible sniff from mrs Camp that this here young man might a meant well after all and we was a little mite hasty But you see he'd been a looking at us so long and my wife had been a noticing it Having her mind kind of sort like on confidence people and such That she felt kind of uneasy at his sharp looks They were so keen she said and so quick to look away she got nervous and said she felt as if he was a looking right into my pockets there now camp you needn't be a excusing me i stick to my id any one can see that the young feller ain't innocent else somebody had a spoken for him fast off here dave exploded audibly and the officer checked her with a motion of his hand let me settle this point at once by telling you madam that the gentleman you have accused is an officer high in his profession and sent here to protect the public and look after criminals he had but just arrived and it was because of this that he was without his officer's badge which would at once have put those men to rout had it been worn and displayed to them let me tell you now to prevent further mistakes that the detectives upon whom we rely in greatest emergencies are always to be found in citizens clothes and they are not likely to display a badge except when necessary Long before the end of this speech consternation was written all over the face of Adam camp But his wife was made of sterner stuff and when her better half had stuttered and floundered half through a sufficiently humble apology Directed of course toward myself She broke in upon his effort no whit abashed There camp it's easy enough to see how we came to make such a mistake And I'm sure the young man will bear no malice toward a couple of folks old enough to be his parents Twas them sharp looking eyes that set me to notice in you when you was a looking over camp first off Down to the administration building and when you went and sat down on the settee by him and then got up and followed us So fur what was I to think you was a watching us sure enough only you meant well by it But land sakes in such a place where everybody is trying to look out for number one I did what looked my duty. I'm willing to ask your pardon though, and I ain't going to bear no malice Overwhelmed by this magnanimity I murmured my thanks and complete satisfaction with her amende honorable And tried to turn the occasion to such profit as might be by questioning the man a little You were saying that you changed a bill or were about to do so did the man make any difficulty after I left you? No, sir He seemed in a kind of a hurry and made out to be uncertain whether that he could spare so much small money as he called it but finally he counted out a roll of bills and made me count them after him There in the crowd where you stood Well, no, he took us to one side a little right in behind the place where the little man was a selling canes Sort of up against the partition and there we made the dicker And he left you right away queried the officer in charge. Yes, just about as quick as he could and the other I asked the man who took you to this agent the man with the large Sabbath school class 
oh he asked us to go to the terminus station with him and see his young men but my wife wanted to see things and we just went as far as the door out of politeness and when did you discover that you had been swindled well mariah wanted to ride in one of them coopy things with a man boss behind and before and when she got ready to get out which was pretty soon i give one of them fellers a two dollar souvenir bill and they made a great jabbering about it and mariah said says she i guess they ain't got the change so i fished out some pennies and a dime and two postage stamps and after a bit they tuck em and waddled off then we got to looking up and down and we didn't have no more occasion to use money mariah was so busy seeing the folks and, and their clothes till we got hungry and then come the rumpus when i come to pay the bill they was a regular howl and we come mighty near being marched off to the calaboose same's you was they said the bill i offered em first off and all the rest was counterfeit until now brainerd had taken no part in the dialogue but now with a quick glance in my direction he asked will you describe the man who gave you the money the supposed agent camp pondered well he began he was tall as much as six foot i should say and his eyes were black and big his hair was considerable long and he had a good deal of it on his face in a big bushy moustache he had a slim nose and he wore a big diamond on his little finger did you notice his hands mm, no well i did interposed his wife i seen the diamond if twas a diamond his hands was white real big long side of his face and they looked like regular claws such long fingers and pointed nails ah dave shot me a glance full of meaning now mrs camp you seem a very observing woman will you describe the other man the gentleman with the sabbath school class the woman's head became even more erect and her look more firm and confident than before yes she said at once i can she cast her eyes about her and seeing a vacant chair near her interlocutor the one lately vacated by myself she seated herself deliberately and began he wasn't much to look at about as big as you may be and about the same complected as that gentleman pointing to the sergeant at the desk only his nose was longer and sort of big and knobby at the end and a little red i remember he had bigger ears than common too they sort of set straight out his eyes were little and a sort of watery grey and his hair was kind of thin and sandy like he had some little mutton chop whiskers and a little hair almost tan colour on his upper lip his mouth was quite big and i noticed he had two front teeth with gold filling into them he had gloves on his hands when we see him first but when we met him afterward they was off afterward you say did you meet him after you had discovered that you had been swindled i broke in yes we you see broke in adam camp it was this way we was coming out of midway for we'd been out almost to the end of a sea in the sights and when we got hungry we went to a place a blue coat said was good the vienne cafe he called it well it was there we had the fuss about the money and they told us to come here right away and make a complaint we started and was just coming past that menagerie place when Mariah wanted to stop just afore the place and look at the big lion over the door a live one interpolated Mariah. yes a live one well standing there all to once i see that sunday school feller come out of the door a picking his teeth he was right in front of me and at first he seemed not to see me and was hurrying off dreadful fast but i caught on to his arm and says quick like look here i want to tell you something for your own good and to swap favors then he sort of slowed up and asked me to pardon him he was in haste and getting awful anxious about them boys then i says right out my friend i'm anxious too and you've got cause to be you and me's been swindled and then he most jumped and asked how swindled have you broke one of them two dollar bills yet says i no says he and then I up and told him the whole story did you tell him you were coming here i asked as he paused a moment no because he got so excited and talked so fast i declare he put it all out of my head again he stopped as if loath to continue 
but again mrs camp took up the parable now father you may just as well out with it you see this chap flew all to pieces so to speak and he was going to have an officer right away he had a letter of introduction from his minister to home to the captain of the columbine police they was related somehow and he would just have them men arrested and then he happened to think that was getting late and time almost for that train with them sunday school children to come and it put him out awfully but he said that he'd make it his business to see to that and then he made appointment with camp to meet him at half past ten today and they go together to see the columbine policeman she paused and uttered a cackling laugh well she concluded camp see that was getting pretty late so he agreed to it and i didn't say nothing but after he gone to meet them boys again i put my foot down to come here fast and not to wait till maybe the feller get away and finally camp reckoned would be best and so we came some way that feller sort of went agin me towards the last i don't want to be hasty again but i sort of feel as if he might be kind of tricky as well as the rest it did not take us long to convince the camps that they had been duped all round and while we had little faith in their ever seeing the sunday school feller again we obtained the promise to keep their appointment with him and here dave brainerd suddenly muttered an excuse to the two officers and said in my ear if i am not back in fifteen minutes meet me at the administration at four sharp and with a nod to the camps he went hastily out i felt very sure of his errand he had fancied like myself that smug fearing lest the camps might prove too clever for his wiles perhaps suspecting the keen-eyed old woman had followed them in order to assure himself whether it would be safe to keep his latest appointment with them and this indeed proved to be the case before the camps left the place we had easily convinced them that their sunday school friend and not i had been the confidence man and that if he kept his last appointment with them it would only be to lure them into another trap and a worse one for it would have for its aim the suppression of any and all evidence they might have been inclined to give to the police in convincing the gentle old man and shattering his face in my friend's smug i could see that we had dealt his simple kindly nature a real blow but mother camp was of sterner stuff you needn't worry about me not now she assured me with a vigorous nod after getting into one trap i ain't going to tumble into any more and i ain't going to let him neither not when i'm on hand i've told that man more times than i've got fingers and toes that he was too soft-hearted always feeding tramps and stray dogs and swallowing all the beggars yarns i guess you needn't worry maria the old man said with a faint show of spirit things might have been worse i didn't aim to squander a hundred dollars to one lick but i've gotten enough left yet to see the fair and get home on so i guess we may as well be a seeing it a body he's to live live and learn and with this sentiment the pair took their departure a little the wiser and more wary perhaps for the words of warning and advice given them by the officer in charge who had taken their names and address and made a memorandum of their complaint he had smiled slightly when told their street and number and had remarked that at least stony island avenue had the merit of nearness adding the friendly caution don't make boarding-house acquaintances good people and keep on the bright side of the way in going home late whereupon i made a mental note to investigate this same hardly named avenue long before the end of the fair i had cause to thank myself for this mental note and that it was held in remembrance brainerd did not appear at the stipulated time and i was too eager to be out in full sight of that wonder city to remain at the bureau so taking the intramural railway at the nearest station i began to circle in and out among those marvels of genius skill and nineteenth-century enterprise which combined had placed in a time so short as to seem a miracle this city of beauty beside the blue lake michigan and now i began to ask myself why the visitor who had nothing to do but to see this wonder of wonders and had no need to keep one eye upon the passing faces did not see it at least until it grew familiar from that point of view from a seat in an intramural 
what a kaleidoscopic panorama in taking my place i had not even noticed the direction in which i was moving i had been seeing such a marvel of glimpses domes roofs the lagoon in the distance a flashing glimpse of the lake through glittering airy turrets trees statues flags beauty and charm everywhere i had taken a round trip ticket and i whirled on and on until somehow i saw the great glass dome of the horticultural building and a moment later a fleeting view of midway recalled to my mind my own personality and interests as i gazed at it stretching away westward a veritable joseph's coat of a street it was gone and i saw the tall dome of illinois the art gallery in the distance with the lagoon again gleaming through trees to be lost again while roofs windows vistas of streets surrounded me and i could peep in at the windows we were passing and then i heard the cry of the guard and noted the name as we slacked speed at mount vernon station almost upon the roof of the old virginia building i peered out as we drew up to this station in the air and drew back a little as a second train moving in the opposite direction dashed by i am in the rear car and as we move away from mount vernon suddenly i had a vision of someone who must have flung himself from the forward car at the last moment and who was running along the platform and in the direction of the passing train in breathless haste his head bare his hat clutched in his swinging hand it was dave brainerd and as we tear around the curve and he is lost to my sight i am brought back to thoughts of business dave has evidently struck a trail wondering much i stop at the north loop and standing with the government building to my right and the fisheries with its curving colonnades on my left i gaze off upon the blue and shining waters of the lake and realize fully for the first time the awful incongruity between all this stateliness and beauty and our mission in its midst a criminal hunt End of chapter 6chapter seven of against dodds by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter seven it was greenback bob our chief had arranged for us and in advance of our arrival that our letters should be received at the bureau where a desk was always at our disposal and a little before four o'clock I dropped in once more to look for letters and ask if Dave had made a second appearance The letters were in waiting for both of us, but there was no news of Dave and Stowing the letters in my pocket. I sought once more the court of honor seating myself near the great McMoney's fountain in the shade of the administration building where Dave could not fail to find me to read my letters and wait for him I was in no great haste with that magnificent court spread out before me and the blue dancing wave of lake michigan in the distance nature's background for the great peristyle surmounted by that novel and beautiful columbus quadriga in itself a work of art such as is seldom seen and with golden justice dominant and serene commanding and overlooking all forgetting my letters i let my eyes wander slowly from point to point of beauty letting the moments pass unheeded fine figure of a woman eh i started and came suddenly down to earth at the sound of one of my friend's characteristic speeches he was standing beside me as imperturbable of countenance as usual but looking somewhat blown and he dropped upon the bench and stretched his legs and pulled off his hat like a weary man who means to enjoy a little well-earned rest I knew him too well to display any curiosity and I merely sorted out from the bundle of letters still unopened in my hand those bearing his name and laid them upon his knee and with merely a nod and a smile by way of greeting addressed myself to my own the first was a brief business document the next a schoolboy's letter short of course from a young brother my sole living tie and charge the third was from our chief and i saw upon opening it that it was addressed within to both of us dave 
I ventured. May I interrupt? You can't, he replied. I've done. They're of no consequence. And he thrust the two missives I had given him into his loose side pocket. Blaze away, boy. The letter was not long, and, after some minor instructions and some suggestions, came this passage. I wonder if either of you remembers the case of the Englishman who wrote us at much length some six months ago concerning his son, lost or missing. We did not succeed in finding him in New York. A small wonder, chuckled Dave, whose memory was a storehouse. We hadn't even the skeleton of a description. In New York, you remember, I read on, and it has seemed to me that you may as well look out for him in your intervals of leisure, if there are such. Old man's growing sarcastic, grumbled my friend. It's a good thing, if successful, I continued, and the fair is the best place in the world for a hideout. If the young fellow's above ground, I'll wager something he's in Chicago now. That is, if he really did come to America a year ago, as his fond father, bracket, interrogatory, close bracket, writes. I enclose for your further information his letter, and I would be proud of the fact if you two fellows could unearth him at the Columbian City. I give you carte blanche for the case. Hm! That means roll up your sleeves and go in. I took up the copy of the Englishman's letter. Shall I read it? I ask, or is it? Don't say engraven on your memory, implored Dave. Yes, go ahead. Dundalk House, January the 3rd, 1893. Messrs gentlemen on november sixth in the year eighteen ninety two carol l ray esq of dundalk house left his home ostensibly for a few days in london he was never seen again at dundalk and we have been accurately informed that he sailed for america in that same month being of age he drew from his bankers while in london one thousand pounds a full amount deposited to his credit since that time no trace of him has been found carol l ray is twenty-six years of age and tall lacking one half inch of being six feet in height he is slender broad-shouldered upright fair skin blue eyes brown hair features regular and refined hair worn very short but inclined to curl close to skull strong in athletic sports a graduate of queen's college has small aristocratic feet and hands a skilled horseman sings a fine and unusually high tenor has a singularly strong control over all animals we have no portrait of him since childhood has strong leaning toward military life and somewhat literary tendencies and prepared to send blank check for the payment of expenses of thorough search and add as reward when found two thousand pounds address all correspondence to sir hugo ray dundalk house egham surrey Oof! broke out brainerd when i read the last word typical old english paterfamilias tyrannical i'll be bound i'll bet something the young fellow ran away from parental tyranny how did the thing come out at the first attempt i don't seem to recall it and for a very good reason you were in canada and i was occupied with that rockville murder i think they put sturgis on the case english himself you know yes well well as nearly as i remember sturgis advertised to begin something to his advantage etc of course contemptuously this failed and he made the tour of the hotels swell places first then going down in the scale hunted the registers haunted the places most affected by the english tourist halted good-looking or english-looking blonde young men until they turned on him in fact tried all the dodges and failed of course it's one thing to find a person who has been hidden and quite another to search for one who hides himself what do you think has set the chief to looking this lost son up here and through us why you know his ways he seldom stops to explain but i fancy he may have heard again from sir hugo ray i took up the two sheets and was about to thrust them into their envelope when brainerd suddenly said 
hold on boy there's something written across the back of that copied letter i turned it over and read the half dozen lines written thereon carol ray if found is to be told at once that his brother sir hugo is dead oh ejaculated brainerd so it's not his father well that alters things we may be able to find a sir carol ray especially as he must have about exhausted that thousand pounds if he has been doing the states in true english style at any rate i added it's on our books i suppose one may keep an eye out for a swell young englishman here as well as elsewhere it's only one more face in the crowd and that reminds me said my friend this business almost put it out of my head i took a turn on that intramural road this afternoon yes i knew better than to interrupt at this point and i saw i am sure i saw whom do you think dave that's like a woman i'm surprised at you you saw delbra wrong i saw i'm certain of it greenback bob good he was dressed very swell you might have mistaken him for one of the board of directors but it was bob and you piped him home of course i queried of course i didn't he was going one way and, and i the other each on an intramural car oh and you were running to stop the car and bob when i saw you at mount vernon station i said wickedly did you overtake it i did just and bob eagerly well with a grin i'm sorry to disappoint you but when i jumped on board at the last moment i found that bob had got off while i got on in fact i saw him going downstairs as i was borne away to fifty seventh street there boy don't look so mournful it's all in the game i couldn't find a trace of him but we know he's here i had decided on the night of my arrival after pondering late the adventure of the black bag or as i now described it to myself miss jenry's bag upon my course of action concerning it in her letter to her friend she had mentioned the entrance at fifty seventh street as being near their place of abode and i had promised myself that i would be early at that gate to watch for the coming of miss jenrys and to restore her property what else i had not counted upon a diamond robbery at the very beginning of my world's fair's adventures and as i wished to go unaccompanied i did not attempt to stand guard at evening but the second morning saw me at an early hour alone and so near the gate at fifty seventh street that i could in no possible way miss the lady should she appear i had not needed to avoid dave he had been prompt to tell me that he meant to put in the day looking for greenback bob and that he should do his looking upon midway and why midway i had asked him because if there's a place that is better than all other places in which to hide oneself that place is midway It was quite true and as I made my way toward the northern entrance I turned over in my mind an idea suggested or revived by Dave's last words As I passed toward the entrance between the unique little house of South Dakota on one side and hospitable and homelike Nebraska State building on the other my gaze was caught by the restfulness and charm of the western façade of the latter with its broad portico and the little lawn lying between the broad steps facing the western boundary of the grounds the little stream flowing under overhanging trees of nature's own planting and past the little natural arbor of climbing vines draping themselves among the branches making shade and coolness for the groups loitering underneath upon the rustic seats scattered freely and inviting all while i gazed a voice close behind me said in a wheedling drawl do you come in we never saw such a place why upstairs beats this all out of sight such parlours with velvet chairs and sofies and a piano i tell you nebraska beats some of them stuck-up eastern states I turned to see a fat rosy-faced and eager woman in the defiant bonnet I have learned to know as from out west Piloting a lean and reluctant woman quite as typical as a rural New Englander Through the gate of the enclosure and prompted doubtless by the words I had just heard I took another and more extended survey of the building 
so justly extolled this time lifting my eyes to the upper window and the balcony overhanging the stream was it a mere passing resemblance or a fancied one or was the face i saw for just an instant at one of those upper windows the face of the little brunette adventuress who had laid claim to miss jenrys's bag if so she had been scanning the increasing crowd through an opera glass and had dropped this in seeming haste and vanished before i could prolong my glance it's hardly likely i said to myself and turned toward the bridge spanning the little stream and lying between me and the entrance i sought as i stepped upon the bridge i saw on the other side just coming out from the shadow of the elevated tracks above the entrance the lithe form and rare blonde face not to be mistaken anywhere with its fine clear contour its dark eyes and fine healthful pallor she came forward leisurely and stopped by the railing at the edge of the platform to look down at the white hooded laplander who constantly paddled up and down in the little stream between the bridge and the lapland village behind the enclosure a few rods to the north just then there was a cry from beyond the gates followed by the rat tat tat of a drum and one of those perpetually arriving processions came filing down the platform and across the bridge i was in no haste to accost miss jenrys at the very entrance and possibly in the face of one or more of my ever-present brethren of the watchful eye and so while she waited unhurried upon one side of the bridge i stopped also looking down upon the little stream and feigning interest in the white-robed canoeist paddling and doubtless perspiring in the mild june air the procession was not a long one and was formed of boys half grown and wholly effervescent wearing what was evidently an extemporized uniform and carrying a banner which informed me that it was a boys school sent from an outlying town through the liberality of an honorable somebody whose name i did not hear for the fact of the sending was not emblazoned upon the red silk banner they carried but was announced often and willingly in reply to numerous queries all along the line they were a healthy and wholesome lot of fellows and while i gazed at them not without a feeling of, of interest in and sympathy with their day's pleasure a little figure flitted past me through the tiniest of spaces between the marching lads and myself pressed close against the rail and i saw again the little brunette hastening toward the platform at the gate wondering a little i kept my post there was the usual rabble of all sorts and conditions swelling the ranks in the rear and when these had crowded across the bridge there was another throng of more leisurely moving visitors but miss jenrys was not in the throng and when they had passed and the stream of travel had somewhat thinned i moved forward only a few steps however for just beyond me advancing slowly with a smile upon her lips and her eyes turned toward a companion came miss jenrys she had entered the grounds alone of that i had been ocularly convinced and that she should find a companion so soon had never entered my thoughts but she had a companion and i almost gnashed my teeth as i saw tripping along at her side the little brunette she was talking volubly in the low quiet manner that i knew and if she saw me in passing she disguised the fact skilfully I waited until they were a few paces ahead and then followed them slowly chewing the cud of bitter reflection Could it be that I was losing my skill in reading and judging faces I Upon whom the men of our force relied for a rapid and usually correct guess at a strange face Was I mistaken in this little brunette then or had I been mistaken in my judgment of Miss Jenrys? No never I had set her down at once for a lady in a sweet old-fashioned meaning of the word womanly refined good and true and had not her letters confirmed this but this dark-haired quick-speaking little person by her side was she after all a friend and had i committed a faux pas in refusing to deliver up the little bag and if so had i the courage to approach these two and commit myself could I tell Miss Jenrys how, failing to think of a better way of finding her, I had read her letters? 
I had meant, of course, to do this, but could I, with those pert, mocking eyes upon me? No, in my heart I knew that it was not that which vexed me. Could I bear the scrutiny of those clear, straightforward brown eyes in that other presence, which would put me at so sore a disadvantage? Then I shook myself and my senses together. After all, she came alone. Might they not separate soon? How could I tell that there was not a friend, several friends perhaps, waiting for that troublesome brunette back in the Nebraska building? They were walking straight down the street toward the lake, with a row of state buildings upon one side and the great spreading art gallery on the other. It was a perfect June morning, and the sight of the blue lake at the end of that splendid promenade, with the fresh breeze blowing off it, was inspiriting. There was to be some state function that day, and the crowd was thickening. Made bold by numbers, I came close behind them. Miss Jenrys had unfurled a big blue umbrella, and the two walked in the shade of it. And in order to screen myself, in part at least, should the brunette, whom I was beginning to detest heartily, turn and look suddenly back, I shook out the closely rolled folds of my own umbrella and poised it carefully between my face and the sun. And now, made bold by my canopy, and frankly bent upon hearing what I could, I drew daringly near, and when they stopped and stood to gaze at the ornate New York State building, I halted also. By no means, I heard the soft voice of the lovely blonde say, as she moved back a pace to look up at the façade, that would be quite too enterprising. I am chaperoned by my aunt, who is not so good a sightseer as myself, and for two days I have ventured. Here the sharp call of some hurrying chair boys drowned her words, and I next heard the brunette's voice. Things do happen so strangely. It was impossible to catch all of her words. Mamma is sick so often, and papa. I do dislike being alone, though, in the art gallery acquaintances that is all i do wish they moved on miss generous increasing her speed perceptibly and seeking it seemed to me to walk a little aloof from her companion which caused me to wonder if she could be expecting or hoping to meet any one i was no longer able to hear their conversation but they again paused and gazed long at the fine colonial building of the state of massachusetts I had hardly looked to see Miss Jenrys enter the placid New York halls, but when she turned away from Massachusetts without entering, or so much as climbing the terrace steps, I wondered. And then, as the pair turned away, and after a moment of seeming hesitation, moved on toward the lake, a man, tall and well-dressed, passed me so closely and at such a rapid pace as to attract my attention to himself. He walked well with a quick, swinging stride, and I think I never saw a man's clothes fit better. His hands were gloved, and in one of them he carried a natty umbrella, using it as a cane. I had not seen his face, for he turned it neither to right nor left, and his splendid disregard for the beauties all about him was explained when I saw him halt beside Miss Jenrys and hold out a hand with the assured air of an old friend. I was near enough to see the smile on her face when she turned to greet him, but the few quick words they exchanged were, of course, unheard. Then I saw her turn toward the brunette on the other side, but that brisk little person had already drawn back, and now she said a word or two, nodded airily, and, turning, went quickly away. A moment later, Miss Jenrys and her companion turned about and went toward the Massachusetts building, and I saw his face. It was dark and handsome, and as they mounted the terrace side by side, I pressed boldly forward under the shadow of my umbrella, and thanking my lucky stars that I had it with me, and that, because it was on the cars that at ten o'clock I was to go to the rendezvous where Farmer Camp was to meet or await Mr. Smug, for he knew him by no other name, I was lightly but sufficiently disguised in a wig slightly sprinkled with grey and long about my neck and ears, and a very respectable-looking short and light set of moustaches and whiskers, the whole finished with a pair of gold-rimmed glasses. 
wearing these i ventured so close that i heard while toiling behind them up the broad old-fashioned stairway a few fragmentary words from the lips of miss generous who seemed replying to some question i cannot indeed the best of reasons my aunt is not here mr voisin mr voisin i fell back and meditated so this was the handsome frenchman the rival of him i did not again attempt to overhear their conversation but i followed them about the building as they moved slowly from room to room and now i did not follow with my eyes upon the graceful and stately movements and lovely profiles and turns of the head of the fair woman moving on before me but i noted carefully every gesture every pose and turn the gait carriage and as correctly as possible the height weight and length of limb of mr maurice voisin of france and i felt that i was doing well when at last they turned from the building which neither had seemed in haste to leave i looked at my watch and knew that i had barely time to reach the southern end of the grounds even aided by the intramural as i came out upon the street once more and was passing hurriedly by the eastern portico of the new york building i chanced to lift my eyes toward it the great curtains between the fluted columns were swaying in the breeze and from between two which she seemed to be trying to hold together with unsteady hands the face of the little brunette dark and frowning looked cautiously out End of chapter six Chapter eight of Against Odds by Lawrence L. Lynch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter eight. Straight from the shoulder. When Farmer Camp had presented himself at the rendezvous after his visit to the bureau, he found Smug awaiting him, but in company with a muscular stranger with whom he represented himself to have important business and after a few leading questions which camp answered quite naively the two excused themselves smug making a second appointment for the following day again the farmer was prompt and this time mrs camp also i did not make my presence known to them and smug did not appear so i left them to digest this clear case of perfidy while they viewed the wonders of the transportation building and the great golden doorway and believing like brainerd that the midway was a mine likely to yield us at least a clue i turned my steps westward my thoughts a singular medley in which the camps miss generous delbra greenback bob the little brunette and monsieur voisin were strangely intermingled and i am obliged to admit it the young fellow who had accosted me upon midway and avowed a knowledge of miss generous was also in my thoughts if it was true that he knew the owner of the black bag why not question him carelessly of course perhaps well perhaps he knew monsieur voisin also i could hardly have given myself a reason for this sudden anxiety but it was there and it sent me straight down midway pleasance as nearly in my former tracks as was possible it was too late for breakfast i assured myself and far too early for luncheon ergo if my friend the guard was still upon his beat i must surely see him sooner or later and so it proved as i emerged from the shadow of the viaduct over which the intramural rattled and rolled i saw him not far ahead and coming toward me his hands clasped behind him his chin strapped down his face absorbed and seemingly oblivious of all about him as he neared the long low cottage opposite the village of the little javanese and having java or home restaurant over its door in big letters and as i was nearing him i saw him suddenly throw up his head and spring forward at the same moment i noted a man hatless coatless and wearing upon his waistcoat the badge which indicated his position as head waiter come running from the direction of the home restaurant pointing as he ran breathlessly toward a man and woman who were walking rather briskly eastward as the guard came opposite this couple i saw him halt just a perceptible instant 
his eye upon the hurrying waiter then he stepped quickly before the coming couple and made a courteous but positive gesture clearly an order to halt the man did not halt but brushed past the polite guard with a scowling face he was a big fellow flashily dressed and with a countenance at once coarse and dissipated and as he made a second forward movement i could distinctly see his hand drop with a significant gesture toward his right hip stop him cried the almost breathless head waiter a beat at the word the woman made a little forward spring and the man made a movement to follow halt commanded the guard at the same time clapping a hand upon the man's shoulder and then it was only the work of a moment there was a quick movement on the man's part and i saw the butt of a big revolver and called out in warning take care i might have saved my breath the tall guard stood moveless until the weapon was actually in sight and then the arm in the blue coat shot out strong swift straight from the shoulder and the pistol arm dropped the weapon fell to the ground and the man staggered back to be received in the unwilling arms of the head waiter to struggle there for a moment and then to submit quite as much to the fire in the young guard's eye as to the strength of his arm the woman at the first sign of struggle had drawn away from her companion slipped into the crowd about them and was making off in haste when i said addressing the waiter must she be stopped the fellow shook his head let her go he said they were dodging their breakfast bill it was the common trick of a common sharper having ordered and eaten a late breakfast they had called for something additional and in the absence of the waiter had left their places near the door and slipped away it was over in a moment the man forced into honesty by strength superior to his own sulkily paid the bill while denying the claim and then like his companion he slipped through the crowd and was soon out of sight meantime my friend the guard with a look of disgust and weariness upon his face had turned away the moment his duty was done and i followed him smiling a little over this reversal of our positions well i said as i reached his side i see there is good reason for your ability to judge a straight from the shoulder knockout blow he turned quickly and with a shade of haughtiness upon his face which was lost in a smile as he recognized me ah he said courteously good morning so you witnessed that pitiful affair it does not fall to my lot to serve ladies he hesitated slightly and then asked did you deliver up your find i laughed and shook my head i had fallen into step with him and we were now moving slowly along his beat if you refer to the lady with the dark eyes who had the poor taste to ignore your presence i said i did not i may have committed a blunder but my judgment condemned the little person he turned toward me a quick look of interest then you thought he stopped and the red blood dyed his face as on that first day i thought i instantly took up the word that she was an adventuress not a companion or friend to the owner of the little bag and you were right he exclaimed the lady who who dropped the bag you found was alone when those foreign brutes with their palaquin ran against her i was not near enough to reach her promptly but i saw and the other the brunette it is a strange fancy perhaps but i have thought that she has been following miss the lady though for what purpose he stopped it is no affair of mine i i am glad that the lady has her property but she has not got her property no pardon me i did not understand he had turned his face to the front but i could see that he was agitated and was holding himself under with a strong hand as i walked beside him and noted his fine physique the well-set head and clear-cut features i felt genuinely attracted toward the manly fellow and wondered what was the secret of his interest in that lovely girl whom he had yet shunned for looking back upon the events of the previous day i could see that he had purposely held aloof from the moment when he saw that a champion and protector was at hand i had thought he said after a little that is i fancied there might be something some clue to her whereabouts in the bag it was not complete i answered 
when i could not overtake her and the brunette did not recommend herself to my confidence i opened the bag after some hesitation yes the syllable was a direct and eager question i found nothing by way of identification save two letters both unsealed and these after some reluctance i opened ah a trifle stiffly the first was from a lady in boston to a lady here at the world's fair indeed a freer tone almost a sigh of relief this gave me so little information that i was obliged to open the second letter which was written i suppose by the owner of the bag and not as yet posted even this did not give me her address how strange we had reached the end of his beat and now i turned with him and we sauntered slowly toward the ferris wheel i felt that he was worthy of a grain of comfort if i were able to give it and i said it was like this the letter from boston was written on the eve of a start for this place the other letter if posted would have passed the lady for whom it was intended upon the road this last letter written supposedly by the owner of the bag states that she having left her new york home some time since is now in the world's fair city in company with an aunt whom she describes as rustic but delightful and that because they are stopping very near the fair she feels safe in coming alone on such days as her aunt elects to pass in the quiet of her own apartment and the only clue to an address is the statement that she enters the grounds by the fifty seventh street gate ah it is a sigh of genuine relief at last he has a clue if a slight one but what does he want of a clue having gotten thus far i relate briefly my experience of the morning omitting description and the name of monsieur voisin whom i describe as a tall dark-haired gentleman evidently a foreigner and then i play my card i am here upon business of an important nature my time is limited i do not know the lady and having committed the folly of holding back first because of the brunette and last well because i had an especial reason for not coming under the notice of this strange man in short had i found the lady alone i should have returned her property in the presence of a third party i did not wish to do so and then i put my question he had said that he knew this young lady and being here day after day he would be likely to see her again she would be sure to revisit the midway and what could be more easy than for him to return her lost property explaining as he chose it would relieve me much it would be to me a genuine favor the guard was silent for a time then he paused in his measured walk and turned to face me if i have not misunderstood he said slowly you set out this morning for the purpose of restoring to the lady her lost property true and do you mean to tell me that because of the presence of this brunette first and then of the man you gave up the idea quite so i confess he said that i cannot understand why those people should be a hindrance nevertheless i am ready to believe that your reason is good and sufficient thank you i trust he hastened to add that you will judge me as generously when i say that i cannot oblige you i know the name of the lady it is true but much as i may desire to serve you i cannot do so my desire to avoid the lady to remain unrecognized by her is as strong as is yours to hold aloof from her escort it's an odd position he added with a slow half smile i trust the contents of miss of the bag were not of too great value not indispensable to her by no means quite the contrary and this being the case we will trouble ourselves no more about it of course i can't urge my request under the circumstances i could not repress a smile at the absurdity of the situation and to say that i don't bear malice as they say in making up a quarrel let us exchange cards i produced my card a simple pasteboard of the size known as the visiting card and with only my name engraved across it the guard drew back a step and again that ready flush dyed his face pardon me you are addressing me as one gentleman to another and if i were to give you the name by which i am known here it would not be my true one 
I will not give you a fictitious name, and I can give no other. I was silent a moment, then. I will not urge you, I said, but at least, as man and man, equals, we can shake hands. And I held out my own. His face cleared instantly, and he promptly placed his palm upon mine. I can do that, he said, as man to man, as an equal, and... He threw back his handsome head. I shall never, I trust, have reason to hesitate before giving my hand as an honest man to an honest man. And now, he paused, and I with him. And now, I supplemented, we are neither of us idlers. This is your beat, for the present. Then I hope we shall meet again. Success to you. And to you. He lifted his hat as I turned away, and looking back a moment after, I saw him once more a Colombian guard on duty, piloting an old woman across the street and away from a sprinkling cart. Handsome enough to be a prince, I thought, an American prince, and poor, doubtless. Honest, I'll wager, and with a mystery. I wonder if the world is pouring all its mysteries into this white city of the world. End of chapter 8chapter nine of against dodds by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter nine in disguise two days had passed since my talk with my friend the guard and although brainerd myself and others had thoroughly searched midway pleasance hoping to obtain a glimpse of our quarry or a hint of their presence we had been unsuccessful we found many things in midway but neither greenback bob nor his friend delbras i tell you dave had said on the previous night when we were discussing our failure and its probable reasons i tell you carl these men began their business in midway i am sure of it and i solemnly believe that you're the fellow that scared them away i indeed how simply by springing upon them in that camp affair I believe they spotted you I felt chapfallen for I was more than half inclined to believe that Dave's notion was the correct one and I wondered that I had not thought of this myself and if they did went on Dave it would be the most natural thing in the world for them to fold up their tents like the Arabs etc don't you think so granting your first premises I conceded grudgingly your second of course are tenable perhaps you have an idea where their tents are now spread oh you always try the sarcastic dodge when you are beaten a bit grinned dave good-humouredly but that's all right i think we may as well give the midway a rest at any rate i suppose you have noted that the woman's building has had more than its share of stealing of late said i mm, no well, you should read the papers and look in at the bureau once a day at least they've had an attack upon the exhibits failed i believe and a number of pockets picked do you suggest the woman's building tomorrow i suggest the vicinity of the court of honor and the administration building it's the princess eulalia's day you remember or had you failed to note that go on boy wound me where i'm weakest scoffed dave but I chose to ignore Dave's chaff. I suggest that we join the crowd early and stay with it late. Done, cried he. It's hard to tell where they will elect to work. There will be a thinning out inside the buildings, but a crowd outside, and such a crowd as this will be, all with necks craned and attention fixed, ladies in gay attire, the cream of the city's visitors as well as the other side, and there will be at least half a dozen false cries of there she comes and somebody's pocket will suffer at each cry right you are agreed dave it'll be a swell crowd and it's my opinion that our men will be in the thick of it early the next morning i went to see if anything had been reported concerning the diamond robbery for as yet little had been accomplished there was one of the attendants a young woman whom i had felt uncertain about she was pretty and i thought artful and vain and i had learned from another employee of the lausch pavilion 
that she had formed the acquaintance of a rather flashily dressed person wearing much jewellery and that just before the robbery she had been seen to receive two or three slyly delivered billets doux the girl was being closely watched and one of the guards who was stationed near and who was said to have been seen loitering near the pavilion oftener and longer than was needful was likewise under close surveillance but this morning there was something to report it did not come through any of the men at work upon the case nor was it in the nature of a discovery it was an anonymous letter and it came through the united states mail having been posted in chicago at the uptown post office it was addressed to whom it may concern at the bureau and was brief and to the point if you do not want to waste time the letter began turn your attention to the men in charge of the robbed jewelry exhibit and if you also keep an eye upon a certain uptown man who keeps a place advertised as a jewelry store and with rather a shady reputation a man not above doing a little business in uncut gems say in a very quiet way you may find some of the lost gems between the two there was no signature and i saw at a glance that the writing was carefully disguised i was not inclined to treat this document seriously though i could see that it had created quite a sensation at the office and when asked my opinion concerning it i said if this letter means anything but to mislead it can mean but one of two things either it is written by one of the thieves to draw us away from the right track or it is written by someone who belongs to a gang and who means if possible and safe to sell out his comrades for all he can get and a promise of safety i've seen this done before and what is your opinion i'm more than half inclined to think it is a hoax as how it may be the work of a crank or a practical joker i replied and i thought it possible though hardly probable if we had advertised this thing said the officer slowly i should think little of this letter but it has not been made public it is known i reminded him to some three hundred men here in the grounds and it has been told to how many sellers of jewellery up in the city not to mention their employees half a dozen picked men have been detailed to work upon the case I don't think it likely but some officer who covets a bit of special work might have thought it worth while to muddle the job for us or some revengeful clerk uptown may be trying to get even with some enemy however the thing can't be ignored and my advice would be trace the letter to its author if possible there were no letters for us that morning and i left the place soon certain that the machinery of the bureau was quite equal to the task of looking after the anonymous letter which after all did not occupy a large place in my mind since my talk with my mysterious guard i had made next day another effort to see miss jenrys i had waited at the gate at fifty seventh street for three long and precious morning hours and then i had turned away anathematizing myself and vowing that hereafter i would attend to my own legitimate business and not prowl about after an evasive beauty who no doubt had already purchased a new bag and forgotten her loss but in my heart i knew it was not to restore the bag alone that i so earnestly looked for miss jenrys i had not fallen in love not at all but yet somehow i had a singular anxiety to see again the face of this sweet blonde and to hear her mellow musical voice if only in the two words thank you even as i turned away after my long and fruitless waiting i did not promise myself to forget her nor altogether to quit the chase i hypocritically said now i will trust a little to chance how dave would have laughed could he have known my thoughts by nine o'clock that morning there were thousands of people thronging the court of honor drifting out and in under the arches of the administration building and up and down upon the streets on either side of it everywhere there was a look of expectancy and no apparent desire to move on as the morning advanced and the active guards began to stretch ropes at either side of the entrance through which the procession would pass the throng drew together from various directions and massed themselves as many of them could drawing close to the rope outside 
some of the narrow comfortless looking red chairs seating themselves with the great rope actually resting upon their knees to be hemmed in and pressed upon at once by row after row of crowding pushing humanity while others swarmed boldly between the ropes and filled the smooth gravelled space reserved for the honoured guests and the city magnates attendant upon them it was a good-humoured crowd but it held its place until from the entrance of the building a line of guards in full uniform came slowly out while from the east a second company came forward two by two and these spreading into a line single file and facing about united with the others in forming an l and thus slowly quietly but none the less surely they advanced while just as slowly and almost as composedly the crowd fell back and outward until the roped in space was cleared only to partially fill and to be again cleared once and again Brainerd and I separated upon reaching the place and I had not seen him since although I had moved about from point to point almost ceaselessly as eleven o'clock approached the crowd began to grow restless and questions to be bandied about from one to another while guards as ignorant for the most part as their questioners were interviewed endlessly when is she coming is she coming soon are you sure she will come here is it eleven o'clock etc it was eleven o'clock when i drew out from the throng that had pressed within the ropes only to be slowly driven out again and passed through an aisle of fans and parasols which had been opened and kept open the width of three men shoulder to shoulder by a constant passing of its length and i was skirting one side of the building slowly and with my eyes searching the crowd of faces when i heard a familiar voice near me speaking in impatient tones law pa it's no use i ain't a-going to set on that tuttlin thing one minute longer not for all the infanties in america what more's a farin infanty than a home-born one anyhow there was a stir next the rope and a break in the wall of humanity about it and then mrs camp emerged her bonnet very much awry and her husband bringing up the rear puffing and worried with a little red chair hanging from one shoulder and the faded umbrella clutched in one hand they saw me at the same moment wow began the lady i'm glad i ain't the only simpleton in the world if here you ain't i can't get over thinking what a ridiculous thing it is for half of america almost to turn out just to see a baby that's brought across from where columbus used to live just as if a spanish baby was a going to enjoy such a crowd as this one thing's certain i ain't going to wait if the poor little creature is half as tired as i be it'll want a nap first thing come on pa a shout of laughter drowned her last words and after explaining to mr camp that i was looking for a friend i got away from the absurd old woman who with her husband at her heels was marching toward the lake where there was enough water maybe to make a ripple and where one wouldn't get stepped on if one happened to tumble down as i found myself upon the outskirts of the crowd someone set up a cry of there she comes and there was a movement toward the west end of the administration building two or three carriages had drawn up inside the roped-in space and several smiling gentlemen with boutonnieres upon their immaculate coats stood in waiting near i turned the corner to the north where the crowd was less dense and had begun to deliberate upon the wisdom of moving on when straight across my path half running and evidently in pursuit of someone i saw the little brunette i had made a quick step in pursuit when a gloved hand was thrust out before me stand back was the order there was a rush from the south end a sudden prancing of hoofs upon the gravel and a carriage drawn by four fine bay horses came into view around the corner of the mines building here she comes is again the cry i am pressed back against the wall and close beside me the soft rolling carriage is drawn up a gentleman alights and waving aside the obsequious footman assists the lady to descend in a moment they are gone swallowed up by the big arched entrance and a murmur runs through the crowd if not the infanty they have seen one as fair and as gracious the first lady of the white city the able and beloved president of the woman's board 
when she has passed within i replace my uplifted hat and seek an egress through the crowd past the restive four in hand and down the street which leads to wooded island in pursuit of the little brunette who had vanished in that direction and now there seemed a breaking up of the crowd strains of music could be heard in the distance and rumours of an approaching parade are rife wooded island at the south end seems quite alive with moving forms and i saunter over the first bridge cross the tiny island of the hunter's camp and australian squatter's hut cross a second picturesque bridge and begin to examine the faces moving about the flower bordered paths thronging the rhododendron exhibit and resting upon the scattered benches i pass some time in this way and have turned my face toward the mainland once more when a burst of music near at hand draws my eyes to the opposite bank where between the west facade of the great manufacturers building and the lagoon the wild riders led by buffalo bill prince of showmen are defiling past with their fine horses curvetting and restless under their gorgeous trappings and the weight of their fantastic and variously costumed riders their banners are fluttering and their weapons glisten in the breeze and the sunshine there is a grand rush toward the two bridges and as i hasten on with the rest i catch a glimpse one more as she comes down a side path of the elusive brunette she is close in the wake of two women who are running hand in hand and i hasten to place myself as near her as possible but discreetly in the rear and now from the opposite side of the lagoon we hear another burst of music and a cry the princess the princess we cross the first bridge and dash upon the next which being high and arched in the centre is at once filled with spectators while the more venturesome hurry over and line the banks of the lagoon and the sides of the two opposite roads by which from the east and west the two cavalcades will approach that of the wild west coming from the east filing past the north end of the electricity building and turning opposite the bridge to file southward straight down from our coin of vantage to the entrance of the administration building opposite us i had followed the brunette closely and when she arrived at the end of the bridge where the head of the wild west column was just turning southward the crowd upon the sloping south end was dense and some hardy spirits were scaling the five-foot pedestals of the great deer upon either side upon these pedestals straight-sided and square there was standing room at the top as some wag observed and i pressed forward meaning to mount with the aid of the iron handrail as i reached the pedestal on the left near which the brunette had halted beside the two women before mentioned and who i began to think were in her company the wag at the top bent down and put out an inviting hand help you up ladies good view up here and nobody to make us get down in this crowd it's quite easy just step on that rail one of the two women stepped forward put out her hand paused measured the distance with her eye put a foot upon the rail and uttered a little squeak oh i can't po possibly without a word the little brunette at least six inches shorter stepped forward put out her hand set one foot upon the rail and went to the top of the big block with an agility that was amazing in a woman as for me i had been quite near her and it almost took away my breath i kept my eyes upon her like one fascinated until the beautiful princess preceded by the white plume hussars and escorted by the mayor and city council came from the west and passed us so close that her charming face aglow with smiles and bright looks of interest was distinctly seen and roundly cheered we watched her drive slowly down the avenue formed by open ranks of her escort and then the crowd was ready to follow her and surround the administration building watching wondering an american throng attendant upon and admiring not royalty alone but royalty beauty and gracious womanhood combined in one charming whole when the cheer which announced the infanta's descent from her carriage had died away i turned to see what my brunette safely bestowed upon her pedestal would elect to do next i was soon enlightened for she turned at the first movement of the crowd about her 
and seating herself upon the edge of the pedestal dropped lightly to the ground and walked briskly away i followed of course determined not to be easily left behind again and as i went my mind was occupied with an entirely new thought i had made a discovery and it might be an important one i had found that the brunette like myself was in disguise End of chapter 9chapter 10 of against odds by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter 10 carl masters when brainerd and i compared notes that night we came to the mutual conclusion that the camps were ordained to mingle their destiny with ours in some measure we chanced upon them so often and they seemed since our encounter at the bureau to take it for granted that we were to continue the acquaintance now set in their opinion upon an official basis and that it would be a mutual pleasure after leaving me or rather after i had separated myself from them at the administration building they had wandered down the grand plaza and made their way to the peristyle where after some time they had encountered brainerd and in the course of their amiable converse they had given him some valuable information or so he thought it you see he said to begin at the beginning i had mingled all the morning with crowds here and there and as it was nearing noon i wandered across the plaza and came to that handsome bridge spanning the canal at the northwest corner of the liberal arts as i crossed this bridge i saw a launch slip out from the landing at the further end and in that launch two men one of whom i was sure was greenback bob and the other from your description i'll wager was your friend smug are you sure i demanded morally certain yes well as you may guess i scurried across the little bridge and jumped into the next launch for they were not easy to follow by the land route with always the chance that they might go ashore on the wrong side of the lagoon well I kept them in sight until we had made the round of the basin and they made no offer to land although the launch filled and emptied before we were back at the bridge from which they started as we passed under the bridge my heart was in my mouth for the boat was out of sight for some seconds but when we shot out into the sunlight there they were not far ahead of us and about to run underneath the bridge at the end of the south canal I wondered a little at their going away from the crowd just then but that was their affair so i just shifted my position in order to keep a better watch upon their boat as we came abreast of the bridge and then as the mischief would have it a launch coming from the other way pushed through and under the bridge and struck us such a blow that the women screamed and one of them let her parasol fall into the water then of course there was an exchange of compliments between the two crews and a scramble and delay in securing the parasol and when at last we were out on the other side the boat ahead was so far away from the landing where she had of course made her stop that i could just make out that the two men had left her and she was almost empty to add to my agony two boats had passed us while we floundered after that parasol and exchanged compliments with the other boat and as we lay there waiting i looked wildly about me and saw at last on the bridge almost over my head my two men standing close by the railing and talking with a little dark woman who describe her i broke in well now was she something under five feet yes dark eyes and hair exact a broad black hat with plumes a red veil and a four-in-hand tie upon my word she had em all i knew it but go on i can't not very far at least i just kept myself from swearing while i sat and saw those three so sociable up there and i not in it before i got to the landing i had seen the woman trip away toward the plaza precisely everybody seemed to be going that way it was almost time for the infanta to appear when i set foot on shore i made for that bridge 
i had seen them start slowly on after the woman but when i got upon the bridge i could just see the hat of your friend smug in a jam some distance ahead near the electricity building and bob the eel had vanished once more at what time was this he named the time and then i told him how i had encountered the little brunette lost her and found her again and of her agile leap at the bridge lively girl dave commented i had told him the story of her agility with some emprossement but he did not seem to see my drift you're sure it's the same who tried to claim the young woman's bag quite sure from your description hm mine and she's the one who met the lady at the gate and left her when the man appeared the same hm she tries to secure the young lady's bag she meets her as though by appointment and she meets our quarry too she seems to know them all query does she by any chance know well say you who is she what is she who she is i don't know what she is i can tell you said i well she as we have called her is a man i had nothing to add to this and dave was not willing to accept my statement based as it was upon that leap at the bridge no woman ever made that jump i knew it it showed practice and that not of the sort that is taken by women this had been my argument and after some discussion and difference of opinions dave got back to the camps he had met them wandering about the peristyle and gazing across the grand basin at the splendid mcmonnie's fountain which ought mrs camp had declared to sail out leastwise the boat with that white woman setting up there on top and come across to salute that big gold goddess for my part she added i've seen one thing that was as it ought to be they took and set a woman up in the midst of their court and made her bigger and brighter and handsomer than anything else but if they was bent on calling her justice why she opined that their court ought to be called a court of justice the two old people had evidently grown lonely and sated with grandeur and when she had aired her views concerning the golden goddess mrs camp began to talk about our adventure with the counterfeiters that friend of yours was right she said that sunday school chap didn't come to time and we ain't seen him since not to speak of and then she related how on coming away from their rooms on stony island avenue that morning they had seen just across the street from them the man smug in earnest conversation with a tall man whose back was turned toward them and who after a few words had turned and walked away southward while smug had entered a cafe close at hand doubtless to breakfast dave had questioned them closely hoping to learn more but beyond the facts as first stated little was added the men had met at a point a few squares from the camp's boarding-house possibly four or five the man in conversation with smug was tall and very straight sort of stiff like and well dressed they were quite sure also that he was dark and that he wore a beard incidentally they gave dave the number of their stony island residence we shan't have much trouble to find the camps dave said in concluding his narration the old lady has taken a great fancy for this liberal arts building and she generally spent her time sitting upon a chair in the centre of columbia avenue and admiring at her leisure she says she'd rather see things in the lump sort of and i believe they take a walk every morning around the plaza the court the peristyle and then up the lake shore from victoria house which she won't enter because she hates old england and all the englishers to the point where fifty-seventh street drops into lake michigan and every afternoon i verily believe they walk arm in arm up and down the length of midway without stopping or entering anywhere in our summing up we found we had accomplished very little legitimate business we had established the fact that greenback bob was at the fair and the presumption was strong amounting almost to a certainty that delbras was also there we had connected the man smug with one if not both for dave was sure that the man's companion on stony island avenue was delbras and now this brunette whom i believe to be a man in woman's attire 
seemed to be identifying herself or himself with the gang if you can prove that the brunette's a man or boy said dave then i'll say don't look farther for a third party who came with delbras from france and if that should prove the case tell me what designs have this gang upon miss what do you call her i started it was dave who was growing imaginative now and yet i had only thought of the brunette as having seen the bag fall and hoping for a find i said doubtfully then how did you account for her being at the entrance gate two days after queried dave scornfully supposing it to have been an accidental meeting i fancied she might have thought of telling miss jenrys what she knew of her loss hoping for a reward perhaps carl you are growing stupid you have thought too much of the blonde and not enough of the brunette think in the first instance both are alone miss j drops her bag why does this particular well say woman for the present why does this woman see it she must have been some paces behind or you would have seen her or if not you the guard or even the young lady herself that brunette was shadowing miss j i was silent before his arguments i began to think i had been one-sided in my thoughts of the two and now how simple it all seemed the girl you say was watching the gate through a glass and from a protected and safe point of view she rushes to meet the young lady perhaps introduces herself perhaps is known and she leaves her when the good-looking man appears carl what use do you intend to make of that black bag hitherto i replied it has been a side issue now it seems to me that we may serve both its owner and ourselves by restoring the bag and keeping an eye upon all concerned the next day i was early at the fifty seventh street gate and i waited long but no miss jenrys came through and after loitering near until almost noon i took a light luncheon at the nearest point possible and at noon went back to my post but if miss jenrys entered the grounds that day it was through some other entrance on the next morning she came at an early hour her fair face radiant as the june weather and beside her was a small-faced little woman who might have been forty years or sixty except for her snowy hair time seemed to have forgotten her her dress was a near approach to the quaker garb of the followers of penn everything about her was of softest gray but the face framed in the prim quaker bonnet was as fair as an infant's and with a child's soft colouring in the cheeks that had not yet lost the charming curves of young womanhood she looked like a creature whom life had loved so well that time had not been permitted to touch or tarry near her so gentle and sweet and good but there was no weakness in the placid fair face nor in the smooth even step neither swift nor slow with which she moved on beside the fair young woman at her side i had watched for this arrival while i sauntered about now on one side of the bridge now on the other and vibrating between the buildings of nebraska and south dakota on either side of the broad promenade beginning at the bridge the west windows of both these hospitable houses overlooked the little stream proffering a welcome to the visitor at the very outset and when the two ladies crossed the arching bridge on the side nearest the nebraska building i was not surprised to see them halt look for a moment upon the shady bit of greensward with the inviting rustic seats beneath the vine-draped trees close to the water's edge and then enter i was very near them meaning this time to make a prompt and bold approach and as i turned to enter i heard the elder say no june my child thee must let me go my way she halted and laid her hand upon the girl's arm i must take these beauties in slowly else they will not take lodgment in my memory besides this place is too tempting they moved on towards the shaded seats and i took from my pocket a map of the grounds and standing on the lowest step of the portico affected to study it while the talk went on thee can go through this house while i look at the place and the people child and hear the music 
where is that music oh auntie that horrid eskimo band they've never happened to be in tune before when we came in fortunately fie june i'm sure it's very good now go you know i care little for fine things but if there is anything that you think i shall like to see you may show it to me when you have seen your fill and i mine there go child i am going to knit the quakeress took out her knitting and her niece uttering a soft laugh and giving the shoulder of the other an affectionate pat turned away saying over her shoulder you're a wilful auntie and you shall have your way i'll not be long so look and listen your fill this was the chance for which i had waited and i took advantage of it by closing my map and following her into the building and up the stairs i did not accost her at once but waited until she had looked about the larger room facing the south and west where the case of minerals the great deer and other western treasures and trophies were displayed and had sauntered about the cosy and tasteful parlours looking at the pictures and bits of decorative work and when she had re-entered the big sunny south room again and after a little more loitering among the exhibits went to one of the windows and stood looking down into the street i who had been standing near an opposite window was about to cross the room and accost her when a sudden shout from the street caused me to look out once more my window faced the bridge and i saw that a chair boy coming too hastily over the bridge with his freight and perhaps unaccustomed to his wheeled steed had let slip his hold upon the handle at the back of the chair just as he had reached the downward slope of the bridge and chair and occupant a burly man looking quite able to walk went whirling down the slope charging into a couple of young men dressed in killing style and wearing big yellow boutonnieres and overturning itself and all concerned they were gathering themselves up in much disorder and i could not resist a smile at the ludicrous scene but the smile soon left my face when i saw passing the scene of distress with rapid steps and without a glance toward it and coming straight toward the entrance below the little brunette with rapid steps i crossed to the opposite window and taking off my hat bowed before the surprised and now somewhat haughty looking blonde miss jenrys i said interrogatively she bowed assent may i speak with you a moment she did not answer promptly and i put my hand to my pocket and drew out my card the same that i had proffered to the guard a few days before she took it and read the name aloud in a tone of polite inquiry carl masters end of chapter 10chapter 11 of against dodds by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter 11 i dislike a mystery i had not meant to do it but while i stood there with her clear brown eyes not repellent but fearless and full of dignity fixed upon my face in polite but guarded inquiry the determination suddenly seized me to be as frank and truthful in dealing with this frank and truthful woman as i had a right to be i had meant to return the bag ask her pardon for tampering with its contents and say no more only keeping as much as possible an eye to her welfare and safety if i saw it menaced now i meant something more and so while she held my card in daintily gloved fingers and looked at me with level questioning eyes i said with the thought of the approaching brunette underlying my words miss jenrys i am the person who was of some small assistance a few days ago when you came near incurring serious injury at the hands of a pair of turks and a sedan chair i saw a look of remembrance if not of recognition flash into her face and i hurried on i do not mention this as entitling me to your notice but i ask you to accept my word as that of one having no personal motive save the desire to serve you and to listen to me for a few moments she was scanning my face nervously and now she said 
i do not recall your face though i remember the circumstance to which you refer if you are the gentleman who held back that reckless foreigner with a strong arm and so saved me from something more serious than a little pain in the shoulder i am certainly your debtor and i am glad of this opportunity to thank you a little back of the place where she stood in a corner hemmed in on one side by a long glass case of exhibits of various sorts was an armchair placed there doubtless for the ease of the person in charge of said case and its contents there was no such person present however at that hour and i pointed toward the chair and said if you will kindly take that seat so that i may not feel that i am compelling you to stand i will not detain you long she turned toward the seat looked at it at me and finally beyond me and across the room as if debating and half inclined to pass me and escape and then i saw a sudden withdrawal of the eyes and a compression of the lips slight but perceptible she turned as if in haste almost and seated herself in the chair first turning it toward the windows so that her back would be toward the interior of the room and then to my surprise she beckoned me with a half smile to a place upon the window seat which would narrowly serve this purpose i had not once looked back or about me but i did not flatter myself that my words alone had won for me this graciousness she had seen the little brunette and desired to avoid her thank you i said when we were both seated i will now come to the point at once you must know then that after you had passed on and out of sight in the crowd i discovered at my very feet so close that no one had ventured to pick it up if any one had seen it in that crowd a black leather bag a chatelaine i think you ladies call it oh you found my bag the look of reserve was lost in a quick and charming smile i am very glad i found it and i tried to follow you and restore it but you had disappeared i had indeed in at the first gate which happened to be the javanese village that explains my failure i had given up my search and was about to go on my way when i was approached by a young lady a small person with dark eyes and wearing a large plumed sailor hat who explained that she was a friend to the lady whose bag i had in my hand that she had seen me pick it up and would now restore it to her and you gave it to her was it not right the person was an impostor is it possible and yet two days after as you were entering the grounds and i was about to approach you I saw this same person greet you seemingly and walk on in your company it made a coward of me I dared not approach in the face of a friend of yours whom I had treated as an impostor How do you mean? I mean that I doubted the person and refused to give her the bag and I hurriedly made confession Telling her how at last I was forced to read her friend's letter and then her own in order to learn her name and that then her address was still a mystery i had but one chance of finding you i concluded you had informed your friend that your apartments were conveniently near the fifty-seventh street entrance oh indeed i had seen the quick colour flash into her face at my mention of the letters and of having read them and the restraint was once more evident in face and voice when she said i thank you sir but the contents of the bag it was hardly worth the trouble you have taken to restore it that is i have it with me miss jenrys and when i am sure that we are not under surveillance i will place it in your hands and now i owe it to myself to make my own conduct in this affair and my present position clearer at first it was with me a simple matter of returning a lost article to a lady failing to overtake you i might perhaps have turned it over to some guard but for the interference of the brunette who at once put me on the defensive and aroused my suspicion it somehow seemed to me that the young person was more than commonly anxious to possess your bag and then it occurred to me that the bag might contain something or some information that she especially wished to possess my interest was aroused and then i took the liberty of examining your bag and having done so 
i determined at least to attempt to return it to you and to ask you to pardon the liberty i had taken with your correspondence i suppose any one would have done the same she said rather coldly what i do not comprehend is why you did not return the bag to me in the presence of this person of whom you might have warned me it is that which i am about to explain i replied gravely and i must for the sake of others whose interests i represent ask you to regard what i am now about to tell you as a confidence made necessary because of the circumstances miss jenrys the card in your hand bears my real name but few know me by it because i so often bear others as one of the necessities of my profession i am known here to those who know me at all as one of those secret service men you have no doubt heard or read of in other words a detective she bent forward and scanned my face narrowly when i saw you in company with the little brunette as i have since called her for want of a better title i was at first amazed and inclined to doubt my own sagacity but when i am making a clean breast of it miss jenrys when i followed you doubtful what course to pursue i saw you joined by a gentleman and i saw the brunette slip away from you as she would hardly have done as you would hardly have allowed her to do had she been friend or acquaintance i am enrolled here as a special but i came in company with another with a definite object in view within these grounds are several persons under suspicion and whom we are hoping to capture and convict and when i tell you that only yesterday i learned that this same little brunette who claimed your property and friendship was seen in company with two suspected persons you will hardly wonder that what i had attempted to do from purest courtesy from one stranger to another and that other a lady i felt impelled to do from a sense of duty as well as desire to save one whom i had seen to be alone and who might for aught i could tell be menaced by some unsuspected danger there was no fear on her face only a slightly troubled look as she asked what do you mean simply that it is my duty to warn you and to ask you if you know of any reason why you should be followed or watched or menaced by any manner of danger no she slowly shook her fair head no reason whatever and may i ask you about this person this brunette i would not say this woman she started slightly and leaned toward me is she here still she whispered i turned my head and cast a deliberate glance around the room i do not see her i said but she may be below with an eye on the staircase it's more than likely it's little i can tell you she said she ran up to me that morning at the gate her face beaming and her hand held out and when she was close to me and i drew away from her she began the most profuse apologies she was very near-sighted and she had mistaken me for an old acquaintance she had not seen for some time then she kept on by my side prattling about her mamma who had not been able to leave the hotel since they came of her dread of being alone and her eagerness to see the fair she had hoped when she saw me that she had found someone who would let her just follow along so that she would not feel so much alone etc i did not like her volubility yet i could see no way short of absolute rudeness of shaking her off when i met a new york acquaintance down near the lake shore she quite surprised me by quietly slipping away do you think she paused and arose with a quick easy grace which seemed inherent will you come down and be introduced to my aunt she asked i have great confidence in her judgment of gentlemen and she ought to know this that is if you can give me the time my time is entirely yours i declared recklessly and nothing would give me more pleasure than to pay my entirely sincere respects to that lovely woman i saw in your company and who i am almost certain saw me playing the spy upon her niece she smiled as she moved toward the stairway at the head of which she turned and paused a moment do you think she will approach us she asked i can't imagine what she will do but she will see you and 
I think the smile on my face stopped her She did not recognize me I said she may not She looked into my face keenly and then a quick look of intelligence flashed into her eyes Oh It was all she said, but it meant much She took a step downward and turned again Of course I must not enlighten my aunt if you are willing to let it lie between us two at first Certainly she said gravely and went on down the stairs At the landing halfway down where the staircase turned to right and left I saw over her shoulder a little dark figure standing in the west doorway Turn to the right I said over her shoulder the longest way round you know She nodded and without a glance in the other direction went down the east side Turned at the foot to wait for me with the air of one quite absorbed in an agreeable companion and Went out at the door facing the Minnesota building and the morning Sun as We stepped outside I paused in my turn One word if you will allow it I may have to learn more of this person It may make difficulties for me and who knows perhaps for you if she imagines that you know her for what she is or guesses as she might what you are she interposed you may trust me we turned at the corner and came once more to the west side and the little arbor as we rounded the corner my companion suddenly slipped her little hand beneath my elbow giving it at the same time a significant little pressure the brunette having doubtless watched our progress through the window was coming down the steps and straight toward us for just a passing moment I knew how Miss Jenrys looked to the friends who knew her and whom she knew best She was smiling and preoccupied as we stepped within the enclosure See she said hastening her own steps and mine with a bright look toward the benches. There is auntie The little brunette was almost abreast of us and my companion's smiling gaze was still fixed upon the figure under the vines then she turned her head and just at the place where we could turn from the walk Let her eyes turn toward the figure just opposite us It was charmingly done Just as she made a step in the direction of the arbor her eyes fell quite naturally upon the face of the brunette Good morning. She said smilingly and with a little nod of her head But there was no slackening of her steps with the words on her lips. We were off the walk and across the grass to the place not ten paces away where the sweet-faced Quakeress sat knitting and looking her surprise Auntie I have brought you a new acquaintance Miss Jenrys said in a voice slightly raised and then Looking after the retreating figure of the brunette and seeing that she was quite out of hearing she added and I have found my bag I took the bag from my pocket where it had grown to seem a quite familiar bulk and laid it in her lap and She began at once to narrate to the wandering Quakeress the adventures of the little bag She heard it through and here and there a soft little exclamation of wonder and I saw that she was slightly deaf and Quite given to misunderstanding and miscalling words and phrases Thee has been very lucky my dear the good soul said when Miss Jenrys had done and the young man has been at great pains to restore thy reticule it was hardly worth so much trouble do you think not in actual value perhaps auntie but it contained one or two little keepsakes that i valued she breathed a little fluttering sigh for the sake of the giver is that why thee has mourned the loss of the little bag so much and said so many unkind things about those poor benighted men of turkey then indeed I must add my thanks to thine and she turned and extended to me a soft slim hand ungloved and delicately veined and Then she began to question me about the fair and the things I had seen Showing in her questions and comments a singular mixture of innocent unworldliness a native shrewdness and mother wit in the midst of our talk miss Jenrys broke in with a low quick exclamation which caused us to cease and turn toward her Mr. Masters she said in a low tone our friend the brunette is looking over from the gallery windows of the Dakota building See the one next the corner toward the bridge 
she does not make herself needlessly conspicuous and it was only by the peculiar shade her figure threw as she stood at one side the eastern side that i was drawn to observe her my eyes are very strong i am sure i am not mistaken it is only what i expected i replied she will wait no doubt until she gets an opportunity to speak with you evidently she has some object in view something to learn from you or something to tell you i would give something to know what it is she looked at me a moment with thoughtful eyes i had purposely spoken in a guarded tone and when she answered it was in the same manner would it help you to learn her object it might and it might give us a hint as to their reasons for following you their reasons do you think she stopped abruptly i don't know what to think miss jenrys it looked as if this person were following you on the day you lost your bag and i am convinced that she is in some way connected with two or more men who are more than suspected of being offenders against the law miss jenrys do you know of any reason why you should be watched followed have you an enemy are you in anyone's way instead of answering she turned to the elder lady who had been listening like one who but half comprehends auntie you heard me say that mr masters has strong reasons for thinking that the young woman who just passed us and who has forced herself upon my notice and tried to claim my bag is loitering about now for the purpose of speaking to me i heard thee yes june surely i did and i cannot understand the thing at all nor do we aunt anne she turned to me again i am getting the fever for investigation she said slightly smiling i am not alarmed at what you have told me but i do not doubt it and if you think it best if it will help you i will give that young woman a chance to ease her mind to me i will leave you here with aunt anne and go under her eyes to the building next to this on to the washington house and give her a chance to follow i waited for the elder lady to speak and my own surprise was great at her brave proposition for it was brave braver than she knew and i was asking myself if i had the right to let her go to meet an adventurous at the least a criminal possibly but her aunt gave the decisive word my dear june thee knows i do not like a mystery if anything is to be learned concerning this person's strange conduct we should find it out and end the following and spying else it will not be safe for thee to come here alone even by day fie aunt anne with all these guards and half the world looking on then i had better go mr masters if you will have you any advice or instructions to give me i think you will know how to proceed only it might be well to let her talk if she will certainly and miss jenrys let me beg of you do not go away from this immediate vicinity and do not walk upon the streets with this person if it can be avoided above all do not make a further appointment with her i will be discreet good-bye for a short time aunt anne she dropped the newly returned bag into her aunt's lap and went away as lithe and careless seeming as the veriest pleasure-seeker she looked up and down at the windows of the south dakota house and then walked deliberately in end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of Against Odds by Lawrence L. Lynch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Twelve More Dangerous Than Hate. When we had watched her vanish within the walls of the opposite building, Miss Ross, for Aunt Anne was a spinster, deliberately arose and took the place beside me we can talk better so she said placidly and i want to talk with thee and she began to roll up her knitting with care as we sat there i was almost hidden from view from the street because of the thick vine tendrils that fell like a curtain between me and the passers-by 
while it did not prevent my looking through the green drapery at my pleasure but aunt anne had placed herself where she was plainly visible to all who passed now she began having put away her knitting i ask thee honestly sir does thee think my niece in real danger of any sort i cannot understand this strangeness truly miss ross i answered i know no more than you have heard but i could do no less than warn the young lady knowing what i did she bent toward me and scrutinized my face closely keenly thy face is a good face she said then and i like thy voice but young man i am only a woman and i have no right to do rashly my niece trusts thee but she is but a girl with all her self-reliance forgive an old woman's caution and tell me what is thy reason for the interest thee takes in my niece cannot thee give me some credential some voucher for thy good faith before i say to thee what i wish to say again i found myself forced to a sudden decision in my experience as a detective i had found myself in many strange situations but never before had i felt that i must speak the truth or not at all in a position like this i answered with scarce a moment's hesitation you are right and wise madam and i am sure that i can confide to you the truth concerning my business at the fair only asking because others are concerned with myself that you regard my information as confidential surely she said quietly thee may trust a friend we are not given to overmuch speaking of course thee has my promise then i may tell you that my business here is to watch for and guard against just such people as this person this brunette seems to be i am a member of the secret service bureau we were alone in the little arbour and i showed her first my badge sewn inside my coat and then my photographic pass i thank thee and may i ask now does my niece know this i should have found extreme difficulty in gaining her ear or her confidence otherwise i answered ah i felt sure i know the child so well that somehow she had found a reason for her faith in you there is no prouder or more womanly girl living than my niece june jenrys and now tell me frankly what does thee fear or anticipate for her if i knew your niece miss ross her friends her foes her history i might venture an opinion as it is cannot you help me she pondered a little then tell me again she said all about the bag and this woman now i wanted to learn one or two things from this interview and i realized that our time was short so i rehearsed the story again and quite fully but as briefly as possible when i had finished the clear-headed quakeress was thoughtful again then she said i don't like this not in the least and i feel that thee has been right i fear my girl is in some way in danger will you advise me she asked with sudden energy to the best of my ability willingly and then i risked a first repulse if i might ask you to tell me something of your niece her position your plans of course my niece there is an orphan and an heiress oh she gave me a quick glance and went on her home has been in new york city with an aunt formerly her guardian june is now of age and her own mistress of late she has been with me in my little home less than one hundred miles from this city she came of her own accord and was most welcome and we came here together a little more than a week ago june declaring that she meant to stay all summer and i nothing loath she stopped and smiled this is all very barren she said i think thee will have to question me then i think we must be brief first are you stopping near the grounds very near on washington avenue little more than two blocks away and she mentioned the number is it a boarding-house uh, pardon me what i wish to know is if you have made any acquaintances there if any one has learned for instance that you are ladies of independent fortune meaning to make a long stay and consequently likely to have with you more or less money 
Ah, I was sure thee could get on. We are in a private house, found for us by the Public Comfort Bureau, and we have taken their only suite. There are no others. And the family? Just the two, man and wife, and a servant. It's a cottage, but very cosy. Has your niece an enemy? An enemy? Oh, I trust not. I do trust not. I can't think so. Still, June is a society girl. I know little of that side of her life. Then do you know if she has a friend who is, or may be, a fortune hunter, one whom you distrust? I saw the quick colour flush her sweet face and leave it pale again, and again for a moment she seemed to hesitate. I don't quite like to say it, she began then, but since we have been here I have seen such a person who, I think, would be a suitor for my niece if she would permit it. I am not versed in the world's ways, but I have seldom found myself deceived in my judgment of man or woman, so I ought not to boast it. But of this man I think three things. He is madly in love with my niece, and his sort of love is not the true sort. It is not lasting, and it is more dangerous than hate. He is a foreigner with the soft, insincere ways that i cannot like or trust he has a strong will and a cruel eye and he likes me not at all mind thee i do not accuse him only he is the one person we have met here and spoken with except thyself and she broke off and shook her head do you think the question did not fall from my lips but she interpreted it thee means does she care for him i do not think it she is courteous to him nothing more out of his sight i do not think she gives him a thought but he is here and she is young i am poor company for a young girl i wish all young girls could enjoy such society as yours miss ross do you think this business has disturbed miss jenrys disturbed june jenrys has not one drop of coward blood in her veins I have thought, since she has been with me, I am almost certain indeed, that something has saddened my girl just a little. She seems quieter than she used, and is almost listless at times, which is not like her. Sometimes she seems quite herself, and that is a very bright self. Then at times she is quite preoccupied. I think this affair has aroused her interest, perhaps. Ah! She was facing the street and the little quietly uttered syllable caused me to look through the leaves in the same direction miss jenrys was approaching on the opposite side in the shadow of the dakota building and with her walking slowly and talking volubly was the little brunette i was watching her narrowly and as the two crossed to the side nearest us i saw her start stop suddenly and turn toward her companion as she thus stood her back was toward the bridge and a glance in that direction showed me a tall, well-dressed man, who carried a bunch of long-stemmed La France roses, and whose brisk steps brought him in a moment face to face with Miss Jenrys. There was a brief pantomime of greeting between the newcomer and Miss Jenrys, and then she turned toward the brunette, and there was a short exchange of words. Then the man lifted his hat, the brunette bowed and turned away going toward the entrance while miss jenrys and her companion whom i had recognized as monsieur voisin came toward us he was not aware of my presence i know until he had passed the point where the arbor opened opposite the west door of the nebraska house but he acknowledged miss jenrys's introduction with a perfect bow and an amiable speech intended for my companion as well as for myself he had taken the liberty of calling at their cottage he informed us to ask if he might not serve them as escort but had been told they were already at the grounds he considered himself very fortunate to have met them at the very gate as it were and then he presented the roses to miss jenrys she received them with a smile and a word of praise for their beauty and then in that charming way a clever woman has when she chooses to employ it she made him aware that his kindly offer of escort service must be declined since with a nod in my direction they were already provided with an escort i took my cue at once 
and after a few more words, addressed to each in turn, and a short exchange of courtesies between him and myself, Monsieur Voisin lifted his hat, saying that since he was so much a laggard as to have lost some charming companions, he would endeavour to recover his lost time by travelling to the convent of La Rabida via the intramural railway, and so, smiling and bowing, he went back over the bridge to the station above the entrance. When he had gone, Miss Jenrys turned to me. I must ask your pardon for that little implied fib, Mr. Masters, and, Auntie, don't look too much shocked. I could not allow Mr. Masters to lose his time, which is no doubt of value, or to go away, perhaps, before he had heard my experience. And then, before the elder lady could utter her gentle reproof, or I could reply to her speech, she began to tell her story. I thought, she began, that I would take the shortest way to my object, so I went in, as you saw, to view South Dakota. It was so small that I was soon upstairs, walking around the little gallery under the dome. Of course I came upon our friend the brunette almost at once, and greeted her so amiably that she joined my promenade without hesitation. Of course you don't care to know all that we said. I let her take the initiative only keeping an amiable and fairly interested countenance and following her lead. She began by telling me how she happened to meet me again. She had entered early and had passed the time looking at some of the state buildings in order to be near the entrance, where her mamma had partly promised to meet her in an hour or so. She did not want to miss her mamma, and so had loitered after a little time spent in some of the buildings opposite in these two houses where she could overlook the entrance and the bridge it was not nice to be alone so much and her mamma did not like her to be alone for she could not bear to lose the fare any of it did i like going about alone they were stopping at a hotel quite near did i like a hotel etc in short one of her objectives i am sure was to learn how long we mean to stay here in chicago and another who were in the house with us, if it were large, and if there were other rooms to let. One moment, I broke in, did she ask for your street or number, or both, and how did you reply to her? My answers were politely vague. She did not ask for our address, and I thought it rather strange. She knows that there are several people at our house, but no room for more, and that our stay depends upon circumstances but she had one important request to make and she made it very adroitly seeing that i like herself was alone at least sometimes she had wondered if it were possible if i would not like to see the grounds by night her mamma did not care to come out after six o'clock and feared the lake breezes and she did so long to explore the grounds at night would it be possible would i be willing to accompany her when i had no better companion of course for an hour or so some evening soon to see the grounds and buildings illuminated her mamma had told her she might ask provided of course she was sure which of course she was that i was quite nice and proper as for herself she was quite prepared with her cards and references she stopped here and challenged my opinion with a piquant questioning look my child ejaculated aunt anne he did not accept was that all i asked it was quite enough she replied quite gravely now she gave me a card with a written address upon it and i told her i would let her know tomorrow morning by mail junie must not go she turned to me without replying to her aunt's exclamation what do you think of it she asked calmly but quite earnestly now in contrast to her light manner of telling her story I think you have done well, both in going to meet this person and in your manner of meeting her modest request. But I think it has gone far enough. You think, then, that there is a plot, something serious? I can see no other explanation. And now, Miss Jenrys, before another word is said, will you promise me not to allow this person to approach or address you again? She looked at me in some surprise. You think her so dangerous? she questioned yes you have used the right word 
Again she watched my face intently, but she did not give the asked for promise, and her aunt broke in anxiously. Mr. Masters, does thee think we would be safer and wiser if we went away quickly and quietly? Auntie, exclaimed the young lady, how can you? I thought you were braver. Don't speak of going away. I will not hear of it. I am willing to be advised within reason, but I would rather risk something than go away from this beautiful place before I have seen all of its wonders, or as many as I can. I am not afraid, and I will not run away. You do not advise such extreme precautionary measures, Mr. Masters, surely? Not since I have heard your wishes so strongly expressed. No, Miss Ross, I think there is no need of going away. Now that you are warned and will use caution, but, Miss Jenrys, you will be cautious about going out alone, and especially at evening. You should have an escort, a protector. One might as well be a prisoner at once as be compelled to remain indoors on these lovely nights, said the girl rebelliously. Auntie, I will carry my little revolver. Oh, in answer to my glance of too plain inquiry, I can shoot very well. I shall feel much safer without it, my child, said Aunt Anne uneasily. Mr. Masters, is there not some way, these guards in uniform, or are there not guides who could be employed in the evening, that is? Auntie, dear, I have a better thought still. The chairs, we can secure two reliable men for them. We do our sightseeing by night in comfort and safety in that way. She turned a smiling face toward me. Don't you think that a simple and sensible arrangement? I do. That is, if you will permit me to choose the men who are to guide the chairs and see that they understand their duty. Why, to be sure. Mr. Masters, we are very stupid, Auntie and I. If you could... She hesitated and glanced from her aunt's face to mine. June, child, I think I know what is in thy mind. I know the nature of this young man's business in this place, and you are right. If he can spare the time, it is right that we should know, if possible, what we have to guard against, to fear or avoid. Is it thy pleasure, sir, to undertake this for us? I turned silently toward Miss Jenrys. Aunt Anne is right, she said with decision. Can you take this matter in hand? I will take it in hand, I replied. But tell me just what you wish. Do you simply want insured protection against annoyance, or do you want this brunette followed up until we learn why she has singled you out for her peculiar attentions? I have heard it said, Miss Jenrys replied, that the detective fever is contagious, and I feel now as if I must have this little mystery unravelled. I dare say it will end in something stupid and commonplace. Still, let us unravel it if possible what say you aunt anne i have already told thee that i detest mysteries yes we must know what it means i know you shall i declared if it rests within my power the sun was fast travelling toward the zenith and i had promised dave a rendezvous at noon it was not difficult to impress upon these two clever women the need for perfect secrecy and that no one must guess at the truth concerning myself. I had observed that Monsieur Voisin addressed me as Mr. Masses, and that Miss Jenrys had spoken my name in performing the introductions very indistinctly, and before I left she spoke of them. Perhaps you noticed the mistake of Monsieur Voisin in addressing you, she said. It occurred to me, just as I was about to speak your name, that I might be making a blunder, so I mumbled your name, and was glad to hear you call him by another. Your tact was a kindness. Let me remain Mr. Masses to him and to anyone I may chance to meet in your company. I may be obliged to call upon you, and should we meet, Monsieur Voisin and I, it will be best that he knows me for a visitor like himself. When we parted, it was with a very thorough understanding and I went toward my meeting place, wondering what new thing would turn up in this city of surprises, and what Dave would think of all this. I had determined to put a shadow upon the heels of the brunette, 
when she should appear to get the note from Miss Jenrys, which was to be couched in diplomatic language, and take the form of an indefinite postponement rather than a refusal. When Dave and I met, I gave him, as usual, ample time to say things of no moment first, in his usual manner. But I did not mention my own affair of the morning, leaving this to be told later and at a time of more leisure, for Dave and I had no secrets from each other when we were together. And this was the part of wisdom, as well as for friendship's sake. I knew always just how his work stood, and should disaster or delay overtake him, I knew just how to report or to go on with his work, as he with mine. When he joined me, I saw at once that he was more than usually animated, and, contrary to his usual custom, he came straight to the business upon his mind. Old man, I have seen Delbra. End of chapter 12《Face to Face with Delbra》You have found Delbra? I echoed. This was news indeed, and I waited eagerly for further information. Yes, sir, I'm sure of it. I don't doubt it and it was in Midway Pleasance. Go on, Dave. Well, it's a short story. I have been lounging around the big wheel for some time. That monster has a sort of fascination for me. It makes me feel like a small boy, unable to gape enough. I was looking at the people coming and going, and I almost forgot that it was noon, until I heard someone say close beside me, Almost noon, Jack. Let's get out of this. That startled me. I had not thought it was so late, and I took a look at old Sol and started on. I was walking pretty brisk, and all at once I came up behind a couple that made me start. One of them was Greenback Bob, past doubt, and the other was, or so I first thought, an Arab, dressed in American trousers and a coat, and wearing a fez. But when I came closer and looked him well over, I was sure it was Delbra. There were all the points, everything, and I followed them, feeling as pleased as if I had them already in bracelets. And then, just as I was wondering where they were going, they brought up in a crowd before one of those Turkish theatres. The hustler was hustling in his last crowd before dinner, and when the two pushed their way to the ticket booth, I kept close behind them. Well, sir, they were close by the place, but they bought no tickets, that I'll swear. Nevertheless, before I could take in the situation, they were walking past the man at the entrance and into the show, and I made all haste to buy a ticket and follow them. Of course, I felt sure that I was following, for I had seen them pass through the inner door, but when I got inside and began to look around me, they were not there, neither of them. I looked through the audience, it was a very thin one, made my way down to the stage to look for the door by which they had escaped me, and I did some mental profanity that'll be forgiven me, I know, and then I gave it up and went outside to reconnoitre the old barrack. On one side its windows overlooked a lane open straight from the street, and there was a small door in the rear corner while in the other a door that must have opened behind the scenes inside gave upon a sort of court-like quarters where a lot of fellows were lounging and a few cooking at an open fire i made this discovery through a crack in the high fence in the rear and i prowled about until i assured myself that my gentlemen were not there i suppose i had hung about that rear enclosure some twenty minutes or perhaps more when i suddenly bethought me of the other Turkish booth and the big bazaar and I came around to take a final look at the front and then move on When I reached the front one of the dancing girls was posturing before the entrance and a new voice was calling to the crowd to Come and see and admire the only original etc And sir there upon the upper step exhorting the public was Delbra himself 
the clever rascal i exclaimed you may well say so well sir it did not take me long to do my thinking it was almost noon a quarter to twelve in fact and i said to myself this fellow is playing turk and he has turned showman he has just relieved the other fellow and will be likely to be here all the afternoon i couldn't have stayed there if i would without being spotted for the moment i got myself a little nearer to him he spied me and began a pantomime of roping me in hand over fist with an imaginary cable he would have known my face if i had tried to keep near enough to be safe in case of a sudden move so i took the chance of keeping my appointment with you getting up a different mug and hurrying back and you expect to find him there i hope to find him there it would never have done to have stayed he would have spotted me at once the fellow is a long remove from a fool carl what do you think of this deal what in your opinion is their little game precisely the same that you and i will play in their places what could a man ask better if he wants to dodge arrest or evade surveillance than such a chance as midway affords him all he needs is a pull with some of these orientals and they are here for the most part for the bakshish besides you remember delbra is said to have crossed at the time many of these fellows were coming over and he had plenty of chance to make himself solid on the way or even before they crossed the water who knows how much fine work he has done among these turks syrians algerians egyptians japs and so on jove you are right enough and then delbra has just the face and figure to disguise well as a turk for instance dave made a wry face or as an arab and even bob could manage to transform himself into a passable algerian your discovery of this morning dave simply means that for this moment in addition to the task of watching all the european faces in search of our men we shall have the added perplexity of peering under the hoods turbans fezes etc of all midway dave's face was very grave and he was silent for some moments the very fact he finally resumed of finding delbra in a turk's fez and playing the jay for one of their theatres shows that you're right carl well getting up suddenly and catching his hat from off the floor we didn't exactly come here to play and as for disguises why we've played at that game ourselves we took a hasty and somewhat meagre lunch at the nearest stand and prepared for an afternoon upon the plaisance but i saw clearly that some other way must be devised to entrap our quarry that given the open sesame of the temples and pagodas the booths and pavilions the villages with their ins and outs and our tricky and elusive trio would have an advantage against which it would be difficult to contend and in this i was right we found delbra or the man we believed to be delbra still occupying the lecturer's place at the entrance to the theatre he was disguised to the extent of a pair of black whiskers and some slightly smoked gold-rimmed nose-glasses just as he had been in the morning and he did not labor continuously instead he exchanged often with a second person who took up the strain of flowery superlatives at about every other half hour during which relief the disguised delbra gave some portion of his time to the box office and making of change and the remainder to puffing innumerable cigarettes but in spite of our combined vigilance before the afternoon was over and while the crowds were thickest and rapid movement impossible the man escaped our vigilance it did not surprise me those midway throngs made veritable sanctuary for a fleeing criminal but it made me more than ever determined to find some other and quicker way of getting our hands upon this gang all that week we haunted midway to little purpose once in the very centre of the big turkish bazaar where everything was sold and which was extended from time to time out of all proportion to its original size where too i had been arrested and ignominiously marched away to be rescued by dave brainerd i caught a glimpse of delbra this time in full turkish costume and minus the beard and smoked glasses 
I followed him recklessly thrusting aside those who obstructed my way with an impatient and ruthless hand until I came to a spot almost at the southern exit of the long and narrow L where a crowd was packed from side to side of the eight-foot aisle with mouths agape listening to the exhortations of a boyish looking fellow wearing a Turkish fez and a sort of smoking jacket and looking in spite of this far more like a Jew than a follower of Mohammed he stood at one side close to the entrance and a curtain framed and partially concealed him behind him towering above him by a head and shoulders was a tall Sudanese his face black and shining and round and his white robe and turban emphasizing the arm bare black and massive that waved a continuous accompaniment to the words half spoken half shouted by the other buy your tickets buy your tickets now 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 come and see how to get married come and see how to get divorced come and see how the ladies quarrel with their husbands come and see how the ladies quarrel with each other buy your tickets now 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 in this singular combination of the modern fakir plying his trade and the huge black steadily and systematically beckoning toward a stairway partially concealed beyond the curtain and looking like some giant eunuch of ancient romance there seemed something which caught and held the public eye and the public wonder and they crowded about the improvised entrance and formed an impassable wall between me and the man so short a distance ahead yet so utterly out of reach it was vain to struggle that turkish fez had been to delbras an open sesame through the packed mass of humanity and for a time i saw it nodding above the lesser head halfway between the door of exit and that half concealing curtain then presto it was gone and though i went wildly around to the farther entrance pushing and jostling to right and left and bringing down upon myself anathemas without number though i reached the south end of the building in a moment seemingly and gazed in every direction delbra had vanished it was while making this wild rush that i brought upon myself the attention of one of the very guards who had led me ignominiously away from the presence of smug and the camps he had seen my hasty rush from the building and without at first recognizing me had followed me to inquire the cause of my haste I knew him at the first moment and when I had answered his inquiry he knew me the matter Oh, I was trying to overtake a uh, a person whom I particularly wish to see I replied and I saw on his countenance the dawning look of recognition Seems to me you and I have met before you don't want to arrest me again. Do you I added testily and then I pulled myself together and asked more amiably did you think I was running away with another wallet the young fellow's face brightened Dave's words had told him and his companions who I was and he answered very respectfully No, sir not this time though. I had not recognized you at first. Can I help you in any way sir? No, I'm afraid there is no help for me this time by the way Did you happen to see any of those parties again after you marched me off so cruelly? He knitted his brows to assist his memory and finally replied come to think sir I did see one of them at least one of the persons who had been swindled like yourself Swindled yes, sir. You see we didn't quite catch on at the time It was all done so quick and I got the idea that it was a sort of pocket game But it happened that I met the other gentleman the next day if I remember and I spoke to him for I knew his face at once describe him why not very tall and well not very light nor very dark i should say not much hair on his face and dressed in a sort of gray suit yes i see i recognized the description as that of smug and determined to hear more and what did he say why nothing at first but when i saw him looking at me sort of sharp I just stepped up and asked him how the row finished after the other guard and I had hustled you off And then I told him how we had found out our mistake and how your friend had let us off easy Although both were on the detective force 
and then he explained how as you and he were trying to keep the old man and his wife from being fleeced one of the gang had set up the cry of pickpocket and had pointed at you and then you know when we fished that wallet out of your pocket it looked uh yes i replied gravely it certainly did he said went on the guard that he had tried to make us understand that it was all a mistake about you you know but we didn't hear him so you told him that my friend and i were upon the ss i said why yes was that never mind what did he say about the others the tall man with the fez for instance he had a notebook and some bills in his hand you may remember yes sir i do yes he told me about him jumbo but didn't you all get into a muddle he had a narrow escape too the tall man you know did you know who he was i shook my head well sir he came very near being fleeced too he wanted to change a bill it seems and the old farmer and the other fellow the one that told me you know had both been getting some change from a man that claimed to make a business of changing foreign papers and large bills to accommodate people oh i ejaculated yes sir and this gentleman he was a big man you know one of them foreign managers and couldn't speak very good english he was just going to change with them a hundred i think he said when somebody sets up the cry of pickpocket you know yes i know go on well sir after you was gone of course in the crowd the real pickpocket got off scot-free it turned out that the farmer and him that told me had been done by some sharper and that they was just ready to pass off on this foreigner a lot of counterfeit money great caesar i ejaculated and then checked my hasty speech after all why should i expend my breath or wrath upon this guileless guard who after all was doing me a service and how cleverly smug had twisted the story and made it serve his turn but it must not be repeated if it had not been already look here i said in a more amiable tone have you told this affair all or any of it to any one who me no haven't had the chance the fellow that was with me that day was taken off next day and i've not seen a soul i know since i did want to tell him it is well you did not look here if you want to keep out of trouble you must keep perfectly dark about this matter it's being sifted on the quiet and they take it very ill at headquarters if one of the guards was to leak on them and maybe spoil their game and if you should chance to meet this party again remember mum's the word i'll keep mum sir i don't want to lose my job not yet before i've seen half the fare very good now how long have you been on duty about this place two weeks sir ever since i was put on the force and this foreigner manager as you call him did you have a good look at him oh yes sir ever seen him before now that you ask i'm quite sure i have but not knowing who he was yes i'm sure i've seen him about the village among the turks more than once describe him why he's good-looking and tall and dark got a sort of proud gait and square shoulders always dresses well thank you i had squeezed my orange dry and was anxious to leave him i had suspected it before and was now convinced that unwittingly in my attempt to play the guardian angel to adam camp and his wife i had come face to face with delbra when i compared notes with dave that night he was quite of my opinion End of chapter 13. chapter 14 of against odds by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter 14 missing carte blanche it had been decided between miss generous and myself that the little brunette should not be altogether ignored at least for a time and i had taken it upon myself to provide the letter which was to put off until a more convenient season the proposed survey of the white city by night after some thought i had written the following and posted it according to directions in care of a certain cafe on fifty seventh street dear miss b 
I find that I can hardly evade the duties one owes to courteous friends and must for a few evenings devote myself to these it is very likely that some of the friends of my chaperone will visit the fair perhaps this week in which case she will perhaps be able to dispense with me for one evening therefore please inform me if you should as you suggested change your address so that i may drop you a note when the right time comes yours etc j e j this letter was submitted to miss jenrys and then posted but not until the superintendent had secured for me the services of a half-grown boy who had won a reputation as a keen and tenacious shadow him i set to await the coming of our brunette and lest he should mistake or miss her i waited in attendance with him until she came which was at an early hour and in haste i had also placed a man upon stony island avenue armed with minute descriptions of smug greenback bob delbra and the brunette and with instructions to watch the cafes and houses upon a line with the fairgrounds and especially within a certain radius within which we knew parties of their peculiar sort were received and no questions asked as for brainerd and myself we had laid out a new system and upon it we founded a strong hope for ultimate success though we recognized more and more the fact that we had to cope with men who were more than ordinarily keen clever and skilled in the fine art of dodging and baffling pursuit in fact i was now thoroughly convinced that they were living and working upon the supposition that they were constantly watched and pursued and that they governed their movements and shifted their abode accordingly there was one thing which weighed upon my mind i had almost said conscience and troubled me uncomfortably and that was the attitude i was permitting the disguised brunette to maintain toward miss jenrys since she had entered so earnestly into the work of ferreting out the motive for the brunette's persistent attentions she had manifested such a willingness to aid me by allowing that personage to continue the acquaintance already begun that while i appreciated it as an earnest of her trust in me it was nevertheless embarrassing i was not yet ready to tell her that i believed the brunette to be a man in masquerade i must be able to prove my charge first and yet i had determined that they should not meet again if i could stand between them it was to speak an additional word of caution and to tell the two ladies that two stalwart and trusty chair pushers were engaged for their evening sightseeing that i set out one morning to make my first call upon them at their apartment on washington avenue it had been decided that even in such a throng as that of the white city it would not be wise to meet within the grounds too often or too openly we were sure of more or less surveillance from one source and i was quite ready to believe that from more than one direction interested eyes were watching the coming and going of miss jenrys if not of myself already i had tested the cooking and service of a variety of the restaurants cafes and table d'hote within the gates and i had also found that outside and especially within easy reach from the northern or fifty seventh street gate were to be found a number of most cleanly and inviting little places more or less pretentious and under various names but already willing and able to serve one a breakfast dinner or luncheon such as would tempt even chronic grumblers to smile feast and come again i had breakfasted that morning at one of these comforting places and upon leaving it had crossed the street to purchase a cigar from the stand on the corner and having lighted it had kept on upon the same side i had meant to recross at the corner for halfway between the two streets stationed beneath some trees upon a vacant lot was a bootblack's open-air establishment which i had a mind to patronize as i neared the scene however and glanced across i saw that both of the bootblack's chairs were occupied and upon a second glance i noted that one of the occupants was my recent acquaintance monsieur voisin miss jenrys's friend he was busy with a newspaper or seemed to be and glancing down at my feet to make sure they were not too shabby for a morning call i kept straight on 
and turned down Washington Avenue upon its farther or western side. I had bought a paper along with my cigar, and as I ran up the steps of the pretty modern cottage where the two ladies had established themselves, I threw away the one and put the other in my pocket, wondering as I did so if Monsieur Voisin was also on his way to this place, and smiling a little, because I had at least the advantage of being first. It was so early that the ladies had not yet returned from breakfast, which they took at a café around the corner juiced, so the servant informed me. But I was expected, and I was asked to wait in their little reception room, where a sunshade and a pair of dainty gloves upon a chair, and a shawl of soft grey precisely folded, and lying upon a small table, not to mention the books, papers, and little feminine knick-knacks, gave the room a look of occupancy and ownership. I had just unfolded my paper and was glancing over the headlines upon the first page when the two ladies entered and I dropped my paper while rising to salute them in anticipation of or to forestall a possible call from monsieur voisin I made haste to get through with the little business in hand and obtained from miss Jenrys without question or demur her promise not to hold communication with the brunette at least by letter and to avoid if possible a meeting until I should be able to enlighten her more fully. I do not want to lose sight of her, I said, in scant explanation, and it seems that we can best keep our hold through her pursuit of you. But I would rather lose sight of her altogether and begin it all over again than let one line in your handwriting go into such hands. I avoided those false pronouns, her and she, when I could, and hope and trust you may be spared another interview. Please take this upon trust, Miss Jenrys, and you too, Miss Ross, and believe that I will not keep you in the dark one moment longer than is needful. They assured me of their willingness to wait, even in the face of what Miss Jenrys laughingly described as a devouring curiosity, and then, while she turned the talk upon the fair and some of its wonders, Miss Ross, murmuring a word of polite excuse, took up my paper from the place where it had fallen from my hands. They will allow me i have not seen our morning paper oh aunt Anne, i had entirely forgotten it cried her niece contritely it's not important child replied the smiling quakeress there is very little in it now except the fair and that we can better read at first hand nevertheless she began to turn the pages and scan here and there through her dainty gold-framed spectacles while miss jenrys began to interrogate me concerning the mysteries of Midway Plaisance. We hear such contradictory stories, and I do not want to miss any feature of the foreign show worth seeing, she said, with an arch little nod and smile across to her aunt. Nor does Aunt Anne, and I don't feel quite like bearding all those Midway lions unguarded, unguided, and unadvised. I was not slow to offer my own individual services, in such an earnest manner that after a little hesitation and the assurance that it would not only not conflict with my business engagements but would afford an especial pleasure inasmuch as i had not yet done the pleasance in any thorough manner she finally accepted my proffered services for her aunt and herself adding at last to be perfectly honest mr masters i know aunt anne will never enter that alarming fascinating ferris wheel without an escort whom she can trust should we lose our heads and want to jump out one hundred feet above terra firma and i am quite sure i shall want to jump i always am tempted to jump from any great height do you believe in these sensations i have heard people say that they could hardly restrain themselves from jumping into the water whenever they ride in a boat or across a bridge i have heard of such cases i replied and so we talked on discussing the singular and seldom met with but still existing fact of single insane freaks in the otherwise perfectly sane when the gentle quakeress uttering a little shocked exclamation and suddenly lowering her paper turned toward us pardon me but june child what did you tell me was the name of the young man to whom my friend hilda o'neil is betrothed trent auntie gerald trent of boston of boston yes why aunt anne 
i i fear then that there is sorrow in store for thy young friend gerald trent is missing missing the quakeress held the paper toward me i being nearest her and pointing with a finger to some headlines halfway down the page said perhaps thee would better read it i took the paper and read aloud these lines another world's fair mystery gerald trent among the missing another young man swallowed up by the maelstrom yesterday we chronicled the disappearance of harvey parker who was traced by his friends to this city where he had arrived to visit the exposition for a week or more he is known to have arrived at the rock island depot and to have set out for the van buren street viaduct en route for the fair this was on monday last five days ago since which time as was stated in our yesterday's issue he has not been seen or heard from by his friends or by the police who are searching for him nearly two weeks ago gerald trent only son of abner trent one of boston's millionaire merchants came to this city to see the exposition and to secure accommodations for his family who were to come later he stopped at an uptown hotel for some days visited the fair and secured apartments for his friends which were to have been vacated for their use in a few days he had written to his family telling them to await his telegram which they would receive in three or four days when this time had expired and no telegram came they waited another day and then sent him a message of inquiry this being unanswered they made inquiry at his uptown hotel and then began a search which ended in the conviction that young trent had met with misfortune if not foul play on monday last he left the hotel saying to one of the inmates of the house that he should have possession of a fine suite of rooms within three blocks of the north entrance which presumably means fifty seventh street within three days and that he meant to send for his friends that day by telegraph no message was received at his home as has been said and nothing has been heard of him since that day young trent wore rather unwisely a couple of valuable diamonds one in a solitaire ring the other in a scarf pin he also carried a fine watch and was well supplied with money the police are working hard upon the case the list of the missing seems to be increasing i put the paper down and looked across at miss jenrys i had recognized the name hilda o'neil as that of her boston correspondent whose letter i had found in the little black bag and by association the name of gerald trent also miss jenrys was looking pale and startled oh she exclaimed that is what hilda's telegram meant you have had a telegram from boston i ventured yes you perhaps remember the letter in my bag i nodded in that letter hilda miss o'neil spoke of mr trent's delay and of her anxiety i did not reply to her letter at first expecting to hear from or see her for she had my address it was only a freak my telling her to write me through the world's fair post office that when she did not come on the day before i met you in fact i wrote just a few lines of inquiry in reply to this i received a telegram last evening i will get it she crossed the room and opened a little traveller's writing case coming back with a yellow envelope in her hand there it is she said holding it out to me i took it and read the words have you seen gerald hilda did you reply to this i asked as i gave it back to her at once just the one word no do you know this young man i asked i have never even seen him but i know that he bears a splendid reputation for manliness sobriety and studiousness he was something of a bookworm at college i believe and has developed a taste for literature you see i have heard much of him oh i am sure something has happened to him some misfortune you see she had asked him to call upon me and he would never have left hilda not to mention his parents and sister five days in suspense if able to communicate with them if he is the person you describe him surely not 
she gazed at me a moment as if about to reproach me for the doubt my words implied and dropped her eyes then she answered quietly the simple fact that john o'neill hilda's father has accepted him as his daughter's fiance is sufficient for me mr o'neill is an astute lawyer and a shrewd judge of character he has known the trents for many years and he already looks upon gerald trent as a son and mr o'neill where is he abroad at present it is to be regretted now i took up the paper and re-read the account of young trent's disappearance and miss jenrys dropped her head upon her hand and seemed to be studying the case after a moment of silence miss ross who had been a listener from the beginning leaned toward her niece and said in her gentlest tone june my child ought we not to try and do something what does he think should we wait and perhaps lose valuable time while the trents are on their way miss jenrys lifted her head suddenly auntie she exclaimed you are worth a dozen of me you are right we must do something mr masters what would you do first if you were to begin at once upon the case get from the chief of police if necessary the name of the uptown hotel where young trent was last seen and then she urged in a prompt imperious manner quite new in my acquaintance with her obtain a description of him from some of the people there and learn all that can be learned about him and what next she urged still next i would seek among the houses within two or three blocks from the north entrance for the rooms which he engaged and which are perhaps still held for him mr masters can you do this for me she was sitting erect before me the very incarnation of repressed activity and i knew as well as if she had said it that she would never permit my refusal to weaken the determination just taking shape in her mind to do for hilda o'neill what she could not have done for herself and to put it boldly promptly openly she saw my hesitation and went on hurriedly i know how busy you must be how much i am asking but you have undertaken to follow up that brunette and find out the reason for her interest in me and surely this is far far more important a man's life the happiness of a family my friend's happiness at stake perhaps for i am sure that no common cause nothing but danger illness or death could keep gerald trent from communicating with his parents and his promised wife drop the brunette and all connected with her mr masters and give such time as you would have given to my affairs and more if possible to the search i beg of you at least promise me that you will conduct the search and employ as many helpers as you need i'll give you carte blanche deal with me as you would with a man and if i can aid in any other way than with my purse let me do it as she paused with her eyes eagerly fixed upon my face the sweet quakeress leaned toward me and put out her white slender hand in earnest appeal thy brother's keeper remember that a deed of mercy is beyond and above all works of vengeance what is the capture of a criminal of many of them compared to the rescue the saving perchance of an honest man's life i beg of thee consent help us there may be men who could have resisted that appeal i could not and did not i did not throw my other responsibilities to the winds i simply did not think of them at the moment when i took the soft hand of the elder woman in my own and looking across at the younger said i will do my best miss generous and that not one moment may be lost tell me can you describe young trent not very well i fear and his picture your friend must have that of course half smiling telegraph her to forward it to you at once and has your friend at any time mentioned the hotel where young trent would stop most of our eastern visitors have a favorite stopping place i know she had made a movement toward her desk but paused and turned toward me i think it is safe to say that the two families would share the same house they did in visiting the summer resorts always and i know where mr o'neill and mr trent went when they attended the great convention in this city 
she named the place and i promptly arose i will go there at once but you may as well give me the trent's address and permit me the use of your name if i am wrong i will telegraph from uptown for the name of his hotel as i turned my face cityward that morning i was not only fully committed to the search for missing gerald trent but i was determined to convert my friend and partner to the same undertaking and having now found time for sober second thought i had also determined not to relinquish my search for the little brunette and her secret nor for messrs bob delbra and company had i not carte blanche as i left the house intent upon my new errand i was not surprised to see approaching it almost at the door in fact monsieur voisin we exchanged greetings at the entrance and i had walked some distance before it occurred to me to wonder how it came that monsieur voisin whom i had last seen at the bootblack stand two blocks north and east happened to be approaching miss jenrys's residence from the south End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of against odds by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter fifteen the king of confidence men i found a number of people at the big uptown hotel who could tell me a little of gerald trent as he appeared to them after a few days acquaintance and these were unanimous in saying and believing that young trent was not absent by his own will it's a case of foul play i'm sure of it declared the clerk to whom i had represented myself as acting for one of mr trent's friends cowl saw him at the viaduct he told me just before he left that was five days ago now and trent was then going down to secure those rooms and see that they were put in order he went by the suburban because he wanted to go over to the avenues and cowls went down by the whaleback there was no more to be learned uptown gerald trent had been last seen at the viaduct at the foot of van buren street where the cattle cars the suburban and numerous boats left the lake front and the wharf beyond en route for the fair city this was at ten o'clock a m or near it i went back to the fair city as trent had last gone upon the suburban train and before noon had begun an exploration in the vicinity of the north entrance for the rooms engaged by him bounding the fair city on the west was the street known as stony island avenue and after a short survey of such near portions of this street as i had not seen i satisfied myself that young trent would not have selected it as a place of abode for his lady mother his sister and his sweetheart one block westward running south from fifty seventh was a short street called rosalie court and after exploring this i pushed on to washington avenue and then to madison running respectively one and two blocks parallel with rosalie court something impelled me to pass by washington avenue upon which miss jenrys and her aunt were lodged and to explore the farther avenue first if the rooms are within two or three blocks of the north entrance i said to myself and if they are upon this street i shall find them within one block north or south from this corner meaning fifty-seventh street and i turned southward and began my search in earnest not long since this part of the city had been a beautiful suburb and the pretty cottages and more stately villas were for the most part isolated in the midst of their own grounds every other house it seemed and some of the most pretentious bore upon paling piazza or doorposts the legend rooms to let and i applied and entered at a number of handsome and homelike portals first upon the east side and then upon the west crossing at fifty eighth street to turn my face northward at fifty seventh i paused it is something more than two blocks from the fair entrance to this point i mused and therefore i ought to go but one block in this direction and when i had traversed the block to fifty sixth street with no success i crossed the street and went on saying it's easy for a stranger to be mistaken in a matter of distance at the north end of this square stood a large old-fashioned mansion of a decidedly southern type 
it stood upon terraced grounds and was a dignified reminder of better days with its stained and time roughened stuccos and the warm paint about the ornate cornices rooms to let was the sign upon a tree trunk and after some doubt and hesitation i went up the terrace steps crossed the lawn and rang a bell much newer than its surroundings once admitted to the wide inviting hall with its glimpse of cheerful dining room beyond and a large cool parlor opening at the side i felt that trent might well have sought quarters in this roomy airy house and when the lady of the house a woman small elderly delicate and refined appeared before me i put my question hopefully madam have you among the inmates of your house a mr gerald trent i saw by her sudden change of countenance that the name was not strange to her and was not surprised when she informed me that a mr trent had engaged her best suite of rooms for himself and four others that he had called upon her on the monday previous paid her an advance upon the rooms and informed her that his friends would arrive in three days if not sooner they should have been here she concluded the day before yesterday but they have not appeared and we have had no word from them it is very inconvenient for me of course the rooms are secured until monday but i have no means of knowing if they will come then or when i may consider them at my disposal it was evident that she had not seen the papers and i at once put the notice in her hand and told her the nature of my business there seemed but one opinion of gerald trent when she had read the paper and heard my statement she said at once what the inmates of the hotel had said before her something has happened to him he never went away like this of his own accord i never saw a more simple and sincere young man and then as if by an afterthought he had too much money about him he was too well dressed and i don't think he was of a suspicious nature i learned from her very little to help my further search trent had met none of the guests of the house upon either of his visits there in reply to a question she had said he seemed in the best of spirits when he paid the advance money and went away and he said that he meant to spend the day in the pleasance i remember that he laughed when he said this and added something to the effect that he wanted to decide before the ladies came where it would pay to go on the pleasance and what were the things they would not care for he had a rather frank and boyish way of expressing himself and you think he went from here to the fair i believe he went from here to midway pleasance there is an entrance on this street three blocks south and i walked to the door with him and pointed the way to it and this was all of course i took from her lips as from the people uptown a minute description of trent's dress and appearance on the day of his disappearance and then i went back to the fair by the midway gate and wished impatiently for the time to come when i should meet brainerd and consult with him this i knew would not be until a late hour and as i lounged down the pleasance i began to look about for the handsome guard in whom i had taken a decided interest i found him easily as erect soldierly attentive to duty as usual and we spent the greater part of two hours chatting while we paced up and down midway he was a bright talker and he entertained me with a number of amusing incidents graphically related and illustrative of the life on the pleasance during the two hours however i broke the monotony of a continuous tramp by an excursion now on one side and then on the other now to see the glass blowers now the submarine exhibit and lastly to the irish village that clustered about blarney castle it was on my return from this that as i approached him i saw with some surprise that he was in earnest conversation with a woman and as i came nearer and he shifted his position slightly i saw that the woman was none other than that ignis fatuous the brunette her back was toward me and she was squarely facing him so that as i came nearer and directly toward them i caught his eye and nodding with a gesture which i think he understood i turned away and watched the manoeuvres of the little mystery as brainerd so often called the brunette wondering if this unknown guard was also to be enmeshed in the plot she seemed to be weaving 
and then there flashed into my mind that first meeting with the guard and his avowed acquaintance with miss jenrys was this interview in any way connected with or concerning her the brunette had not seen me of that i was quite assured and even so i had small fear of recognition for while i had not on the occasion of our two meetings face to face worn any disguise i was confident that the widely different garments worn on the two occasions together with my ability to elongate twist and change my features and to alter the pitch of my voice was masquerade sufficient but i did not desire to become known to this anomalous personage and i lingered here and there within sight and at a safe distance until i saw her nod airily and trip away flinging a smile over her shoulder in the time spent in waiting the end of this little dialogue i had decided that i must know this young man so reticent yet so frank better and that i must win his confidence and to do this perfect frankness i knew would be my best aid when the mystery was safely out of sight and on this occasion i had no desire to follow her i rejoined the guard and i was sure that i surprised upon his face a look of perplexity and annoyance which vanished when i put my hand upon his arm and falling into step with him began i hope you understood my meaning when i went into ambush so suddenly i really did not care to encounter your friend that is hardly the right name seeing that the lady is a stranger to me he replied slightly smiling indeed i retorted then may i wager that i know what she had to say to you i saw him flush and his lips compressed themselves as if to hold back some hasty speech but i went lightly on that is the young person who claimed the bag belonging to your acquaintance you remember the circumstance and if she is still as angry at me as she was on that day she was doubtless imploring you to run me in and put me in more irons than christopher columbus ever wore honestly now am i not right he was silent and seemed perplexed again and i promptly changed my tone if i am mistaken and if the young woman is someone known to you i beg your pardon but remembering how she turned her look upon you on the occasion of that first meeting one moment he broke in it is possible that we have been unjust in this case and i think i may tell you without a breach of confidence what this young lady i thought he emphasized the lady somewhat who by the by is a stranger to me had to say just now i bowed my assent lest speech might cause a discussion and he went on the young lady after excusing herself for doing what she termed an unconventional thing in addressing me asked at once after you after me but go on she spoke of you as the person i was talking with on the day when her friend lost her bag and she tried to reclaim it but when i disclaimed all knowledge of you she told me how cavalierly that is also her word you refused to yield up the bag and how anxiously her friend was hoping to secure that bag even yet ah indeed you will pardon me he went on not heeding my interjection and speaking with marked courtesy but i almost fear you have mistaken this young lady why because she not only gave me the name of the owner of the bag but she assured me that the lady recognized me in passing a thing which i regret and she called me by my name here was a coil indeed my head was a nest of queer thoughts and suspicions but i kept to the subject by asking and may i ask how you replied to all this in the only way i could you were a stranger who was anxious i felt sure to restore the bag to its owner you had assured me of this much as to your address i could not give it and your name i did not know but i added the promise that should i chance to meet you as i might i would ask you to send the bag to the lady's address pardon was this the lady's proposition no she asked me to get it from you the bag and to restore it through her yes and the address did she give you the young lady's address the owner's or her own she gave the owner's address then if you will give it to me i can promise that tomorrow we'll see the little bag in its owner's possession 
he took from his pocket a visiting card upon which was engraved the name june e jenris and underneath in pencil the address i had seen just such a card minus the penciled address in miss jenris's card tray on washington avenue and that penciled address it was that of the cafe to which miss jenris was to send her note concerning the evening excursion i had not spoken of the adventure of the bag during the afternoon and i had not meant to do so since our last meeting my position in relation to miss jenris had been changed I was now in some degree the guardian of her interests and while I believed in and admired this handsome and secretive stranger guard and Might have entrusted him with a secret all my own perhaps My mouth was closed concerning the young lady whom he professed to know yet was unwilling to meet As I looked at the tall lithe figure the erect head and handsome face I wondered what this mystery could be which caused him to withhold his name from those who might be his friends to shun a lovely girl whom he knew and in whom he was evidently interested and above all which linked him as was now fairly proven through the wily brunette with the strange pursuit of miss jenris was it possible i asked myself that this medley of mysterious happenings could reach back through the brunette to greenback bob the counterfeiter and delbra the King of Confidence Men End of Chapter fifteen Chapter sixteen of Against Odds by Lawrence L. Lynch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter sixteen That Little Decoy. I stowed the false address in my waistcoat pocket and after promising to see the guard again on the next day a promise which I fully intended to keep and Exchanging a few friendly but important sentences with him. We shook hands and separated We had grown almost friendly in our manner each toward each in spite of the fact that neither knew the name of the other He had told me where he lodged among the number who were housed within the grounds and we had agreed to dine together at an early date at a place which he had recommended in reply to my inquiry after a satisfactory place to dine within the walls of the fair he had dined there regularly he assured me and i was glad to know this for i foresaw that i might need his help for the defence of miss jenris and her interests and i could not know too much of his whereabouts till we meet and wine and dine i said flippantly upon leaving him little dreaming how soon and in what manner we were to meet again as i left the pleasance the handsome guard was still the subject of my thoughts that he had told me the truth concerning his interview with the brunette i did not doubt but was it the whole truth all that he had rehearsed to me could have been said in much less than half the time she had spent in brisk conversation with the guard whose part seemed to have been that of listener Not that I had any right to demand or expect his full confidence Still why had he withheld it and what was it that the brunette had slipped into his hand at parting? Another thing we had planned to dine together soon and he knew that I was or seemed to be quite at leisure while he would be relieved from duty very soon and yet well he had certainly not grasped at the opportunity i did not expect to meet brainerd until a late hour and i had decided to do nothing further in the matter of the trent disappearance until we could talk it over in fact there was little to be done until i had seen miss jenris and her aunt and reported to them as i had engaged to do at seven o'clock at this hour I called and made my meagre report which however was better than nothing as the ladies were good enough to declare They had remained at home all day and late in the afternoon received a message from miss O'Neill The picture it assured her would be sent at once a Little to my surprise I found that the ladies were prepared to go to town in company with monsieur voisin to hear a famous monologue artist he had persuaded them miss jenris said rather against their wishes but they had at last decided that this would be better than to pass the evening as they had already passed the day 
in useless speculation discussion and anxiety of course i agreed with them but i came away early not caring to encounter the handsome frenchman again and i re-entered the gates of the fair city a little out of tune and wandered about the brightly illuminated and beautiful court of honour finding for the first time in this place that time was dragging and wishing it were time to meet dave and begin what i knew would be a lively and two-sided discussion at eight o'clock there was music upon the grand plaza and the bandstand was surrounded by a merry happy crowd at nine the band was playing popular airs and a picked chorus that had been singing in choral hall in the afternoon was filling the great space with vocal melody in which from time to time the crowd joined with enthusiasm coming nearer the centre of attraction i saw seated near the water's edge and quite close to the great fountain the little brunette and a companion it was impossible to mistake the brunette for she wore the costume of the afternoon a somewhat conspicuous costume as i afterward remember but her companion puzzled me she was tall and slight and quietly well dressed and her face could not well be seen under the drooping hat which she wore there seemed at the very first something familiar about this hat it was broad-brimmed slightly curved upward at the sides and bent to shade the face and fall over the hair at the back but long dark plumes fell at one side and a third stood serenely erect in front and suddenly i remembered that i had seen miss jenrys wear such a hat upon the day of our first meeting but miss jenrys in a dainty white theatre bonnet had gone uptown and there was no monopoly of drooping hats and feathers so i told myself but i wondered what mischief new or old the brunette was bent upon and i decided to give her the benefit of my unoccupied attention from time to time the two changed their positions but i noted that they kept upon the outskirts of the throng and seemed to avoid the well-lighted spaces sitting or standing in the shadow of the great statues the columns and angles for nearly an hour the music continued vocal for the most part and the crowd kept in place singing and applauding by turns i had been standing near the east facade of the administration building for some time having followed the brunette and her companion to that side of the plaza when i saw a group of colombian guards evidently off duty place themselves against the wall quite near me they were strolling gaily and after a little as the singers began a national anthem some of them joined in the chorus or refrain it was amateurish singing enough until suddenly a new voice lifted itself among them a tenor voice sweet strong high and thoroughly cultured i turned to look closer and saw that the singer was my friend the handsome guard he was standing slightly aloof from the others and when he saw that his music was causing many heads to turn he suddenly ceased singing and in spite of the remonstrances of his companions moved away from them slowly at first and then with more decision of movement until he was out of their sight in the crowd he wants to avoid them i said to myself and he seems to be looking for someone and then i turned my attention to the brunette once more at ten o'clock the music had ceased and the people were scattered upon the plaza the electric fountains had ceased to send up multicolored spray and some of the lights in the glittering chains about the grand basin were fading out on the streets and avenues leading away from the plaza there was still sufficient light but the wooded island which as yet had not participated in the great illuminations was not brilliantly lighted in fact under the trees and among the winding shrub bordered paths there were many shadowed nooks and gloomy recesses and yet it was towards the wooded island that the brunette and her companion led me wondering much and keeping at a distance to avoid the glances often sent back by the little adventuress i had just stepped off the path to avoid the gleam of light that fell across it from the light just at the curve when a quick step sounded close by and a tall figure passed me in haste going the way the two had taken the form of the handsome guard 
I had followed them past the east front of the electricity building and between it and the canal and then across the bridge opposite and midway between the north front of the electricity and mines buildings across the little island of the hunters camp and across the second bridge and it was near this last spot that the guard had passed me a few paces beyond me he seemed at a loss and paused to look about him and as he did so the two women who had made a short cut across the forbidden grass came out into the path directly between us and retraced their steps toward the bridge it was past ten o'clock now and very quiet just here and the lamps at the ends of the bridge the only lights just here seemed to me less brilliant than usual as the two women came toward me somewhat slowly i drew back into the shelter of the bushes and they passed me speaking low i remember that at the moment the thought of our singular isolation in this spot crossed my mind and i wondered why we did not see somewhere a second columbian guard on duty and now my guard passed me hurriedly looking neither to right nor left and i crept forward across the grass and under the trees i could now see that the women had stopped upon the bridge nearest the island and on the side facing eastward and looking over the face of the lagoon at its widest and across to the silent and now almost utterly darkened manufacturers building and that the guard had joined them rather that he was speaking with the brunette while the other with bent head stood a little aloof and then as i looked and wondered two figures arose suddenly or so it seemed from the base of the statue at the end of the bridge just behind the guard and as he bent his head toward the little decoy there was a silent forward spring a sudden heaving movement and a splash with a shout for help i bounded forward tearing off my coat as i ran i was conscious of four flying figures that passed me hastening islandward but my thoughts were all for that figure that had gone over into the lagoon silently and without a struggle as i tore down the bank at the side of the pier i heard low voices and could see a boat in the shadow of the bridge and as i was about to plunge into the water a voice said sharply keep out mate we've got him and in a moment the boat came out and i saw two men were supporting the guard half in and half out of the water and the other pushing the skiff to shore as i stepped into the water to their assistance i saw at one glance that my friend had fallen into the able hands of two of the emergency crew whose duty it was to patrol the lagoons by night and that he was insensible he struck our boat in falling one of them said to me and i'm afraid he's got a hurt head too bad if he hadn't fainted we'd a winged one of that crowd sure End of chapter 16. Chapter Seventeen of Against Odds by Lawrence L. Lynch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Seventeen. Those two women. My friend, the guard, had received a blow upon the head, painful but not fatal. He would be about in a few days, the hospital surgeon said. But in spite of the fact that I visited the hospital every day five days passed before i was allowed to speak to him or he was allowed to talk i was very anxious for this opportunity for i had now a new reason for my growing interest in the young fellow who so stubbornly refused to give me a name by which to call him he was enrolled among the guards as l carr and i at once adopted this name in speaking to or of him I had determined at the first moment possible to have a confidential talk with him confidential upon my part at least and i meant to win his confidence if possible in the meantime i had laid all the story of this day's adventures before dave brainerd beginning with the discovery in the newspaper and my search up town and down for trace of missing gerald trent and i ended by adding to all the rest a few ideas and opinions of my own which caused Dave, in spite of his lately expressed lofty opinion of my imaginative qualities, first to open his eyes, and then to roar with laughter. 
but he was my hearty second at the last even to the point of agreeing with me that if we could accomplish but the one end it were better to find and rescue gerald trent if he were living and in duress which we both doubted or to solve the mystery of his fate if dead than to arrest a pair or a trio of counterfeiters or possible diamond robbers as to miss jenrys and the mysterious guard he would no more have given up the thought of solving the problem of the brunette's pursuit of these two than would i at the moment but we needed all the light possible and we agreed at once that to obtain this it would be wise at this point to make certain confidences to the two persons most interested as to the elusive brunette her shadow had followed her for days more faithfully and at closer quarters than we could have done because of his small stature and his easily managed lightning changes managed by the aid of a reversible jacket three or four very coloured silk handkerchiefs and two or three hats or caps all stuffed into convenient pockets but his report was after all far from complete or conclusive i followed her he declared till my legs ached and i never seen a woman that could get over the ground like her ever since that first trip my legs had been stiff the boy had followed her on the first day by devious ways and until after midday without losing sight of her and had lost her at last as dave and myself had lost our quarry in the intricacies of the pleasance you see billy had said twas this way she stopped afore one of them arab places he meant turkish where there was a pay show and she must a got her ticket ahead for she just sort of held out a card or something afore his eyes and went right in and i had to wait till two or three fellers got tickets for twas my turn and when i got in she went nowhere a look of boyish disgust emphasized the emphasis here but wherever she was she stayed a good while bill went on and then all at once out she came again and it went into another big place close by and i went in too that time she went round behind a big table where they had piles of gym cracks and popped behind a curtain and just as i was getting scared for fear she was gone again out she came and took the place of a tired looking woman that sat on a high stool selling the gym cracks she had took off her hat and things and she had on a little red jacket all spangled up and a red cap like the turks all wear with big gold tassels on it and she made herself blacker round the eyes and redder in the cheeks and she looked just sassy at least it was something to have our theories in regard to the lurking places of this trio verified it was something to feel sure as we now did that these people were quartered in the pleasance but i felt very sure that they had more than one hiding place probably each of them a separate one as well as a general rendezvous I questioned the lad closely regarding the tired-looking woman whom he described as tallish and slim and not much on looks but dressed in turkish fez and zouave jacket and painted thick he had watched her till evening came and then the tallish woman had returned and the brunette had stepped behind the curtain once more i watched that dog on curtain bill declared till twas time to shut up shop and she didn't come out and i couldn't get in did anyone else come from behind that curtain while you waited bill i asked him carelessly yes there was pretty soon after she went in a young turk came out smallish with a little doody moustache he had a pitcher in his hand and he smacked the tired woman on the back and stuck the pitcher under her nose and went out did he come back come to think i guess he didn't i know he didn't well bill i said i can't blame you I only blame myself, but if you should see that woman go behind a curtain or door again and presently see a man come out, if he is the same in size and looks, anything like the one you saw tonight, you just follow him and you'll be on the right track. Jimmy Nettie! And Bill, I want you to be on the pleasance in the morning early, and if the brunette starts out, don't lose her. If she has not appeared by noon, you may go down to the plaza and look about there, but get back to Midway by three o'clock. She'll show herself there sooner or later. The next day, Bill had nothing to report. The day following, he had followed her late in the afternoon, when
when she had emerged from the Turkish bazaar down Midway and had seen her stop and speak to one of the guards. Then she had left the grounds by a Midway gate opposite Hagenbeck's Lion Circus, you know. And I followed her, he continued, till she came to that restaurant where you and me seen her get the letter. She turned off right by the Midway gate and went across to Washington Avenue and down that till she turned to come to the restaurant. "'Twas most supper time, and she didn't come out no more, I'm sure, "'for I watched till almost midnight, "'and there weren't no back way, I know, for I looked. "'I could well believe that she had taken a room "'as near the grounds as possible, "'where she might rest when rest was required, "'and she was off duty, "'and I did not doubt but that Delbra and Greenback Bob "'had each a similar lair outside the White City, "'but conveniently near it. This last report had been made to us on the morning of my visit to Miss Jenrys, Bill having appeared at our quarters at an early hour, and I had been studying the expediency of letting Miss Jenrys into the history of her brunette acquaintance, as far as I myself knew it, before visiting the two ladies, at last deciding that I would wait a little and be guided by circumstances, the episode of Gerald Trent's disappearance finally putting it altogether out of my mind. On the afternoon after the attempt to drown the guard, Dave and I waited for a time in our room, expecting a report from Bill which might, we hoped, throw some light upon the events of the night before. But he did not appear, and after breakfasting together, Dave went back to our room to await him, while I made haste toward the emergency hospital, where our wounded guard lay, carefully watched, skilfully attended, and not permitted to talk or receive visitors. Assured that his recovery would be only a matter of days, I went back to find Dave still alone, and this time we both set out, after leaving a message with the janitor, Dave to look after the men who had been detailed upon our business in different directions, and to hear their reports, and I to see that more men were at work upon the Trent case before I ventured, as I was most anxious to do, upon a visit to Miss Jenrys and her aunt. Having done what I could in the Trent case, I found it nearing noon when I approached their place of residence, but I had little fear of finding them absent, and was hastening on, only a few paces from their door, when I saw Monsieur Voisin come hastily out, and after seeming to hesitate a moment upon the threshold, run down the steps and move rapidly away southward. I could see that his face wore a sombre look, and I wondered if he had seen me in the hasty glance he had cast about him. There were others upon the pavement between him and myself, and I trusted that he had not. Still, I felt a strange reluctance to being seen by this man, so often in the same place, and I slackened my pace and finally stood still, reading the Tolettes upon the opposite houses, until he turned the corner and went, as I was very sure, to the midway entrance a little way beyond. I found the ladies at home, and eager to hear the little I had to tell them regarding the Trent case. I had put a good man in the hotel where Trent had stopped, to find out, if possible, whether the young Bostonian had been spotted and followed from that place by any swell adventurer, and I arranged with the mistress of the place where Trent had secured rooms, to hold them until I heard from Boston, whether any or all would come on and occupy the rooms and assist in the search. Miss Jenrys felt sure they would come, all of them. Hilda O'Neill will not rest until she is here, as near the place where he was last seen as possible. You were very thoughtful to secure the rooms, she sighed heavily. I suppose now we must simply wait until we receive the picture, she added. There is little else to do, I replied. Of course, I have had other advertisements inserted in various papers, and have offered a reward, as you directed. Ah! she sighed again we may hear from that i doubt it i replied if he has been abducted it is too soon for that and then i turned the conversation by saying i have some news from your friend the brunette my friend mr masters pardon me your satellite then she was revolving near you the day before yesterday at this point the door opened and a voice said miss ross the laundress is here about your washing Miss Ross rose with alacrity, a benevolent smile upon her sweet face. Mr. Masters, she said, 
thee must save thy story or tell it twice over for i must beg thee to excuse me now i can't send this poor woman away and i ought not to make her wait it is one of aunt anne's protégés explained miss jenrys and she has come by appointment mentally thankful for this interruption i assured miss ross that my story should wait and when she had left us alone i turned at once to miss jenrys i am glad of this opportunity i began at once for i have something to tell you which i prefer to make known to you first although i should have told my story even in your aunt's presence if necessary before leaving today and as directly as possible i told of my acquaintance with the handsome guard beginning with her encounter with the turkish palanquin bearers i described my interview with the guard repeated his words his questions concerning her welfare his statement that she was not a stranger to him and then with her interest and her curiosity well roused i described him i wonder who it can be she had murmured before i began my description and i kept a secret watch upon her features while i said he is a tall young fellow and very straight and square-shouldered though somewhat slender he is blond with close-cropped hair that is quite light almost golden and inclined to curl where it has attained an inch of growth he wears a moustache that is but little darker than his hair and is kept close trimmed he has a broad full forehead honest open blue eyes not pale blue but a fine deep color and they meet one frankly and fearlessly his mouth is really too handsome for a man but his chin is firm enough to counterbalance that his manners are fine and he has evidently been reared a gentleman i chanced to hear him sing last night and he has a wonderfully high tenor voice an unusual voice clear and sweet and soft in the highest notes before i had finished my description i saw clearly that she recognized the picture her color had changed and changed again from red to pale but i made no pause telling how i had seen him in conversation with the little brunette and what he had told me of that conversation and then i described the adventure of the previous night when i had reached the point where i had offered my card and he had refused to give me a false name i saw her eyes glow and her head lift itself unconsciously when i described him in converse with the wily brunette a slight frown crossed her face and her little foot tapped an impatient tattoo quite unconsciously when i pictured him as following the two women toward the wooded island her head was lifted again and her lip curled scornfully but when i had reached the point where the two figures springing suddenly from the darkness behind him had hurled him over the parapet into the deepest part of the lagoon a low moan burst from her lips and she put out her hands entreatingly was he quick tell me he was rescued unconscious but living by two of the emergency crew who guard the lagoons by night who luckily were lying in their skiff under the shadow of the bridge engaged in watching the mysterious movements of the very men who were lurking behind the big pedestal on the other side of the pier awaiting the signal from their women their confederates in going over his head was quite seriously hurt at first it was thought that he had struck the edge of the boat in falling but the doctor says it was a blow from some blunt instrument with a round end some manner of club no doubt and now how is he she faltered in very good hands and doing as well as can be expected i was not allowed to see him and he does not seem fully conscious although the doctor says he may recover if all goes well where is he her face was very pale but there was a change in her voice a sudden firmness and a total lack of hesitancy at the emergency hospital in the fairgrounds i had purposely made his case as seriously as i consistently could and i now made the important plunge miss jenrys i have taken a great interest in this young man from the first he is a fine fellow and now added to this personal liking is the duty i owe this helpless young man who evidently has an enemy and that enemy seemingly the very person who has been dogging you so persistently and so mysteriously you see the strangeness of the complication are you willing to help me i she hesitated how this young man knows you 
do you not know him i almost believe so and are you under any vow or promise of secrecy he lies there unknown friendless and he has an enemy near at hand i want to serve him but to do this intelligently i must know him she hesitated a moment and then to my surprise arose quite calmly went to her desk and came back with a photograph in her hand look at that she said and held it out to me it was a group of tennis players upon a sunlit lawn one of those instantaneous pictures in which amateurs delight but it was clear and the faces were very distinct one of them i recognized at once as the subject of our conversation he wore in the picture a light tennis suit and his handsome head was bare but i knew the face at once and told her so that she said is a picture of a mr lossing whom i knew quite well for a season in new york shortly before lent he left the city it was said and i have heard and known nothing of him since and pardon me it's very unusual for a young man of society to take up the work he has chosen do you know any reason for this none whatever he seemed to be well supplied with money so far as i can judge i confess i never thought before of his fortune or lack of it a sudden flush mantled her face and her eyes dropped i wondered if she was thinking of that letter to hilda o'neill it's a delicate point i said musingly if we could learn something of his situation he is very proud do you think that your friend monsieur voisin might possibly know something she put up her hand quickly imperiously if mr lossing has chosen to conceal himself from his friends we have no right to make his presence here known to monsieur voisin she checked herself and colored beautifully again you are right i said promptly i had no real thought of asking monsieur voisin into our councils and i had now verified the suspicions i had held from the first fitting the guard's statement and his personality into the story her letter told that he was the mr lossing from whom she had parted so stormily in the conservatory on the night of her aunt's reception and now as i consulted my watch she leaned toward me and suddenly threw aside her reserve can you guess she asked eagerly how he came to meet those women in that way it was a meeting was it not no doubt of that it was also a scheme to entrap him but how did they do it how did they lure him to that bridge those two women i could not suppress a smile can you guess it must be only a guess on my part you know but i fancy that in her talk with him that afternoon the brunette led him to think that you would not be unwilling to see him i particularly noted that the woman with her was about your height and that she wore a hat much like the one worn by you on the day i first saw you now that i recall their manoeuvres of last night i remember that the hat almost concealed her face and that they kept in the shadow she did not follow up the subject but after a moment said do do you think i might be allowed to see him if i went with auntie to the hospital i mean now today could you not say that i that we were that we knew him it is quite important that you should do so i declared unblushingly you are the only one who can identify him and now if i am to tell miss ross all these things pardon me she broke in if it will not matter i i would rather tell aunt anne at least about mr lossing i arose hastily in that case i will leave it to you willingly and if you will come with your aunt say at two o'clock i will meet you at any place you may choose and take you to the hospital or would you rather go alone oh no no she exclaimed we shall be glad of your escort indeed i should fear to venture else End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of against odds by lawrence l lynch this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter 18. If you'll find one, I'll find the other. 
it was through the boy bill that we learned finally how the brunette and her companions made their escape from wooded island after the attack upon the guard i found the lad waiting upon my return from washington avenue and full of the excitement of his story he had struck upon her trail not long after she had parted from the guard it would seem he had been watching upon midway plaisance until thoroughly weary when he caught sight of her going east and followed her to the turkish bazaar as before this time she did not retire behind the curtains much to his relief but she spoke a few words to the tired-looking woman behind the bedecked sales table and then left as she came going straight to the entrance upon midway which opened upon madison avenue as on a former occasion and from thence as before passed miss generous's rooms and so to her own at the cafe here again bill was obliged to loiter three long hours and then a woman passed him so close that her face was distinctly visible and entered the place he recognized her at once as the woman of the tired face though she was now dressed quite smartly and with no remnant of the oriental in her costume this i gathered from his description of her attire which while it failed to give things their proper names as set down in the books of fashion was sufficiently vivid and enabled me to easily recognize the person who had aided the little brunette by impersonating miss jenrys the night before she had entered the cafe and disappeared again through a side door to return before long in company with the brunette they had then partaken of a hearty meal at one of the cafe tables and had entered the fairgrounds at dusk i didn't have no trouble at tracking em though i had been dreading a regular bo peep dance seeing how late was getting but they just sauntered along quite slow only i noticed they was always careful not to get into no strong lights they kept on the shady side of things especially the tallest one with the big cowboy hat so i just monkeyed around till i see him start to go round the electricity building then i just slipped over between the electric and mines you know and come ahead of em just as they turned towards the bridges i tell ye he declared with enthusiasm in a bad cause they couldn't have struck a better place than that there second bridge first there's the t'other bridge and that little island on one side and most everybody going round the mines on t'other side cause twas best lighted then there was them little bushy islands and all that lagoon on the not a speck of light except a few clean across the liberal art shop and most of them little lamps on the island gone out i tell ye mr masters i felt sort o glad when i seen ye coming across and hiding the bushes oh you saw me did you i said to hasten him on i should say i was a layin flat alongside of them little shrubs on the other side of the path right where you turned off well go on bill well sir i was so busy watching them women that i didn't notice nothing else except you and the guard of course i thought he was tending to his biz when they stopped to talk on the bridge i began to crawl along close to the bridge and then you know how it was all coming so sudden well i see the feller go over and see you start towards the water and i just took after the others well sir twas too slick the way they managed right alongside them willers there was one of them little skiffs that stuck round the island for show or one just like em it lay just where that little woody strip had come right between the island and the other side and twas all dark there well they all ran that way across the grass and me after em close as twas safe to get two of em the tall woman and one of the men got into the skiff and the other two struck off north keeping on the grass and under the shade i followed after em they went pretty fast too till they came most to them hoodoo tea shops you know we hadn't met a soul so far but it was lighter there and i see there was a guard coming towards them and what do you suppose they did oh go on billy well i had got pretty close and i seen them whispering together and then it seemed to me that they wasn't so far away as they had been a minute before then flash came a fizz match and sure enough there they was facing towards me and the very way they come and holding the match to the ground just then the guard come up 
and they told him they or she dropped their purse and was looking for it and when he asked when she said oh an hour ago when they walked across the island to see the horti horticultural ticultural place lighted and the guard said he feared they wouldn't find it and went on telling them they'd better hurry out and then he went back the way they'd come across the bridge and all and every little way they'd light a match and course i got so close i heard her say it must have been when i fell down i thought somebody got a fall when they'd run from the bridge down into the bushes well did you find where they went drat the luck no i'd followed em out midway when a couple of guards stopped me and afore i got out from their grip the two of em was out of sight i was not surprised to hear this i was quite convinced that the gang had in some manner secured a safe and secret lurking place in the pleasance still somehow i had hoped for something more from billy's report and felt somewhat disappointed but i had yet to learn its true value during my absence there had come a message from the bureau asking our presence there it was the louse robbery that required our presence so the message read and dave had returned an answer promising our presence at the earliest moment of leisure we did not feel so deeply interested in the louse robbery then as in some other matters but when we had dismissed our boy shadower we went at once to the bureau there was considerable excitement at the office and with good reason some of monsieur lausch's jewels had been returned and in a most novel manner early in the morning a guard had appeared with the treasure in his hands and a singular story upon his lips last night he had said while crossing the northeast end of the wooded island at quite a late hour he had encountered a man and woman searching for a lost purse they were quite certain it had been lost on the island and he being then on duty and unable to delay told them that he would search for it next day and passed on early in the morning he had entered upon the search at the place where he had met the two and finding no trace of the lost purse had turned his search into a stroll about the island he was quite familiar with the place having done guard duty there and going close to the water's edge at a point where a favorite view was to be had he observed that one of the skiffs that were moored here and there about the island was gone Going closer he saw that it had been roughly torn from its moorings and the soft soil showed that several people had left traces of their presence It was in stooping closer to look at these footprints that he had noticed a bit of string trailing across the grass just beyond and taking hold of this he found a weight upon it which proved to be a little chamois skin bag containing some uncut gems he had at once reported this find to his superior officer being an honest guard and was ordered to come with it to the bureau there was no room for doubt or mistake the chamois bag contained a portion of the jewels stolen from the pavilion of monsieur lausch there were some half dozen of the dew-dropped sparklers taken with the silver leaf tray one large topaz and two of the smaller ones and there were also two solitaire rings which were not of the lausch collection the bag containing these had been securely tied to a stout cord nearly a yard in length and fastened doubtless about the body of some person so securely that the double sailor knot remained a very hard knot indeed but alas for human calculations something it was evident having a fine keen edge had come in contact with this cord and had cut it smoothly in two as dave brainard and i saw these things the same thought entered both our minds and we exchanged one swift glance of mutual meaning after which we stood and heard monsieur lausch ejaculate and wonder and question the officers discuss and theorize and prophesy ourselves saying little and eager to be away from this place that we might take counsel together concerning this new thing singularly enough no one seemed to think of connecting this find with the attack upon the guard at the bridge and finally they decided to advertise the gems as if they were still in the hands of the finder who only awaited a reward to yield them up and as little more could be done dave and myself withdrew from the council 
where we had been little more than lookers-on as we were taking our leave the mail was brought in by a messenger and we were called back from the outer office to hear a letter read it was from an uptown jewelry house at least it bore the card of the house and it reported that an emerald large fine and of great value had been purchased by the head of the firm under somewhat suspicious circumstances and from a woman further information and a description of the woman the letter stated might be had by addressing or appointing a meeting with the writer and now my interest suddenly awoke and to such good purpose that i managed to be chosen as the person to go to the city and interview the writer perhaps also the purchaser of the jewel and this accomplished brainerd and i withdrew in haste there was no doubt in our minds the story told by the guard fitted too well in billy's tale to admit of doubt the bag of stolen jewels had been lost by the little brunette and dave was fully of my mind i can't see how it was done he said as we discussed the matter later but it's plain enough that she had missed the bag and that they were searching for it when the guard came up of course she wouldn't say that she had lost a bag of jewels hardly i replied as for the how i can very well see how that string might have been severed you know my opinions about this brunette a concealed knife may have done the mischief or one of those steels that help to give ladies a slender waist broken perhaps by the vigorous running may have cut the string it would only require a little rubbing to do the thing i tell you dave it looks as if we would have a full account to settle with this individual and i begin to feel the ground under my feet i'd like to know who the men were who threw the guard over the bridge though don't you think greenback bob capable of it quite and delbra capable enough but he was not in it are you sure carl i mean to be shortly i replied dave old man don't ask me any questions yet as to how it's to be done but i believe that before this world's fair closes you and i will have gotten delbra and bob out of mischief's way settled the brunette problem and thrown light on the diamond robbery and how about that lost young englishman sir carroll ray and missing gerald trent i turned and faced him old man i said if you'll find one i'll find the other End of chapter 18chapter 19 of against odds by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter 19 strange mistaken heartless i was not disappointed in my interview with the uptown jeweller who being as real as the world's fair itself must not be named in order to identify the jewel offered by the strange woman I took monsieur Lausch with me and he at once declared the description of the emerald to correspond precisely With the one stolen from him and when I had listened to the description of the woman who had offered the gem I was quite as confident that this person was a brunette and no other True she had assumed a foreign accent and had laid aside her rather jaunty dress for a more sober and foreign-looking attire she had made herself up in fact as a German woman well dressed after the fashion of the german bourgeois but she had added nothing to her face save a pair of gold framed spectacles and while i kept my knowledge to myself i felt none the less sure that i had another link ready for the chain i was trying to forge for this troublesome brunette who was so busy casting her shadows across my path and disarranging my plans the writer of the anonymous letter for such it was turned out to be a practical jeweller in the employ of a certain jewel merchant and i never knew whether he had made his employer's purchase known to us for the sake of the reward or to gratify some personal spite or sense of injury whichever it may have been it concerned us little we gave him our word not to use his name in approaching his employer and our promise of a suitable reward should we find his story of use upon further investigation and then we sought the purchaser of the jewel with him we dealt very cavalierly 
we knew no matter how that he had purchased an emerald of value we told him and i further added that he had bought it from an accomplice knowing that such an accusation would soonest bring about the desired result as indeed it did a sight of the jewel sent monsieur lausch into raptures and rages it was the lost emerald the finest of them all that he could not at once carry away the gem somewhat modified his rapture but we came away quite satisfied on the whole he that the emerald would soon be restored to him and i that i at last knew how to deal with the brunette always provided i should find her again after the events of the day and night previous on the second day after his plunge into the lagoon i took miss jenrys and her aunt to see the injured guard who was booked at the hospital as car the blow upon the head had resulted first in unconsciousness and later in a mild form of delirium i had made a preparatory visit to the hospital and was able to tell miss jenrys that the patient would not recognize her or any of us i thought that she seemed almost relieved at this intelligence especially after i had assured her that the surgeon in charge had assured me that the delirium was much to be preferred as a less dangerous symptom than the lethargy of the first twenty-four hours mr masters she had said to me on our way to the hospital there is one thing which i overlooked in telling you what i could about mr lossing i i trust you have not told them at the hospital or anywhere that he is not what he represented himself i hastened to assure her that this secret rested still between us two and she drew a quick breath of relief if he should die i added watching furtively the sudden paling of her fair cheek it would become my duty and yours to tell the truth all of it as he seems likely to recover we may safely let the disclosure rest with him i am glad she said so long as he chooses to be mr carr i cannot of course claim his acquaintance you you are sure he will not know me quite sure i replied and she said no more until we reached the hospital we were asked to wait for a few moments in the outer office or reception room the doctor was occupied for the moment the attendant said but an instant later the same attendant beckoned me outside come this way a moment he whispered the doctor wishes to speak with you i murmured an excuse to the ladies and went to the doctor in his little private room nearby when you were here he began putting out his hand to me i was preoccupied and you were in haste there is something concerning our patient that you as his friend must know by the way has he any nearer friends than yourself at hand i believe not i replied briefly i hope he is not worse doctor no not that though he's bad enough but you remember the sailors who came with you said that he had struck against the boat in falling and we decided rather hastily that this was the cause of the wound and swelling in fact it was the swelling which misled us we could not examine closely until it was somewhat reduced but this morning after the wound was washed and cleansed for the new dressing i found that the hurt upon his head was caused not by contact with a blunt piece of wood but by something hard sharp and somewhat uneven of surface a stone i should say or a piece of old iron a blow in fact ah the sudden thought that came to me caused me to start but after a moment i said i do not doubt it the fellows that made the attack are equal to worse things than that i think from what i know and guess the weapon may have been a sling of stones or bits of iron tied in an old bandana i did not tell him that this was said to be one of greenback bob's favorite modes of attack and of defence too when otherwise unarmed in fact i said nothing to further indicate my knowledge of the assailants of our patient but i got back to the ladies at once after thanking the doctor telling myself that his information would make the charge against the miscreants when captured stronger and more serious if that were needful when miss jenrys stood by the cot where the injured man lay pallid and weak with great dark lines beneath his eyes and his head swathed in bandages i saw her start and shiver 
and the slight colour in an already unusually pale face fade out, leaving her cheek as white as that upon the pillow. The small hand clenched itself until the dainty glove was drawn to the point of bursting. The lips trembled, and the tears stood in the sweet eyes. She turned to the physician and drew back a little as the head upon the pillow moved restlessly I I have not seen him for some time Do do you think it could possibly startle him if if he should recognize me? If it were possible which I fear it is not now there is nothing that would benefit him so much She went close to the cot then and bending down looked into the restless blue eyes how do you do she said clearly the restless eyes were still for a moment then the head upon the pillow moved as if a saying a bow and the right hand was feebly lifted she took his hand as if in greeting and said again speaking softly and clearly won't you go and speak with my aunt charlotte a startled look came into the eyes a look of distress crossed the face he made a feeble gesture with the right hand a great sigh escaped his lips and then they parted strange they muttered feebly cruel mistaken heartless his hand dropped heavily and quick as thought miss generous lifted her head and drew back her face one rosy glow from temples to chin and now the sweet quakeress interposed with womanly tact he does not know thee dear and perhaps our presence may disturb him in his weakened state She bent over the sick man for a moment scanned the pale handsome features closely Gently put back a stray lock of hair that had escaped from beneath the bandage and lay across the white full temple Then she turned to the doctor In the absence of nearer friends doctor we will stand in their stead Will you give him your best care and let nothing be lacking when we can serve him in any manner? They will inform us through mr. Masters I trust and with your permission I will call to ask after him each day until he is better Sweet soul how plain to me was the whole tender little episode I could imagine June Jenris telling the story of her rupture with young Lossing as frankly as she had written it to her friend Hilda O'Neill and more explicitly with fuller detail i could fancy the sweet sympathy and tender admonitions of the elder woman and here before me was the visible proof of how she had interpreted the heart of the girl at once so proud so honest and so fearless in an emergency like this had the sweet little quakeress come to the bedside of this suffering young stranger because he was a fellow being friendless alone and in need of help and kindly care or had she come because she believed that June Jenris Possessed a heart whose munitions might be trusted and that the man she had singled out from among many as The one man in the world must be a man indeed Be this as it would and whatever the frame of mind in which she approached that white cot at her niece's side I knew by the lingering touch upon the pale forehead the deft gentle and quite unconscious soothing of the white counterpane across his breast that the pale unknowing face had won its way and that what she took away from that hospital ward was not the tenderly carried burden of another interest and another's anxiety but a personal interest and a personal liking that could be trusted to sustain itself and grow apace in that tender woman's heart we were a very silent party as we came away from the hospital June Jenris looked as if the word heartless were yet sounding in her ears I was assuring myself that it was best not to speak of what the surgeon had told me and The little Quakeress was evidently quite lost to herself in her thoughts of and for others As I took my leave of them miss Ross put out her hand and after thanking me for my escort said I will not trouble thee to accompany me tomorrow I know the way perfectly and can go very well by myself indeed I prefer to do so I shall not even let June here accompany me at first End of chapter 19
Chapter Twenty of Against Odds by Lawrence L. Lynch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Twenty. We must understand each other. The next morning brought a telegram from Boston, in reply to my wire asking instructions about the rooms on Madison Avenue. It read hold rooms until we come short delay unavoidable trent the second day after our visit to the hospital the photograph of gerald trent was received by miss jenrys and at once turned over to me i in my turn putting it into the hands of an expert artist with orders to turn out several dozen copies as rapidly as possible these i meant to distribute freely among specials policemen the Colombian guards at the fair city and others were to be furnished the chief of police for the use of the city proper For I meant to have a thorough search made in the hotels boarding places Furnished rooms and in all the saloons and other haunts of vice and crime Wherever an officer armed with one of these pictures and offering a princely reward could penetrate on the morning of the third day another telegram came this read still delayed because of illness hold rooms trent accompanying the photograph had come a distracted letter from poor hilda o'neil in which she had described mrs trent the mother of the missing young man as almost broken down by the shock and suspense and we readily guessed that her illness was the cause of the delay twenty-four hours after receipt of this last message came another mrs t too ill to travel doctor forbids my leaving give up rooms for god's sake work don't spare money letter follows trent in addition to these every day brought across the wires from hilda o'neil to her friend the pitiful little question any news and took back the only possible reply not yet and then came this letter from the father of gerald trent dear sir it began I thank you heartily for your kind straightforward letter and while I see and realize the many obstacles in the way of your search I yet hope I must hope for your ultimate success First because miss generous's letter so full of confidence in you has inspired me with the same confidence and Second because to abandon hope would be worse than death The prompt way in which you have taken up this search at miss generous's request has earned my sincerest gratitude Although I had ordered the search begun through our chief of police here Yours was the first word of hope or encouragement. I have received although I have since heard from your city police My wife lies in a condition bordering upon insanity and much as I long to be where I can at least be cognizant of every step in the search for my son as it is taken my duty to that son's mother holds me at her bedside For this reason we must all remain here and I implore you to work leave no stone unturned Employ more men draw upon me for any sum you may require offer any reward you may see fit Do what you will only find my son and save his mother from insanity and his father from a broken heart above all keep me informed i beg of you remember all our moments here are moments of suspense the name at the end was written in an uneven diminishing scrawl as if the letter had taxed the strength of the writer almost beyond endurance and i heaved a sigh of earnest sympathy for the father now doubly afflicted it was impossible now to do more than was being done from day to day but every morning I gave an ungrudged fifteen minutes to the writing of a letter in which I tried to say each day some new word of hope and to describe some new feature of our search that he might feel that we were indeed leaving no stone unturned Meantime from the moment when our brunette vanished from master Billy in the Plaisance No trace of her could be found by the lad or by ourselves for a number of days dave and i gave ourselves to an untiring search by day and night we haunted the cafe where she had found lodgings but we did not enter for we did not wish to give the alarm to a young person already sufficiently shy and we spent much time in midway 
and upon stony island avenue near the places where the camps had seen smug and the saloon wherein he had disappeared one day that the brunette had not entered the cafe since the night of the assault upon the guard we soon assured ourselves but we did not relax our vigilance and for many days the beautiful white city was to us little more than a perplexing labyrinth in which we searched ceaselessly and knew little rest stopping only to let another take up our seemingly fruitless search it was not often now that we sought our rest together or at the same time but one night after a week's fruitless seeking i came to our door at a late hour to find dave there before me and not yet asleep he began to talk while watching me lay aside the rather uninteresting disguise i had worn all day carl wake up that imagination factory of yours and tell me or make a guess at least why we don't run upon greenback bob delbras or even smug to say nothing of that invisible pedestal climber of yours any more easy enough i replied wearily they're sticking close to business and they don't show at least by day in the grounds any more if they're here at all they are lying perdu in cairo street or in some of the turkish quarters smoking hashish perhaps or flirting with the nouch dancers and all disguised in turban fez or perhaps a chinese pigtail do you believe it i certainly do jove i wonder how they managed to get into those foreign holy of holies bakshish i answered tartly look here carl dave jerked himself erect in the middle of his bed suppose you wanted to get in with those people how would you do it dave i replied why weren't you born with just a little bump of what you mistakenly call imagination i'll show you tomorrow how to do the thing how dave stubbornly insisted well if i must talk all night suppose in the morning we go to cairo and find our way to someone in some small degree an authority someone who can talk a little english and most of them can i might offer my man a cigar and praise his show a bit and then tell him how i want to tell the world all about it how i want to see how they live not so briefly you understand the circumlocution office is as much in vogue in the orient as according to our mutual friend dickens it is in old england well when he fully understands that i admire their life and manners and want to live it as well as write it i begin to bid they're here for money and they won't let any pass them see old man cried dave smiting his knee with vigor i'm going to try it on it was seven days before our invalid as we now by mutual consent called the still nameless guard recovered his senses fully there had been two or three days of the stupor and then a brief season of active delirium and at this stage the surgeon shook his head and looked very serious and the little quakeress who true to her first intention came alone carried away with her a face more serious still she looks said the surgeon to me as much shocked as if he were one of her own people she has a tender heart i replied and he is quite well known i believe to others of her family to one assuredly he said with a dry smile and a quick glance and i knew that june generous's interest in the insensible guard had been as plain to this worldly wise surgeon as to me remembering this brief dialogue i was not surprised when i made my brief call in washington avenue to note an added shade of seriousness on the fair face that since the disappearance of gerald trent unknown but the friend of her friend had been growing graver day by day so that the charms of the great fair had palled upon her and she had made her daily visits in a subdued and preoccupied mood and shortened them willingly to return at an early hour with the more easily fatigued little quakeress on the morning of the eighth day i called early sent by the surgeon with a message to miss ross she asked me to send her word the first moment when i found our patient sane enough and strong enough to receive a short call and to listen for a few moments not to talk that was not needed she said he added with one of his quiet smiles and when i told her that when he came to himself the sight of some friend for whom he cared would help him more than medicine and asked her if he had any such 
she said that she could at least tell him a bit of pleasant news and asked me to send her word at once i was very willing to take the message and when it was delivered the little quakeress thanked me in her own quaint sweet manner and a few moments later while i was talking with miss jenrys and giving her some details of our search for a clue to young trent's disappearance she excused herself quietly and left us without once glancing towards her niece when i visited the hospital in the afternoon the doctor said your little quakeress is certainly a sorceress as well she came very soon after you left us yesterday and she did not stay long i had forbidden my patient to talk and i heard every word she said it was a mere nothing but she has almost cured him if it was so simple i said half ashamed of my curiosity yet having a very good motive for it may i not hear the words that so charmed and healed him as nearly as i can repeat them you may i had introduced her as she bade me and told him that she had called to see him every day and i knew from the look in those open blue eyes of his that she was an utter stranger and that even her name was unknown to him he was pleased though and small wonder at sight of the dainty white-haired sweet-voiced little lady and when she took his hand in hers and holding it between both her own said in her pretty quaker fashion i am very glad and thankful to see thee so much better and my niece june will be also i mean miss jenrys who hearing of thy adventure and injuries came at once to see if it were really the friend she thought she recognized in the description my niece's friends are mine and so i have assumed an old woman's privilege and paid thee a visit daily and now that thee seems much better i will with thy permission bring her with me when i come again the doctor stopped short and smiled was that all i asked smiling also what did he say well sir for a moment i thought the fellow was going to faint but it was a pleasurable shock and he made a feeble clutch at her hand and his face was one beam of gratitude as he looked in hers and whispered while he clung to her hand tomorrow then of course she turned to me and i pretending to have been quite unobservant ordered her away and made their next visit contingent upon his good behavior during the next twenty-four hours i saw that the time had now come when the patient and i must understand each other better and i began by taking the doctor a little into my confidence telling him a little of what i knew and a part of what i guessed at or suspected i want now to enlighten him a little concerning this attack upon him doctor i concluded and if i don't make him talk oh see him by all means there's nothing worse for the sick than suspense i begin to understand matters since his return to consciousness he has seemed singularly apathetic but let me tell you one thing there were two nights he was always wildest at night when he talked incessantly about that meeting at the bridge and he fully believes now that she whoever that may be was there his first question asked after being told of his mishap was this was anyone else attacked or injured besides myself that night at the bridge and when i answered no he seemed relieved of a great anxiety i had not seen him since the full return of his senses and he seemed very glad to see me when the doctor had warned him against much conversation and had left us i drew my chair close beside his cot so that i could look into his face and he in mine my friend i began i am doctor enough to know that a mind at ease is a great help toward recovery and i am going to set your mind at ease upon some points at least mind i added smiling in spite of myself i do not say your heart now to do this i may need to put a few questions and to obey the doctor and at the same time come to an understanding with you i will make my questions direct and you can answer them by a nod at this he nodded and smiled i dare say i went on you wonder how and why you were treated to that sudden ducking again he nodded this time quite soberly i am going to enlighten you in a measure and i am obliged in order to do so to take you into my confidence to some extent and i must begin with the adventure of the bag miss jenrys's bag you know 
now i was approaching a delicate topic and i knew it very well i had not in so many words asked permission of miss jenrys to use her name in relating my story but i had said to her during one of the several calls i had made in washington avenue during the week that had just passed when our friend is able to listen miss jenrys i must tell him i think how he came to be assaulted on the bridge as i understand it if only to prepare and warn him against future attacks and to make my story clear to him or even reasonable i shall need to enter somewhat in fact considerably into detail i can hardly make him realize that he has a dangerous enemy else i saw by the flush upon her face and a sudden nervous movement that she understood fully what this would involve and for a moment i feared that she was about to forbid me but the start and blush were quickly controlled and she pressed her lips together and drew herself erect and there was only the slightest tremor in her voice when she said slowly you are right he ought to know and turned at once to another subject something in the look the young fellow turned upon me when i spoke of the episode of the bag reminded me of her face as she gave that tacit consent there was the same mingling of pride and eagerness reticence and suspense and i plunged at once into my story recalling briefly the encounter between miss jenrys and the turks the finding of the bag my meeting with him and the appearance of the little brunette and here i put a question i want to ask you i said and i have a good reason for asking as you will see later why when that tricky brunette turned her back upon you so pertly after making her demand for the bag why you at once left us both and without another word wait as he seemed making an effort to reply let me put the question direct did you not leave us because you thought that person was really a friend of miss jenrys and had perhaps been warned not to speak too freely in your hearing the blood flew to his pale cheeks and there was a momentary flash of haughtiness in his fine eyes but as they met my own his look faded from them and he murmured yes thank you i said and now before going further let me tell you that i am violating no confidence it is not for me to explain more fully here than this the young lady of whom i am about to speak knows that i am telling you these things i am not speaking against her will and now his eyes dropped as he said faintly thank you i next told him in as matter-of-fact a manner as possible how i examined the bag and how when all other hope of a clue to the owner failed i read miss jenrys's letters how when the first letter failed to give me the owner's address i read the second in full and now i said to him before i go further let me remind you once more that i speak by permission and add on my own behalf that even thus authorized i would not utter what i am about to say if i did not believe that by doing so i can set right a wrong a worse wrong done to you than that of attempting your life a blow at your honor in fact he started and then as if remembering his condition said with wonderful self-restraint go on please and i did go on before i paused again i had told him almost word for word as it was implanted upon my memory the story june jenrys had written to her friend the story of that anti lenten party just the fact omitting her expressions of preference i told the story as i would have told it of a dear sister whose maidenly pride was precious to me told how she had gone at his request to speak with him in the conservatory and how there she had overheard herself unseen those flippant unmanly words so unlike him yet from the lips of someone addressed by his name for a long moment after i had ceased speaking he lay there so moveless with his hands tightly clenched and his eyes fixed upon empty space that i almost feared he had fainted then he turned his face toward me and spoke in stronger tones than i had supposed him capable of using that letter did it name that man what man i had purposely omitted the name of the man who had come so opportunely to lead miss jenrys away after she had heard the heartless speech from behind the ferns in the conservatory 
and while I asked the question, I knew to whom he referred. The man who came so opportunely after the... after I had gone. I hesitated. Here was a complication, perhaps, for I had hoped he would not put this question yet, but I could not draw back now, or what I had meant should result in good for two persons, at least, might cause further misunderstanding and render the last state worse than the first. So, after a moment, I answered. Yes, it named the man. Who? Tell me. This was not a request, it was a command, and he was off his pillow, resting upon his elbow and eyeing me keenly. I got up and bent over him. I'll tell you fast enough, I said grimly, and it's evident you are not a dead man yet, but get back on your pillow. He's here, in this very white city, and if you want to take care of your own, you'd better not undo the doctor's good work. Lie down. He dropped back weakly, and the fire died out of his face. He was deathly pale, but his white lips framed the word. Who? Monsieur Maurice Voisin, I said. The dastard! Quite so, I agreed. Did you know he was here? Yes. He lay silent a moment, then. I see. He saw it was... he... I held up my hand. If you talk any more, I shall go, and I have more to say to you. I want you to get well, but there's someone else who is even more anxious than I am. But you have made one mistake, I think. You think that Voisin attacked you because you were about to meet Miss Jenrys, do you not? He stared, but did not answer. When the brunette met you in the afternoon of that day, she gave you some reason for believing that Miss J desired to see you and that if you joined them at night it would please her i paused but again he was mute my friend i went on i believe that love besides being himself blind is capable of blinding and befooling the wits of the wisest the brunette is an impostor as for knowing miss jenrys she does if following her up and down and trying to force an acquaintance is knowing her here is the truth that brunette, as we all call her, for want of any other appellation, is one of a trio, or perhaps a quartet, of adventurers, confidence men, counterfeiters, what you will, so that it is evil. They are here for mischief, and they began at once, through this brunette decoy, to entrap Miss Jenrys, for what purpose I am just beginning to learn. It seems, too, that they have designs upon you, for they decoyed you out the other night, this brunette and one of their women companions dressed to resemble Miss J. And when they had you upon the bridge and you thought you were about to meet Miss J, two men who had been lying in wait for you behind a buttress sprang upon you, and while one thrust you over, the other dealt you a blow which, an inch lower, would have killed you, so the doctor said. All the life had gone out of his face as I ceased speaking. His lips trembled then it was not she he said brokenly my dear fellow i put my hand upon his listen until the next morning she did not know you were here but after reading that letter i could not help believing that you were the man of whom she wrote and i went to her told her of my meeting with you described you and saw at once that she recognized you then i told her how you had been attacked and the next morning i brought her and her aunt to see you i don't want to flatter you and i can't betray a lady but while it was not she that night upon the bridge and in your own sober senses and free of cupid's blindness you would be among the first to know that it could not be she she is now very near and she is only waiting to be told that she may come to see with her own eyes that you are better and that you will be glad to see her glad how much the one word said but in a moment he looked up but the these men how do you know about the attack i saw it i had been following watching you and them he put his hand to his head as if bewildered but my god those men if they are following her and myself and if it is not not voisin he lifted his hand suddenly I tell you, man, it is voisin. 
as his hand dropped the doctor came up and looked keenly from one to the other i got up quickly doctor i said i fear he has talked too much but if you will let me talk to him a little longer tell him something that will lift a weight from his mind once he understands it i am sure he will promise not to talk and i will be brief the doctor looked at his watch go on he said i give you fifteen minutes the guard heaved a long sigh of relief and i seated myself again beside the cot now i said i on my part at least am going to be perfectly frank with you we must understand and aid each other End of chapter 20chapter 21 of against dodds by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter 21 let me laugh there were moments yes even hours during the week while our guard lay upon his hospital cot unconscious or delirious when i blamed myself severely for my lack of confidence or frankness that afternoon of his encounter with the brunette times when i felt that he should have been told at least of what i believed the truth concerning her yet how was i to have guessed her intent concerning him knowing her pursuit of miss jenrys i felt so sure that she was only using him as a means for obtaining information about that young lady and that this interview was only the beginning of what was meant to become an acquaintance more or less confidential as a result of my reticence the young fellow had barely escaped with his life even now so the doctors said fever or inflammation might put it in jeopardy well it was not my only blunder i thought looking back with a grim smile to my first absurd exploit but i would try very hard to make it my last at least where the gang as dave was wont to call delbras and company was concerned and when thinking of the gang i could not but note how both dave and myself had reversed our first order in naming them and now spoke invariably not of greenback bob and the rest but of delbras and company somehow delbras seemed to have taken the foremost place in our thoughts as i fully believed he was foremost in all the plots plans and undertakings of the mysterious and elusive three and yet he was the one out of the gang against whom we had no actual case we could see the hand of greenback bob in the counterfeit two dollar greenbacks which had started into circulation so briskly and then so suddenly dropped out of sight and his work was also visible in that attack upon the guard for who according to the police records could handle a slung shot as could bob and that the guard's wound was the work of a sling we the surgeon and myself quite believe as for the brunette we might begin with her little confidence game in which she did not secure miss jenrys's bag charge her with the sale of the stolen emerald and bring home to her the loss of the dewdrops and other contents of the chamois bag lost in her flight across wooded island when we found her again but delbra we might believe him to be the originator of and prime mover in the lausch diamond robbery but the only shadow of corroboration was our belief based upon the fact of dave's having seen the three together that they were partners and that delbra was credited with being an expert diamond thief not a promising outlook i sometimes said to dave in my moments of discouragement which my practical friend declared were somehow always synonymous with my moments of hunger but to return to our guard and his interests during the fifteen minutes kindly granted by the doctor and which somehow ran into half an hour before he came and ordered me away i contrived to establish between myself and the invalid a very sufficient understanding and i left him feeling that so far as lay in my power he was warned against his enemies and knew them at least as well as i did upon one question however we differed as i was about to take leave i said there is one thing that i foresee and that is a renewal of your social relations with miss jenrys 
and a beginning of the same with her aunt i can see reasons why it might be better might simplify matters if you kept up at least an outside appearance of coolness you understand yes he was silent for a little time then will this be of actual use or help to you only as your meetings may complicate matters by making new trouble for yourself or possibly her then said he looking me straight in the eye miss jenrys must decide the question as i came out from the hospital that day i came face to face with monsieur voisin he paused a moment as if in doubt and then came quickly toward me one hand extended a smile upon his face his greeting was the perfection of courtesy and i of course responded in kind after a few remarks of the usual sort a word regarding the weather which was perfect and praises of the fair monsieur voisin who had seen me emerge from the hospital said so it is here that this great fair cares for its sick and unfortunate have you been inspecting its methods may i ask there are times when the truth is best and i thought i knew my man so i replied smilingly a hospital is not in itself charming i have been to call upon a friend that indeed a patient i suppose a patient yes i felt sure that he was not inclined to tarry nor in truth was i but i let him take the initiative and after a few more airy courteous words he murmured something about an appointment and went his way when he was quite out of sight i went back to the guard near the door of the hospital who had grown to know me quite well did you notice the man who just spoke with me i asked him yes sir ever seen him before i have that a few days ago he stopped and asked after one of the patients feller that fell into the lagoon the other night said he'd heard that a young man fell off a bridge and may i ask how you answered him the guard looked at me quizzically well you see we've been ordered not to answer questions about this case for some reason that you may know better than i do and so i couldn't tell him much about it but i offered to ask for him he wouldn't have that said it was only a passing inquiry and he laughed knowingly he had seen me when i came with the men who bore the guard upon a stretcher and felt that he might overstep the rules with safety how is the fellow anyhow he asked they say he was one of us he is one of you i replied and we hope to see him about at the end of the week precisely how carr or lossing i called him our guard in those days by preference precisely how he and june generous met i learned in detail but not until the glorious white city had faded in truth to a dream city a lovely vivid memory but i had imagined the scene even before it took place and i was glad to know that my imagination machine to quote dave had not gone far wrong miss jenrys had accepted my proffered escort that morning and a little to my surprise i found that her aunt was not prepared to accompany her for the first time that little woman gave me a glimpse of a strong foundation of that good sense that is not held in strictly orthodox leash the sturdy independence that accepts convention as a servant but not as a mistress that was hidden beneath that gentle yielding manner of hers my niece is not a child she said to me when the young lady had left us to make ready for the walk to the hospital and it is best that she should go alone today for his sake they must understand i nodded and she went on june has told me the story all of it i think and there is something that should be explained there is error at least somewhere it seems strange to be talking like this to thee but thee seems to have come so intimately into our lives of late besides of course i know that having read that letter which june has let me read also thee sees the position one moment i interrupted her i have wanted to speak upon this subject and have hesitated nine young women out of ten would have deeply resented my reading of that letter but the circumstances i know still i might have resisted the temptation to read on after i had discovered your address and although she grants the mitigating circumstances still she must resent just a little my knowledge of its contents 
she put up her hand with a soft little laugh i shall be sure to trip myself if i attempt a polite fib so i will admit that at first for a little time june did feel quite haughty when she thought of that letter and thy knowledge of it in the same moment but great troubles often swallow up small annoyances thee knows and i can assure thee that my niece now looks upon thee as a real friend to be trusted not quarrelled with besides for thee must know we have talked over this very thing she realizes that if thee had not read that letter something unpleasant might have befallen her something terrible who knows besides there are all these later happenings all your help to be put in the balance in your favour no mr masters thee has in june generous a friend who is grateful to thee and who believes in thee and she is no lukewarm partisan she put out her slim white hand ringless and soft but firm in its touch and i grasped it and was silent for a moment then thanking her for her kindness and confidence i said hastily and in momentary expectation of seeing miss jenrys enter the room miss ross i believe you have saved me from a blunder as you have said your niece is a woman and a very clever one and i have been near treating her like a child a child and how there is a word concerning that same letter we have been speaking of which i have been longing to speak it should have been said before this visit of today i think and i have been near telling it to you when it most concerns miss jenrys she came closer with a swift step does it does it also concern him yes and ah i must ask thee if it is to his hurt it is not then tell it to her at once if it will make their meeting less embarrassing to either tell it hush almost as she spoke the door opened and june jenrys entered the room and never had she looked so charming it was evident in every detail of her simple toilet that she had dressed with a purpose and the power to please and charm the gown was simply made of some soft creamy tinted wool that fell in long straight folds from her silken belt and was drawn soft and full like the surplice of our grandmother's day about the shapely shoulders and across the breast and the hat was black and broad with curving brim and drooping plume the same in fact worn by her on the now memorable day when we the guard and i saw her all unconscious of the menacing turks on midway pleasance a soft black glove with long wrinkled wrists and a long slim umbrella tightly furled completed a charming picture of a new york girl par excellence as we left the house and i turned at the foot of the steps to lift my hat to miss ross looking after us from the doorway she waved her hand and sent me a significant glance which i well understood it meant speak and speak boldly when we had entered at the fifty seventh street gate and were crossing the bridge i did speak and boldly too it seemed to me before we enter the hospital miss jenrys i began there is something which i think you ought to know i have not spoken of it in your aunt's presence because it is first and most your affair to make known or to withhold for a time will you sit in that arbour where i first talked to yourself and miss ross i see that it is unoccupied fortunately she assented promptly and when we had entered the nebraska house arbour and were seated side by side upon the shadiest seat she turned toward me an expectant look and silently waited my pleasure her face was grave and somewhat paler than usual but there rested in her lovely eyes a look of fixed purpose a clear fine light as of some decision made after doubt and hesitation in which she now rested and felt strong she did not seem eager as she sat beside me only waiting and her mind evidently was far away ahead i came promptly to the point what i have to say miss jenrys concerns our friend whom we are about to visit as well as yourself she let her lashes droop and slightly bent her head and it has been in my mind i went on for some time in fact ever since i came to the conclusion that our friend was in truth 
the mr lossing whom you named in the letter i was so bold as to read here she flushed hotly and here permit me to say miss jenrys that no man ever read his own mother's letter more respectfully than i pursued that letter of yours searching through it for the address of its writer i hope you will believe me when i say that i hesitated long and put down the letter more than once before i ventured to give it a second glance and that no eye save mine read it or saw one word of its contents while it remained in my possession when i met you first and talked with you in this same spot i wanted to say this to you but i saw that you preferred to ignore this part of the affair i did she interrupted with gentle dignity reminding me of her aunt i confess that at first i felt sore and sensitive about my poor letter but that is over mr masters you have made me again and again your debtor even by that act as i now see clearly let us not refer to that letter again but i must once more at least and i beg you to bear with me if i seem unduly meddling with your affairs they are our friends affairs too and i believe he has been grievously wronged wronged she started and her face flushed and paled in the same moment how how i will tell you you may not be aware how much a few written lines can sometimes convey to one in my profession especially when written by one who speaks frankly as friend to friend and when i had read that portion of your letter which describes the scene in the conservatory i seemed to see it all i was speaking with my eyes upon the ripples of the little stream at our feet into which from time to time i tossed a leaf or twig from the branches just overhead when i had read that portion of the letter miss jenrys i went on before i had seen you or lossing i said to myself she has been deceived tricked tricked she whispered through pale lips and then she drew herself erect and awaited my next words miss jenrys i believe you know now whom i am about to accuse yesterday i had a talk with lossing as long as the doctor would permit and i on my part took him quite into my confidence he knows me for what i am he knows what i am doing i told him after consulting you the story of the letter of the brunette everything was i wrong no very slowly and last i told him that i believed someone had played him a dastardly trick shall i tell you what he said to me yes he swore that the words you heard behind the palms were never uttered by him that he saw only you and one other in the conservatory she clasped her two hands in her lap and i saw that they trembled slightly but her voice was low and calm when she turned to me and said if he tells me this i shall believe him and then after a moment of silence how was it done she asked can you not imagine a rival overhearing perhaps the appointment in the conservatory if he is a good mimic or a ventriloquist say it would be easy to utter a few words behind the palms impersonating two people then as his victim approaches he glides behind some other leafy screen to appear before you perhaps a little later smiling and secretly triumphant i see she said with sudden energy tell me what must what ought i to do will you take my advice with a strong reason behind it yes promptly then say nothing do nothing for the present believe me it will be best in the end and an especial favor to me i will explain more fully at another time i got up and stood before her watch in hand we are due at the hospital do you agree to wait she arose quickly will it really be a favor to you it will be a great favor it will disarrange my most cherished plans for unmasking a villain if you make a sign too soon then i will hold my peace i will help you even can i will you i will she put out her hand thank you i will not cause you to regret your promise shall we go lossing lay eager-eyed and impatient watching alternately his watch and the door when june entered stately and charming 
and came alone straight to his cot there were no heroics these were not the lovers of the popular novel who meet invariably after long absence or a deadly quarrel in an empty parlor at early twilight they were young and ardent but they were also familiar with les convenances and possessed of the nineteenth century horror of a scene when she paused beside him his hand was outstretched to meet hers and if the clasp was close and long what of that and if when she sank gracefully into the seat placed for her by an attendant there was a suspicious moisture in her eyes which she seemed to wipe away since her back was turned to the others and if his lip quivered slightly for he was very weak you know what then at first no word was spoken but their eyes had met and exchanged greetings without the aid of words by and by with his eyes devouring her face he said feebly you have seen masters yes he brought me here and he told you everything he drew a long sigh of relief and slid his hand along the counterpane toward hers june appealingly she put her hand in his for a moment met his eyes for an instant turned her own away quickly and glanced over her shoulder then suddenly she began to laugh softly june reproachfully let me laugh oh you poor boy if i don't laugh i'm afraid i shall cry end of chapter twenty one